page after page of spring values you just can't pass up. It goes without saying, you want the best price. I found it. You need Walmart. That's the Walmart way. A lot of smart investors from around the tri-state come to People's Savings Bank or call because they trust us to take good care of them and their money. Like most people around here, they know we're one of the most successful banks in the tri-state and that we use their money right here in our own backyard where we can keep a close eye on it. You've never seen your money any safer, but then you've never seen a bank like this before. People's Savings Bank. People's best, people's and me. The latest news, weather, and sports. Join us tomorrow on News Watch at five. This is NIT first round action live from Robert Stadium. Tonight's game between the University of Utah and the University of Evansville is brought to you in part by Old National Bank, your bank for life. Keysters, your hardware store, and more. Kite Home Centers, helping you help yourself. And by Bracket Sheet Metal, Hardee's, Cook Chevrolet, and Risley's. For basketball fans, it's the most exciting time of the year. It's tournament time. And tonight, in the opening round of the 51st annual NIT, it's Evansville against Utah. Hi, everybody. Mike Blake along with Dean Webster. Greetings not only to you in the Midwest, but to the hundreds and thousands of you out in Utah in the great Salt Lake area. Nice to have you with us. The running Utes are here, and Dean, they, uh, it's almost like looking into a mirror. It's, uh, they're quite comparable, aren't they? We heard about that before the Utes got in here and really going over both teams. They do mirror one another. The Aces may concentrate just a little bit more on the offensive end. The Utes may concentrate just a little bit more on the defensive end. But both teams are similar in size, similar in quickness, and it looks like we're going to have a real good game tonight. Some of the key people, the captain of the Aces, Marty Simmons, is healthy, and then there's Mitch Smith. What about these guys? Well, these guys, uh, Mitch Smith and, and Watkins Booth Singleton, will probably have to try to offset the scoring of Simmons up front and probably really Singletary and Smith will really have to go at Godfrey, especially early on. Well, we're ready to go. A good crowd is on hand. The oldest tournament in the country is about to begin, Evansville and Utah. We'll be back with the introduction of the starting lineups right after this. In the continuing battle among Evansville area dealers to sell you a car or truck, your gold medal Chevy dealer, Cook Chevy Land, declares Price War. Price War. Price War. Cook Chevy Land answers the pricing challenge with All Out War, and you're the winner. We can save you money on the new Chevy car or truck you want now. So why settle for less? Go, go. At your gold medal Chevy dealer, Cook Chevy Land. Glasses. You can never find them when you really want them. Mainly because you can't see them. It's a good thing I went for the two-for-one sale at Vision Express. I've always got a spare pair. Catch you later. Oh, dummy. Get two-for-one at Vision Express. Offer available for a limited time only. Call now for an eye exam or bring in your prescription. Vision Express, near Eastland Mall, right next to Service Merchandise. Also in Terre Haute to St. Patty's Grand Piano Sale this week at Shetler O Music. Over 50 grand pianos, all in stock, all on sale. Once a year saving of the green on Steinway, Yamaha, and Kimball. New baby grands as low as $39.95. Trade up to a grand this weekend. All styles, all finishes. Full-size pianos, too, as low as $29.60 per month with low bank rate financing. This is our grandest event of the year, St. Patty's Grand Piano Sale, through Sunday at Shetler O Music Eastland Place. Spring storms will soon be upon us, and as always, Channel 14 will let you know if it's just a spring shower, a major thunderstorm with damaging winds, or even a tornado. WFIE, with our new exclusive Doppler radar, will be able to give that information so you can plan accordingly. And if necessary, WFIE will interrupt our programming to tell you about threatening weather in your area and pinpoint damaging winds and heavy rains. See the difference WFIE's exclusive Doppler radar will make, only on WFIE-TV Channel 14. We are ready for the introduction of the starting lineups. For that, we go to the PA announcer here at Roberts Municipal Stadium to Mr. John McCauley. 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Robert Stadium. For tonight's national invitation game between the Aces and the University of Utah Utes, here are the starting lineups. First for Utah, at forward, a six foot five inch senior from San Anselmo, California, number 14, Chris Fulton. At forward, a six foot seven inch junior from New York City, New York, number 32, Watkins Singletary. At center, a six foot seven inch junior from Phoenix, Arizona, number 43, Mitch Smith. At guard, a six foot junior from Boise, Idaho, number four, Tommy Connor. And at guard, a six foot four inch senior from Boulder, Colorado, number five, Gail Gondrazik. The head coach of the Utes is Lynn Archibald. And now it is my privilege to introduce the starting lineup for your University of Evansville Aces. At forward, a six foot seven inch sophomore from Baltimore, Maryland, number 42, Brian Hill. At forward, a six foot six inch senior from Lawrenceville, Illinois, number 50, Marty Simmons. At center, a six foot nine and a half inch sophomore from Stillman Valley, Illinois, number 53, Dan Godfrey. At guard, a six foot four inch junior from Noblesville, Indiana, number three, Scott Hafner. And at guard, a six foot one inch senior from Highland Park, Illinois, number 10, Veltra Dawson. The Aces assistant coaches are Steve Bennett, Will Ray, Kirk Sarf, and Woody Wilson. The Aces head coach is Jim Cruz. And we'll be, and we'll be back with the opening tip here at Roberts Stadium in just a moment. At Kite Home Center's fabulous anniversary sale, there are lots of things you won't find. Candlelight dinner for two with romantic music, flowers and candy and wine. Ah, oh, come on, no wine. Forgetful spouses searching for last-minute anniversary presents. Golly, do you think she'd like this garbage disposer? No, none of that cliche anniversary stuff. What you will find at Kite Home Center is terrific values for every part of your home. Come celebrate our anniversary with fabulous savings at Kite Home Center. Getting some people excited about the Train XL90 gas furnace is tough. We can tell people that it's the best we've ever built, that it's up to 54% more energy efficient than their old gas furnace. And all too often, nothing happens until the gas bill arrives. Call Bracket Sheet Metal. We have the calming solution to high utility bills and a $300 rebate when you buy a Train XL furnace and air conditioner. At Hardee's, we don't use just any old fish for our fish sandwich. No, 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 no. To win you over, we go to the icy depths of the North Atlantic for whole fillets of moist, flaky fish in our own special coating with real breadcrumbs on a multi-grain bun. Next time you're in the neighborhood... <laughs> Why not drop in? Fisherman's Fillet Sandwich from Hardee's. It's the least we can do to win you over. News Watch, the most trusted name in news. We've earned that reputation after years of caring, being involved, being accurate, being innovative, and because our news team remembers what news is all about, people. Remember, you can trust News Watch.
only on WFIE-TV Channel 14. Okay, we are ready to go. It'll be Dan Godfrey jumping against Mitch Smith. Evansville making its first appearance in the NIT. The Utes coming in with a record of 7-7 seven and seven in the National Invitation Tournament. They won this tournament back in 1947. They were second in 74. But they were eliminated in the first round last year. They will be in the dark jerseys. They have the basketball. Evansville in the home white. And talking to the coaches, Dean, we, we asked if there was a similarity. They said uh, that both teams reminded each other of teams in their respective conferences. Nice pass inside to Singletary, and he gets two. Boo Singletary with the first two points of the ball game. We talked about it in the pregame. He was going to have to get uh, go right at Gottfried early on, and they went inside. They were patient that time. The Aces come in as one of the top shooting teams in the country. For the year, they were in the top five. They had fallen to sixth in field goal shooting. But the Utes have been holding their team opponent to under 58%. Dan Gottfried ties the ball game at two. I should say under 60 points, 58 points. Tries to go down inside and a foul on Brian Hill. The pass was intended for Singletary and Hill with the first personal. That's a couple of pretty good athletes down there, Singletary and Hill. Singletary, we noticed in the, the shoot around this afternoon, gets up very quickly. We'll give you the officials in a little while. They are from the Atlantic 10 Conference as Brian Hill gets the steal. And here come the Aces. Dawson wanted to take it down, but good defense from Tommy Connor. And a foul on Connor. Both these teams worked hard in, in the shoot, in the, what they call the shoot arounds. Uh, they were working hard on defense. Connor especially. Uh, Tommy missed one game with a sore back, and he gets it rubbed down and stretched out now, even on a uh, like a walk around this afternoon. And the, he was out there getting it rubbed down and trying to get it loose, a little bing gay on it, and he was probably doing it again tonight. Scott Hafter with a three-point shot. He is Evansville's leading three-point shooter in terms of points. Marty Simmons has the best accuracy, but he misses. Smith dumps it down. Anderzek misses. Singletary with a putback, and the Utes go back up on top, four to two. Well, I think right away we can see both teams want to try to go inside. If the Aces don't have the three-point shot, that's where they'll go inside to Godfrey. Godfrey on the drive, and the tip by Godfrey. After with a drive, Godfrey with a tip. Gail Gondrasek has had a tough season. He was injured after a, the first dozen games or so. And a foul as Mitch Smith takes it to the hole. And Lynn, Arch Lynn Archibald said today, he said that uh, Dan Godfrey might be a little bit like Eric Lechner of Wyoming in, in the type of defense that he might play off of Mitch Smith a little bit at the uh, free throw line. And if they did, they were going to have Smith drive into him rather than take that jumper. Here's Connor. It'll be for two. And Godfrey gets it to Marty Simmons. Smith inside gives away 50 pounds to <laughs> Dan Godfrey. He is 240, and it, he is every every pound of that. Here's the alley-oop, and it goes in. And they almost lost it, but Brian Hill with a basket, and it's 6-4 Evansville. Great athletic move that time. Were you surprised to see Gondrasic start tonight as Fulton misses with a shot and a foul? On Boo Singletary. Were you surprised to see Gondrasik in the lineup? Well, they, they tried to work with him a little bit today and make sure the knees were okay, and I guess he's been given a clean bill of health. And uh, basically, Utah going with a three-guard offense and not very big down low, but you can expect to see uh, Chapman come in before long. Keith Chapman, he has been slated as a starting center, but I guess Smith matches over there now on Godfrey. Both Evansville and Utah, very good at home. Evansville has won 19 in a row. They're unbeaten this year. Marty Simmons. And the captain with his first two. The Utes are 13-2 and two at the Huntsman Center. But they've been a little under 500 on the road. They are 6-6, six and 6-8 six, six and eight on the road. Singletary, Smith with the putback. 
The basket is good. They're calling it goaltending, and it'll give, give Singletary the basket. He now has all six of Utah's points. It's 8-6 Evansville. Singletary averages 14 a game, so he's well on his way to his average. Hill and Gondrasek go down. The foul is on Brian Hill, and that's number two coming very early. Brian called for an illegal pick that time, and right away Chris Bamba will come into the lineup. Brian claps his hands and says, go get him, Chris. 6'7", junior out of Bloomington South High School. The Utes finished 19 and 10, 11 and 5 in the Western Athletic Conference. Evansville comes in 20 and 7 as Beltra Lawson strips Connor. Beltra almost loses it and puts it in. Beltra got a little excited with all that open territory in front of him. Evansville goes up by four as Connor calls out the play. The Utes can come back in a hurry. Pretty good three-point shooters on the team. And a foul on Marty Simmons. The Atlantic 10 referees trying to keep things under control early on. They call them a little more closely. A timeout with 15 to 56 remaining in the first half. It's Evansville 10, Utah 6. Kings is driving high prices out to the Tri-State during their saving of the green sale. Check Wednesday's paper for King's eight-page tab that's chock full of specials. Everything is priced to save you cold, hard green. Save on microwaves, refrigerators and ranges, washers and dryers, TVs and VCRs, audio, video, entertainment systems, you name it. King's has it on sale now during their save another green sale. Don't miss the save another green sale at King's Superstore. It's no blarney. Nobody beats King's deal. A special opportunity for homeowners from your bank for life. Old National just put the lid on home equity rates, giving you low rates today and rate security tomorrow. Even if interest soars, your rate will never go higher than 11.99%. Guaranteed. If interest rates drop, yours will too. Our worry-free home equity line of credit. Guaranteed until January 1st, 1991. The only place you'll find it is Old National Bank. Back at Roberts Stadium so far, the Aces coming in on an offensive uh, threat, living up to their billing. They're supposed to be a good shooting team, and they are right now five of six as we played four minutes into the game. Leading score for Evansville with four points, Dan Godfrey. Watkins Bull Singletary. He has all six of the huge points. It'll be the huge basketball. Tommy Connor will bring it in. And we welcome back the people in Utah. 15-55, lots of time left in the first half. 10-6 as Gondrasek takes it to the hole, and it's 10-8. Gail Gondrasek, his first two points out of Boulder, Colorado. They really missed him when he was out with his uh, knee injuries. like to play the pressure man-to-man. -man. Simmons in the paint. And Marty Simmons with his second basket. He has four, and it's again a 12, four-point lead, 12-8 for Evansville. Bolton's done a pretty good job on Simmons so far. He's making Marty work very hard to get open. Mitch Smith looking for some help. The Utes, like the Aces, lost in their first tournament game in postseason play. The putback by Mitch Smith. The Singletary couldn't get the first shot. And Smith gets his first two. The Aces are having a little trouble matching up with Singletary with Hill out of there. Bomb, but not quite the athlete. The Evansville coaches told us they were quite concerned about rebounding. The Aces have been out-rebounded 16 of 27 times. That's not good. And Jim Cruz said their strength is our weakness. He doesn't like that too well. There you see they allow, they, they give Bamba a lot of room, but they don't, they won't give Hafner much room. Here's Hafner, and that is why. Scott Hafner with his first two points. The Noblesville native puts in two. He's averaging 15, and it's 14-10 Evansville. In interviewing Gondazak last night, he couldn't remember Hafner's name. I'm sure he's going to remember it after this game. He's going to get tired of following Mr. Hafner around. 
be interesting to see if Gondrasek is, is healthy. Uh, if he's, he's, he's bothered by tendonitis. Mid Smith, short with the shot. Simmons brings it across. Jim Cruz just stood up and said, let's push it up the floor. And Simmons pushes it up and in. And that brings much of this crowd to their feet. The basket is good. And the foul is on Chris Fulton. Simmons with six points will go to the line. He'll get a free one. He's been on a tear, averaging better than 30 points. And he's had more than 30 points 10 times this year. That's, that's quite an accomplishment. We knew it wouldn't be long before we saw the substitutions coming into a game like this, as physical as it's going to be inside. And Chapman will come in. Keith Chapman, a 6'7", 215-pound transfer from Weber State, and also Milt Donald out of Cincinnati, has come in for the Aces. And here is Simmons. Simmons coming into the game, an 81% free throw shooter. Gondrasek. Takes it down, loses it momentarily, gets it back, loses it again, and Hafner has it. The book on Utah is they, they've been averaging only 10 turnovers a game, which is quite respectable. Very intelligent team. Donald and Bamba will probably both get their shots. Utah will split, play off them. Hafner, he is short with it. Brian Hill battling it, but it's controlled by Tommy Connor. They get it up in a hurry, and a foul on Scott Hafner. The foul was at midcourt. Hafner saw Connor coming down, kind of out of control, and Connor got right up to him and tried to sidestep him, and Hafner was so intent on trying to draw the foul, I think he moved over a little bit and got in front of Tommy. Lynn Archibald has shed his coat. He's got his game face on. Very. And a turnover by Gondrasek. He turns it over. Very easygoing, charismatic type of coach. And last night, joking around with us and the players and, and uh, saw him back at the motel. But today, the game face is on. He's down to business. The 42-year-old native out of Logan, Utah, has been a head coach now six years at the school. He's been a head coach for 10 years. But he's been with the youths the last six. Here's Simmons for three. And a rebound, Gondrasek. This is where Gondrasek is, is really good in the open floor. Chapman wants to go down. He does the on Chris Bamba. Good call. Bamba slid inside of Smith. That's Bamba's first. It's Evansville's fifth ball. It still is 16-10. And we've got 12-40 remaining in the first half. Fulton is back in. Gondrzak is out. Uh, Gail playing about uh, seven and a half minutes before finally taking a breather. And he just he's just not in shape right now. He just couldn't go because of the knees. And Mitch Smith turns it over, picks up a foul right away. That's his first. And Utah's fourth. So neither team razor sharp. Evansville shooting fairly well, and they bring it across, trying to add to a six-point advantage. Takes it down and a foul on Keith Chapman. Chapman, uh, I'm sure he's seen the players like Simmons and, uh, and a Fennis Dimbo or somebody like that. It's, it's not going to be new for him to come in off the bench and have to handle someone that can really go to the offensive board hard. Simmons will inbound it. Credit Simmons with the basket. And the 6'5", 6'6", senior out of Lawrenceville is the high point man with eight, and it's an 18 to 10 Evansville lead. Chapman comes out. We went about a minute and a half without having a point scored there in front of the Aces score. One of the biggest shoots, Jimmy Madison is in now. He's number 42. He's got the ball right now. I 
think Utah might have thought the Aces were in a zone there for a minute, but they may just be trying to run the clock a little bit. Really being patient. Madison doesn't find anybody open, so he puts it up and in. Jimmy Madison out of Yuma, Arizona. Started 22 games this year for the Utes. So the Utes get back within six. Simmons again wants to go baseline. When Marty Simmons starts out hot, I mean, you can just expect it all night, and he's got it going tonight. Those eight stitches in his index finger, which hampered him the last few games, although you'd have never known it the way he played, are finally out. So he is a, he's also coming off the flu earlier this week, but they say he's healthy, and he certainly is acting like it with 10 points already. Played with a broken wrist last year. He's played with tendonitis in his knee all season. And the stitches in the finger, he's really overcome some adversity. Mitch Smith gets it back out to Connor for three. Batted around. Bill Donald runs it down, gets it to Dawson. He'll put it up a foul, and it's good. Good ball by the official. Had a great, great angle on it. The foul is on Jimmy Madison, number 42. There it is again. Madison right on the shooting hand. Dawson maintained control and got it up, and it's a 10-point Aces lead. That's Madison's first foul, and it gives the Aces a 10-point, their biggest lead, as Dawson goes to the strike. He is shooting 62% from the free throw line. He's out of Highland Park. His fifth point, and a timeout at Robert Stadium, 10.39 to go in the half. The Aces, 23 to 12. It's amazing what a little paint will do for a room or a piece of furniture. You know, I've learned a lot about fixing up the houses we bought over the years, and I'll tell you who taught me. Keisters. The folks at Keisters know what they're doing. Hardware, paint, lumber, you name it, they've got the answers. And Keister stores are practically everywhere. Hey. I'm no expert handyman, but with Keister's handy, I don't have to be. Keister's, the hardware store, and more. Make your choice of the best from hundreds of high-performance values at Risley's. Mitsubishi quality and performance have never been more affordable. Get random access cable-ready tuner and wireless remote control with a forehead Mitsubishi VCR featuring on-screen programming. Or choose a 14-inch diagonal color television and enjoy vivid color reproduction with Mitsubishi's exclusive Diamond Vision Picture Tube. Your choice of the Mitsubishi VCR or television, just $3.99 during the best choice sale at Risley's. If you're a basketball junkie, there's nothing like it. March Madness, and here in the Hoosier State, the Indiana fans like it to say, to say the least. Again, you're, you're watching Aces Basketball on WFIE-TV in Evansville. 10.39 remaining in the first half. It's 23 to 12. At halftime, we'll update you on scores from throughout the country. Not only the NIT, but the NCAA began today. A couple of surprises. We'll have them for you at halftime. So the youth working on an 11-point deficit here. one of six teams in the Western Athletic Conference to make it to postseason play. They have the only other time that they played Evansville. They beat them 28 years ago, 132 to 77. Most points they've ever scored against anybody. And the most points ever given up by an Aces team. Finally, with just a few seconds on the shot clock, Tommy Connor puts it in. A pressure shot for the Boise Idaho junior. His first two, and it's 23-14. Donald crying for the ball down low. 
after wanting to get around and he draws a foul on Chris Fulton. We pause 10 seconds for station identification. Your station for sports, WFIE TV, Evansville. So Scott Hafter, who last year was one of the three top free throw shooters in America with almost 90%, goes to the line. He's been a little cooler this year, but still well over 80%. And he misses the second Aces free throw. And it remains 23-14. That, by the way, was Fulton's second personal foul as he almost loses it. Utah, prior to being upset by Colorado State, had beat Utah State, BYU, and UTEP. Three teams that are going to the NCAA. Here's a nice pass, two nice passes, and the stuff by Mitch Smith, and that brings an applause from Coach Lynn Archibald. Smith with the stuff, and it's 23-16. That concerns Jim Cruz. He says, Utah just get you so spread out and then get you out of position, and they end up shooting layups. And Indiana native John Clark is coming in in a moment, and here's a foul on Singletary. Fulton was riding Simmons like a horse across the lane. <laughs> And uh, Chris turned around and said, oh, come on, they're a moving pick in there. And he uh, almost jumped on his back. Clark into the game now. He is a, he is a uh, junior from Pasadena City College, but from Fort Wayne Northern High School right here in Indiana. So Lynn Archibald came east and got him one. I guess Pasadena uh, City College is, is probably not east, though, where he probably really recruited him. After with his third point, that foul, by the way, was number three. They gave it to Fulton as Dan Godfrey comes in for Chris Bamba. After shooting 84%, has three points tonight. And gives Evansville now a 25-16 lead. A little over eight and a half minutes to go in the first half. to tonight's full slate there will be seven more first round NIT games tomorrow night and it'll probably be Saturday before Utah or Evansville whoever wins this ball game finds out who they'll play and where they'll play next Utah knew they were going on the road because of the first and second round games being played at their stadium right now and the Aces hoping they can get a nice crowd in here tonight hopefully host that second round, but if not, Utah might be able to host the second round if they come away winners. Ball is kicked away, it'll be retained. They'll put another 45 on the clock. The shot clock is down to four. It's been kind of a strange St. Patrick's Day weather-wise here in the southern Indiana area. There is snow predicted. That's not too uncommon for the people out west, but it is for people here. That may have had the crowd, kept the crowd down a little bit. Getting the bounce. The big guy, Jimmy Madison, and he says, hey, not me. Madison says, hey, I went over my own man, but in essence, he ran Singletary into Veltra Dawson. Here he comes. Here you see, well, maybe it actually didn't. Madison was the one that hit Veltra. Well, Dawson will go to the free throw line. That's Lynn Archibald talking to Madison. He has picked up foul number two now. As you look at the Aces Brain Trust momentarily, Veltra Dawson goes back to the line. Veltra Dawson, a transfer from Villanova, played on the 85 national champion team. Sat out of here and has really come on here in this his senior year at Evansville. Dawson with a sixth point, and it's back to a 10-point lead for the Aces. Again, the three officials tonight are out of the Atlantic 10. That's the same conference Temple is in. We're going to take another timeout. 7.41 to go in the first half. Evansville 27, Utah 16.
These are the sounds of Kentucky, the sounds of its people, of pure rushing waters, of the world's natural wonders, and the thunder of galloping thoroughbreds. They're the sounds you'll hear nowhere else in the world because they are pure Kentucky. For vacation information, call our toll-free number today. My old Kentucky home. Kitchen Interiors invites you to discover all the beautiful possibilities in today's kitchens and baths. Visit us in Evansville on Boonville Highway. Whether you're building or remodeling, the experienced professional designers at Kitchen Interiors offer you the best. Plans tailored to your lifestyle in designs from traditional to contemporary. Expert workmanship to the smallest detail. Quality building materials and state-of-the-art appliances. Kitchen interiors for the quality your home deserves. There you see with 741 remaining what the score is as Lynn Archibald starts to spread the word to his troops. And Jimmy Cruz on the other end. Cruz, of course cut his coaching teeth not far from Evansville up the road in Bloomington, Indiana under the, the man they like to call the general, Robert Montgomery Knight. Cruz was an assistant for eight years and has done very well in his three years. His record is 44 and 38. Glenn Archibald in his fifth year is 82 and 68. Dean, one thing you mentioned, uh, what about the crowd tonight? Uh, Utah's not going to be affected by a large crowd. They play before some good ones, don't they? They're not going to be uh, intimidated at all by the crowd. They've played in front of uh, over 10,000 about eight different times this year. They played in front of 22,000 at, at BYU. And when you go to the pit in New Mexico, there's nothing like that. It's so loud in there, you can't hardly hear yourself. This used to be a pit during the glory years in the 60s and early 70s when Evansville was Division II and amassed five NCAA Division II championships. And that's what the Evansville team is trying to do, bring the crowd back. And they, they averaged 9,000 this year. This, the capacity here is 11,000. Mitch Smith looking for some help. This is Chapman for three, and he gets it. Keith Chapman with a home run. Well, the Aces gambled a little bit that time, and Donald came over to help out. Utah took advantage of it. Simmons, nice move, and gets around his man. And that's his sixth field goal for 12 points. He's the game's leading scorer, and again, it's Evansville by 10. Both teams shooting well, 57% for Utah, 73% for the Aces. Only three turnovers in the game, all of them by the Utes. The Aces have yet to turn the ball over. You see a lot of motion. Both these teams espouse the motion offense. Singletary in traffic, blocked by Dan Godfrey. Utah, I think, trying to take the crowd out of it a little bit, trying to run the clock down. And a foul as Beltra Dawson hits the deck. He will go to the line in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Beltra trying to shake the cobwebs. Keith. Connor, was it Chapman that leveled him? Yes, Keith Chapman, number 24, his second personal. Chapman will come out. He is a big guy, 6'7", 215, looks more like a football player. Good-looking sophomore out of Murray, Utah. Spent a year at Weber State. As Mr. Dawson goes back to the line. And a rebound by the Utes, Jimmy Madison. So Utah trying to get back. They still are down by 10. Six minutes to go in the first half. The opening round of the 51st NIT. Fulton and Gondrzyk about ready to, or rather now Gondrzyk. Fulton goes back to the bench. Gondrzyk will be checking in shortly. We mentioned he's been hampered. He had tendonitis. He averaged 14 points the first 11 games. Then he got hurt. And now is trying to get back in postseason play. Shot clock at 10. Nice feed inside and just in time as Boo Singletary, who has single-handedly kept Utah in this contest, gets his eighth point. He's out of New York City. 29-21 Evansville, as you can see. Hapner and draws the foul on John Clark. Clark 
they have a nickname. They call him Insta, Insta Stat. <laughs> he comes in and gets the job done, doesn't he? He sure does. Here it is again. There goes Hafner. A little bump on the side. Bill Dowell comes out, gets a nice hand, and in comes Chris Bamba. You rarely see Hafner shooting on the in, moving while he's shooting. He normally it has to be set. Well, he tries to get the shoulders at least squared up to the bucket when he's when he's on the move like that. Hafner, after missing his first, puts in his third straight free throw. He led the Midwestern Collegiate Conference in three-point shooting. And he's also an all-MCC Ackham edition, carrying a 3.3 with a, a district All-America academically, which pleased not only himself, but the coach and the Evansville fans. Gondrasek travels, and it'll go back to Evansville. They'll bring it up with a 10-point lead with a little over five minutes. And Scott was also named to the academic All-America team, 13. That time, not a real smart play because he got beat on the backside, but he had some help down there. Simmons came over and forced to travel. Bobby gets it down to Simmons and a foul, and they call it on Jimmy Madison. Utah has gone to a little bigger man with Madison on Simmons. They started out with Fulton. Fulton really couldn't handle Simmons. He really showed a lot of hustle in there, but Simmons with that pump fake, boy, I'm telling you, he, he has got the best of them up in the air, and uh, he hurts you inside. Again, uncharacteristically, uh, maybe it's a little bit metal. He missed, missed a game-ending free throw in the closing moments at Market Square in Indianapolis in the tournament as Evansville lost to Detroit in its first and only tournament game. But Simmons is doing it from the floor. He's, he's the leading scorer in the ball game with, with 12 points. You hear the term ball reversal used a lot in basketball lingo. Well, folks, this is ball reversal at its best. Without ball reversal, Utah doesn't have an offense. These guys swing it back and forth, and so far they've gotten some pretty good shots out of it. Gondersek fans it out to Smith. Simmons with the rebound. Up in a hurry to Godfrey. And Simmons gets it back. Marty Simmons with his first three-pointer. And he now has 15 points, and it's 34 to 21. The Aces with their biggest lead. One of the officials thought uh, Lynn Archibald was yelling at him, and he turned around and he said, quiet down, coach. He said, I'm not, I'm not yelling at you. And a foul on Chris Bamba. Bamba and Singletary were going at it pretty well. Bamba was trying to get position in front, I think, and Singletary, when you, when you get in that kind of position, you can almost initiate the contact. Watch it down low. You see, Bamba's got the front position, and Singletary's trying to shove against him. You can almost pick up the foul on the defensive man every time, and you can still initiate the contact. One of those gray areas, you can call it either way, but nine times out of ten, they'll call it on the defensive man. That's a good, smart play by Mr. Singletary. Good point. And Mr. Singletary carries a 74% shooting average from the line. But he doesn't make this one as Godfrey pulls it down. A little over three and a half to go in the first half. Utah's first free throw. Simmons down to Godfrey. Made two from the other side. It's his sixth point. Aces with their biggest lead as the Utes are down by 15. Nice pass into Gondrasek. A fine assist. And Gondrasek with his second basket. And it's 36 23. The Utes went two and a half minutes without scoring while the Aces ran off seven points. You see a lot of picking going on underneath. Simmons for three, and a rebound, Mitch Smith. Utah doing a good job of boxing out that time. The leading rebounder in the whack. Here's a nice drive, and he doesn't get the roll. Keith Chapman with the drive. 
Bo Smith averaged over nine rebounds, Dean. Both coaches starting to work the officials a little bit. Both of them up and uh, really giving it to them. Coming down to almost two minutes in the first half. Gottfried with the tip. Hafner with the miss and Gottfried with the tip. That's eight points for Dan Godfrey. That was a great feed from Chris Bamba that time. Saw Hafner open and put it up right where only Scott could get to it. Smith spins, doesn't get the shot he wants. So Utah having a little problem with the pressure man-to-man -man of Evansville. We come down to a minute and a half, 15 seconds on the shot clock, and a foul on Dan Godfrey underneath. And again, I think uh, Smith initiating the contact, and you get the call like that a lot of times. Smith trying to get position inside, and Godfrey working against him, picked up the foul. Something I noticed, one of the one of the officials went and talked to Godfrey, another official, Dean, went and talked to Smith and said, now, son, hey. It could have gone the other way. They're banging around pretty good in there right now. And that's good uh, that they're talking to sure. him. We've, we, we've certainly seen the opposite where the officials make a call and then go hide. Here's Smith. Got a nice touch. He's coming in, averaging 14 points. That's his first free throw. He has five. He took Alhambra High School out of Phoenix, Arizona to two state championships. And Simmons with a rebound. A minute 32 to go in the first half as the Aces walk it up. They'll try to add to a 14-point lead. Singletary's really getting after Simmons right now. You can hear we're just a few feet away from the Utah bench, and they are, as Dean mentioned, working on the officials, as is Evansville when they're down at that end of the court. He wants the moving screen down here. And the ball goes off of Chris Bamba. So with a minute six, we're going to take a timeout at Roberts Stadium. 38-24, Evansville. It only takes a couple of minutes to drive to Broman Chevrolet in Mount Vernon or Poseyville. Why go to Borman to purchase a new Chevrolet? Because Borman is committed to making you a satisfied customer with lower new car prices and superior factory service. No pressure, no gimmick, no hype, only the attention to detail that you deserve. Borman Chevrolet knows as a satisfied customer, you will be back. Borman's goal is to have your confidence. When you've got a big job to do, you're ready to move up to the limousine of lawn tractors, Snapper, with a high back system and smooth on-the-go shifting with disk drive. With Snapper riding mowers, you'll discover rugged dependability and innovative features. It's no wonder Snapper's rear-engine riders are America's number one choice. Mickey Todd's Henderson Implement, Henderson, Kentucky, Lance's Lawn and Garden, Boonville, Indiana, Jerry's Power Equipment Sales and Service, Mount Carmel and Princeton. Evansville making its first postseason appearance since 1981-82 season. In the lead here, pretty much things going their, their own way with about a minute six to go in the first half, but as we've seen so many times, and especially with a quality team like Utah, this can turn around very quickly. Certainly can, and the, the Aces have built big first half leads only to see them dwindle away in the second half, and uh, a perfect example was Marquette where they the Aces ended up winning by the skin of their teeth on the last second shot by Curtis Jackson. So Tommy Connor will bring it across. <laughs> 30 seconds on the shot clock, 50 to go in the half. Mitch Smith penetrating. The use will reset it. To 20 on the shot clock. Chapman can't get it, and it's controlled by the Aces. 28 seconds to go in the half. So the clock is off. You'll see one shot from here from the Aces. Milt Donald, number 22 answered the call. He was not a starter or a sixth man even when Curtis Jackson, one of the Aces seniors, tore a ligament at Xavier in late February. But the young man has responded. He's number 22 in white and he's played very well. Hafner 
Can't get it. And that's the end of the first half. The score, 38 to 24. We're now going to go courtside with Dean Webster, who has one of the assistant coaches from Utah. Dean, take it away. Okay, Larry Eustace, the assistant coach for Utah. What are you going to have to do to get things turned around here in the second half? Well, I think we're going to have to show more patience on offense. Uh, Evansville has just done a super job of taking us completely out of what we're trying to do offensively and then get a, mo a little more physical down at the defensive end. They're just getting higher percentage shots than us. Is Gondrzak okay? I know she took him out for quite a while. Yeah, he's fine. He's fine. We just decided to go with a little different lineup. Is defensively inside kind of a, kind of hard to match up with Simmons? Is that a problem right now? Well, early Simmons had about seven points in the first four or five minutes, and then Jimmy Madison went in there and, and did a real good job on him. And, and, of course, Jimmy down at the other end, they were playing offense, so we brought Keith Chapman in there for a little better offense, and then uh, Simmons went crazy again. Okay, Coach, thanks a lot. Appreciate Thank you. 38-24 at the half. We'll be right back. A special opportunity for homeowners from your bank for life. Old National just put the lid on home equity rates, giving you low rates today and rate security tomorrow. Even if interest soars, your rate will never go higher than 11.99%. Guaranteed. If interest rates drop, yours will too. Our worry-free home equity line of credit. Guaranteed until January 1st, 1991. The only place you'll find it is Old National Bank. Sometimes there's only one way to do it right. So we did it. Bring your home to Pella. Our home needed help. So we brought it to the Pella Window Store. The experts. Beautiful wood windows, new wood doors, sunrooms, skylights. What a great place for ideas. I'm glad we talked to the window experts. Bring your home to Pella. You'll find Pella windows and doors in Evansville and in Owensboro. The time has come for those stories you hear of other eyewear stores being cheaper and faster to be shattered. I can't believe I got these glasses at Sun Optical for almost $100 less than on the east side. The same pair. Can you believe it? The service is great, and I got them as fast as the other store had promised them. Check Sun Optical's prices, and you'll find the lowest prices around and professional doctors on the premises for a thorough eye exam. Sun Optical on the downtown walkway. News Watch, the most trusted name in news. We've earned that reputation after years of caring, being involved, being accurate, being innovative, and because our news team remembers what news is all about, people. Remember, you can trust News Watch only on WFIE-TV Channel 14. 38-24, halftime here, Evansville over Utah. Dean, interesting ball game. Some observations. A little surprised right now that, that Utah is playing pretty well. They haven't turned the ball over. They've run their offense pretty well. They just are not getting the shots to go down right now. I think you're going to see Utah settle down here in the second half. In contrast, the Aces have played pretty well. Maybe haven't got the shots they'd really like to get, but they've been hitting some kind of tough ones, and it's really kind of a, a maybe a game of streaks in the first half where where Utah would come down and miss a couple of shots. And twice, the Aces had eight to two runs, and then they had another of seven straight points. So I think Utah's got to stay away from that and get a little more balanced scoring. As far as fouls, nobody's really in any foul trouble, are they? No. Brian Hill got in and, and only saw about three minutes of action before he went to the bench. And uh, Madison for Utah has got a couple of fouls. But I think both teams will settle down, kind of loosen up. I think we're going to see a little better second half. Well, in addition to here in Evansville, it's been an exciting day of basketball, not only in the NIT, but the NCAA. In a moment, we're going to go to Dan Katz. He'll update us on all the scores. But first, listen to this. When you work on as many sinks and screen doors, walls and windows, lamps and lawns as I have, you find out where to get your hardware. That's why Keister's gets all my business. Hey, I've shopped around, but I've always come back to Keister's. There's no one more convenient or helpful, and Keister's always has the right price on everything I need when I need it. Hey, I'm no expert handyman, but with Keister's handy, I don't have to be. Keister's, the hardware store. 
Shoney's, you'll love the new baked fish, oven basted with delicate seasonings and our special dill butter. Try some today. Before you know it, you're back at Shoney's for more seafood. Okay. Will it ever rain? In drier weather, more Lasso Microtech herbicide waits for rain because microencapsulation helps protect it from evaporation. Lasso Microtech. Less goes to waste in dry weather. More goes to work on weeds. Crop residues, no problem for Lasso Microtech. Microencapsulation protects it from evaporation until it moves through the trash. In the soil, it's released over time. Lasso Microtech. Less goes to waste in trash. More goes to work. Hi, I'm Dan Katz, back in the Channel 14 studios. We're at halftime, Evansville in Utah. The Evansville Aces leading 38-24. to 24. We'll get back to Mike Blake and Dean Webster in just a few moments. But first, let's update the rest of the NIT first-round games. Georgia Southern and Georgia. This game will final score now. Georgia a winner, 53-48. to 48. Elsewhere, Connecticut and West Virginia still in first-half action. It's tied at 21. Also in the first half, Arkansas Little Rock on top of Louisiana Tech, 37 to 34. Another first-half action, Boston College, Siena, they are tied at 21. And also in the first half, it's Houston leading Fordham, 38 to 31. A couple of other games will be played later out west. It's Pepperdine taking on New Mexico, and Santa Clara will be playing Oregon. The NCAA today, a couple of first-round surprises. Let's take a look at the scoreboard in the East Regional. Here's one of the surprises. Rhode Island over Missouri, 87-80. Syracuse, after a scare at halftime, blew out North Carolina A&T at the end, the final 69-55. Another upset, Notre Dame loses to SMU, 83-75. In the Midwest, Melvin McCant scored 26 points to lead Purdue, top-ranked in the Midwest, over top-seeded uh, Purdue, 94-79 over Fairleigh Dickinson. Baylor loses to Memphis State, 75-60, and Kansas State and LaSalle are just underway in first-round Midwest regional action. In the Southeast regional, it's Auburn beating Bradley in a little bit of a surprise, 90-86. We'll take a look at some highlights of that one in just a moment. Oklahoma, no trouble with Tennessee Chattanooga, blowing them out in 94-66. And in another uh, Southeast Regional Contest, this one going into overtime now. North Carolina, Charlotte, and BYU tied up at 82. We should have a final on that in just a few minutes. In the West, North Carolina and North Texas State, it's North Carolina winning easily 83-65. to And the highest scoring game in the history of the NCAA tournament, Loyola Marymount, 119 Wyoming 115, a total of 234 points. Well, Bradley and Auburn in a wild one today. Let's take a look at some of the highlights of this one before we go back to Roberts Stadium. This is Hersey Hawkins, who had 44 points, broke Oscar Robertson's Missouri Valley Conference scoring record with that three-pointer. This is an alley-oop coming up to Chip Chris Morris, 16-15 Auburn. Uh, there's Hersey Hawkins again. But in the end of this one, it was Auburn beating Bradley, the final 90. 286 with the steal there. So that's a halftime update for you. Let's go back now to Robert Stadium. We'll be back to Robert Stadium in just a few minutes. The halftime score, Evansville leading Utah, 38-24. Back to Roberts in just a minute. I'm Dr. Palin of the Palin Chiropractic Centers. I'd like for you to have a free initial exam right away. I was back in the back and I misjudged my footing and I fell off like a five-foot dog. And what I did was I jammed my neck instead of having an S it's now straight and I've had problems ever since then. the chiropractor was the only way I could go as far as getting the relief that I needed and still being able to lead a normal life. A free initial exam in Paling Chiropractic accepts your qualified insurance as payment in full. Don't suffer needlessly. Call one of the Paling Chiropractic Centers in Indiana or Kentucky. There's something quite extraordinary about new Marquesa chocolate creams. They're chilled. Purposely chilled so Marquesa can be made with luscious quantities of creamy milk and intelligent amounts of real butter. For a taste so incredibly rich, you're immersed in chocolate intensity. A chocolate intensity that can come from only one chocolate. The chilled chocolate, Marquesa, found only in your grocer's dairy case. 
Kitchen Interiors invites you to discover all the beautiful possibilities in today's kitchens and baths. Visit us in Evansville on Boonville Highway. Whether you're building or remodeling, the experienced professional designers at Kitchen Interiors offer you the best. Plans tailored to your lifestyle in design from traditional to contemporary. Expert workmanship to the smallest detail, quality building materials, and state-of-the-art appliances. Kitchen Interiors, for the quality your home deserves. My halftime guest is Walt Hamline. He is the member of the NIT committee. He's also a highly successful football coach of the national champion Wagner team in New York. Walt, congratulations. What's your reaction to Evansville hosting this first round game? Thank you, Mike. I think it's super. The enthusiasm and the crowd's great. And, uh, they're a newcomer, and I think it's a great experience for them. Let me talk. You've also expanded the NIT in the fall, the uh, the pre the preseason tourney. What was the reasoning there? Well, philosophically, we felt with the NCAA going to 64 teams that it take away a little bit maybe from our tournament, but that hasn't held true. I think we got a great deal of 32, and our preseason tournament's the best now. I think it's one of the top tournaments in the country. Obviously, you've got a good field right now. People in Utah and here are wondering, what will determine the second round, and when will they know the winner of tonight's game? Well, we'll have a conference call this coming Friday evening, and a number of things will go into it. Uh, we'll adjust the seating of the strength of schedule and the teams, and then the crowd comes into a factor and a number of other things. Walt Hamline, we thank you very much. We're coming back to Robert Stadium right after this. Today's project is the storm door. Next weekend, it's the basement sink. You know, some weekends I've actually made three or four trips to Keister's. I'm glad they're nearby. You know, no matter where we've lived in town, it seems like we've always been close to a Keister's. The folks at Keister's really know how to fix things and how to explain the job to me. Hey, I'm no expert handyman. But with Keister's handy, I don't have to be. Have you noticed that most new car dealers are so busy dealing that they never bother to sell you a new car truck? While the other guys worry about where their next deal is coming from, Brougham and Chevrolet's future sale comes from the customer they sold to today, because satisfied customers always come back. the halftime score, Evansville over Utah. Dean, statistically, uh, what's been the scoring? Well, the Aces' uh, shooting percentage, we knew they were a good shooting percentage team, and by golly, they're proving it tonight. Only uh, 15 of 23, only eight misses, and that is 65%, 52% for Utah. The rebounds dead even. And look at the turnovers. It's been a kind of a slow pace, really, first half, and that's why the low amount of turnovers. The Aces with only one, and Utah with four. Which isn't bad either. No. Scoring-wise, uh, pretty much what we expected. Well, it's been Marty Simmons uh, for, with 13 points. Gottfried got those mostly on tip-ins. I think six of the eight points were on tip-ins, and Belcher Dawson also picked up seven. We talked about Simmons' counterparts were going to have to be offset by uh, by Smith and uh, Singletary. And so far, the Utah is getting the production out of them. As far as Utah is concerned, starting out early was Singletary, just saying there yeah. he is. He had those early, though, didn't he? He had eight points, and I think he had what, the first six points. That's right. And uh, there's Smith there. He's, he's come in there and hit a couple of big buckets and uh, got a couple of free throws. Again, this is the first appearance by an Evansville team in the NIT. The Utes are making their second straight appearance, and they are trying to avoid an early exit, which they made last year against Boise State. We're coming back with the start of the second half right after this. This was the last time you had your eyes examined. Well, with Vision Exam 2020, the eye examination is more than an ordinary eye exam. We're concerned with cataracts, glaucoma, and blood pressure. Your retina and cornea are inspected. Plus, our eye computer ensures the accuracy of your new prescription. It was the best eye exam I ever had. I really like the eye exam here. Vision Exam 2020 is available at these independent doctors of optometry. At Hardee's, we don't use just any old fish for our fish sandwich. No, 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 no. 
To win you over, we go to the icy depths of the North Atlantic for whole fillets of moist, flaky fish in our own special coating with real breadcrumbs on a multigrain bun. Next time you're in the neighborhood... <laughs> Why not drop in? Fisherman's Fillet Sandwich from Hardee's. It's the least we can do to win you over. Once again, back at Roberts Stadium, the horn will sound in just a few moments. Evansville Aces with a record of 20 and 7. The Utah Utes, 19 and 10. Utah leading the WAC in defense with 58 points. The Aces were the top shooting club in the MCC, the Midwestern Collegiate Conference, shooting at better than 53%. We have 20 more minutes of basketball. In addition, again, in addition to if you're joining us late, we welcome not only those of you here in the Midwest, but to the hundreds of thousands of you out west in Utah. The running Utes had to come east to Evansville in that the NCAA is being hosted by Utah at the Huntsman Center, which they say, Dean, is one of the top arenas in America, and it's a beauty. Yeah, one of the top five by Sports Magazine, right? That's right, Inside Sports. With with 15,000. One, one of those magazines. You got it. But again, the Evansville Aces, which led their conference in attendance, can be very proud of this showing tonight. As we heard from Walt Hamline, the NIT representative, the winner of tonight's game really won't know for a couple of days where they go next or who they play. The NIT completes its first round tomorrow night with eight more first round games. So the Aces come out with after Dawson, Godfrey, Bamba, and Simmons. It'll be Madison, Singletary, Smith, Gondrasek, and Connor out front for the Utes. 38-24, Evansville, the lead and the basketball. After for two, and a rebound by Mitch Smith. did not have the luck of the Irish this St. Patrick's Day. Notre Dame is out. Yeah, you went and got a sandwich at halftime and missed Dan Katz. 83-75 SMU. The Mustangs advance. Here's a nice play to Gondrasek, and he puts it in. Gail Gondrasek, who comes from a tremendous basketball family, had brothers that played with the Knicks and Phoenix Suns. They must have had some good pickup games in the, in the oh, driveway. Oh, boy, how would you house. like to look out in the driveway and see those guys playing? Mamba, down to Godfrey. There's a contact, but no call. As Gondrasek brings it across. Turn around, Madison puts it up. Jimmy Madison, who got, he really gets up off the floor. And right away, you know, we said at halftime, Utah's got the firepower to come back in a hurry, and already they've got that 14-point lead to 10. And we've only played a minute and a half. Simmons gets it stolen. Connor on the dribble. Back to... Singletary up, can't get it. Bat it around and it goes off of Gail Gondrasek. So the Utes miss an opportunity to get under that double digits to single digits as Jim Cruz is still concerned. He's got to be concerned at what's happening. Lynn Archibald, uh, in contrast, uh, real pleased with what's going on. And he stood up and said, that's the way we want to run that break, and that's exactly the way they do it in practice. They practice that. A guy dribbles down, turns around, throws it to the guy. He jump stops and shoots. Simmons doesn't get the roll, but Gottfried with the tip. Dan Gottfried with his 10th point out of Stillman Valley, Illinois. That, again, is up in the Chicago area. Two minutes and 10 seconds before the Aces finally break into the scoring column. A very patient, although they're known as the running use, you can substitute the word patient, as Dean alluded to in the early going. A very smart team. And they're, they're thinking overtime right now, trying to keep this ball game close. Here's Gondrasak. He's going to be short. Smith with the rebound. 
blocked by Gottfried. Smith got away with a big time push off in there on Gottfried. As long as you can get away with them. Again, it amazes me as those for those who are courtside, the size of the body of today's college athlete. You're going to play big time basketball in Division One. The Aces to keep stay fresh had to lift weights the other day, and I'm sure Utah looks like some of those kids have been pumping iron. And here's a foul on Bamba, and we've got him for three. Madison, speaking of uh, a body, he's got one, and he was throwing it around in there. And Bamba just trying to go right over his back. Connor will inbound it. And a foul on Utah, and it will go over to Evansville. I think it's going to be on Singletary. It is Boo Singletary. Watkins Boo Singletary out of the Big Apple. He played on an all-state state championship team, Ben Franklin High School in New York City. Evansville by 12. Hafner draws a, a lot of crowd and doesn't get the roll. Rebound, Kondrasek. He's going to go take it all the way down and rebound, Godfrey. And Godfrey throws it away. Dan just looks up in the sky and says, oh, no, I wish I had that one back. Lynn Archibald also says, hey, Gale, slow it down. If he would have had his normal forward in there in uh, Brian Hill, Brian would have snatched that one out of the sky and been gone. But Hill sat down with 16 minutes and 25 seconds to go in the uh, first half with two fouls, and he has not returned. Smith is unsuccessful, so it comes back out. Gondersek takes it to the hole. You can see how he is on two legs. He still doesn't look like he's quite up to par, but the Colorado native has now eight points. And again, it's a 10-point ball game. I got a feeling as long as he can stand, he's going to be in there. He's really a hard-nosed, dedicated kid. And they call charging on Dan Godfrey. Godfrey's third personal. And it comes with 15.43 to go in the ball game. We're going to take a timeout at Roberts Municipal Stadium. Evansville on top, 40-30. A special opportunity for homeowners from your bank for life. Old National just put the lid on home equity rates, giving you low rates today and rate security tomorrow. Even if interest soars, your rate will never go higher than 11.99%. Guaranteed. If interest rates drop, yours will too. Our worry-free home equity line of credit. Guaranteed until January 1st, 1991. The only place you'll find it is Old National Bank. Getting some people excited about the Train XL90 gas furnace is tough. We can tell people that it's the best we've ever built, that it's up to 54% more energy efficient than their old gas furnace. And all too often, nothing happens until the gas bill arrives. Relax and smile. Bracket Sheet Metal has the comforting solution to your high utility bill and a $300 rebate from Train. Beltra Dawson on the feed. Let's take a look. Was it a charging foul? Looks like uh, Smith might have been moving over there. That's a tough one to call. What the fans were booing about, the Evansville Raisins instead of the California Raisins are leaving the court under the leadership of Ace Purple. You're looking at Jimmy Cruz as he instructs his team. 40-30. With 15.43 to go, the Aces break their huddle. They're on top. But Lynn Archibald, as he as mentioned before, is trying to keep this crowd, good crowd tonight, try to keep it out of it. As the Utes in the bright red will bring it in, the crimson and white from Salt Lake City. Shooting in the first half was why the Aces had the lead, and it's why they're losing the lead in the second half. One for five from the field, and the Utes now picking it up three of six, although that's down a little bit from their first half percentage. They're still catching the Aces. Gail Gondersick with a couple second-half baskets. 
Jim Cruz, the Evansville coach, said if his team doesn't play well, they're not going to win. They have to, they absolutely have to play well. He says they have a slight margin of error. I would think Lynn Archibald would say the same for Utah. Neither one of these teams are going to blow too many people out. But they're very good. They're well coached. They've got some very fine talent. And as you can see by the few turnovers, here's the turnaround, and it's put in by Jimmy Madison. Madison and Gonzac being the offensive people right now for the use, and Lynn Archibald stands up and says, let's go, guys. And the Aces crowd trying to get back in it. Bill Donald down to seventh, and he, he is fouled. They wanted a traveling, but instead it is a foul on Madison, number 42. And that's four on Madison. That hurts. That really hurts the youths. You can see the effect on coach Lynn Archibald. Keith Chapman gets the call. We'll see if they go inside to Simmons and try to pick up number five. Godfrey playing with three fouls. He flares it out to Simmons who puts it up. Godfrey with a rebound and a foul. And it's on Utah. Smith and Godfrey exchanging words inside. And what the, Ace, what the Aces were looking for, their magic number as far as attendance-wise, if they would be fortunate enough to win tonight, 10,103, which is right on what Ohio State had in Columbus. And here's the play again. And Smith comes over and gets called for the push-off. The pass was intended for Gottfried. Dawson tries to go inside to Donald, and it's taken away by the Utes. Smith pushing off again inside, and that time he got away with it. They've got him one out of three so far. <laughs> so, and a foul on Milt Donald, number 22, for pushing off. That's the Cincinnati native. That's his first personal. That's the Aces' third team foul. Both teams now with three fouls in the second half. You don't want to. You don't want to get called for pushing out there. There's no reason for it. Trying to play good defense out front, but you, if you're going to push off, do it underneath where you can uh, get a rebound out of it. Utah seems much more aggressive in the second half, and the scoreboard is reflecting it. Evansville with as big a lead as 15, and a foul on Marty Simmons. He says he can't believe it. A lot of times when you uh, reach in like that, you're going to get him whether you're going to get pick up the foul, whether you really committed or not. And that's the mule, as he's nicknamed. That's his second personal. We're under 14 minutes as Chris Bamba takes a seat for Evansville. After we've gotten a breather, is back in. Into Smith inside, and he gets the roll. Mitch Smith. I can see why this young man is in there and, and why he averages 15 points a game. He is a guy that really works hard inside. And a foul on Curtis Sing or Watkins Singletary. And that is his third personal. Utah getting into a little bit of foul trouble and they don't go very deep either. So they put a pretty, pretty good blanket on him. Simmons doesn't get the roll, and it's a strong rebound by Gail Gondrasek. So the Utes now, down by six, can get back to within four or possibly three. They do. They have one three-point basket tonight. Keith Chapman hit one in the first half. But they are not, they have 50 less three-point attempts than Evansville. Boy, is that three-point shot all over the game, huh? Here's Gondrasek, and he gets it. Speak of the double, he puts it in, and it's a three-point ball game. And now this crowd, a partisan crowd in Evansville, is on its feet. That's nine straight points ripped off by the youths. Simmons tries to answer and does. When in trouble, they go to the captain. In time of need, you go to who brung you there, and uh, 
And Simmons has brung the aces quite a distance all year long. He has done a job. We talked, we were kind of comparing notes beforehand, and Utah had scored, a player on Utah had scored over 22 points twice. They wanted a deflection. They said that Beltran Austin deflected it, but the ref says no, it goes over to Evansville. That's what the argument was about. Lynn Archibald and his staff say, okay, you missed one ref. I was saying the, the youths had had a player that scored over 22 points twice. Simmons did it by himself this year 17 times. So you can see the importance that Simmons is to the Aces. And Marty Simmons, as he's done so often in second half play, is starting to heat up. And that's enough for Coach Lynn Archibald. The youths want to talk it over. Evansville goes back up to eight. It's 44 to 37. Dean? I think Lynn Archibald recognized the fact that uh, that they've made a run, they had gotten close, and now he says, let's get back off, guys, and let's, let's just take a little breather here. At Kite Home Center's fabulous anniversary sale, there are lots of things you won't find. Candlelight dinner for two with romantic music, flowers and candy and wine. Ah, oh, come on, no wine. Forgetful spouses searching for last-minute anniversary presents. Golly, do you think she'd like this garbage disposer? No, none of that cliche anniversary stuff. What you will find at Kite Home Center is terrific values for every part of your home. Come celebrate our anniversary with fabulous savings at Kite Home Center. Your choice of the best from Risley's High Performance Audio and Video. Step up to the state-of-the-art televisions from Technica. A 13-inch diagonal remote control color TV featuring random access cable-ready tuner is on sale just $239. Save on Technica televisions with MTS stereo sound, 20-inch diagonal monitor TV, $399. And a 26-inch diagonal color console TV, $699. Save now the high performance of Technica during the best choice sale at Risley's. You're looking at the Utah Utes, who are back in this ball game. They were down 38-24 at the half. They are back in the hunt, seven points. They cut it, cut it to three on a three-point shot by Gail Gandersek, but then called a timeout very quickly as the Aces counted with two baskets. You know, a lot of times uh, coaching staffs will talk things over before they go and talk to their team. But there is a one-man show over here. Lynn Archibald's got control of this Utah team. And as soon as the players comes over, he's talking to them. Both teams very well coached, very disciplined, and it's not by accident that they're in postseason play. Singletary gets it, and a foul on Milt Donald. The two out officials uh, looked at the play, and the one underneath official came through about 12 players to, <laughs> to pick that foul out. So Bill Donald picks up his second. And there they, they say it was there. Back to live. And Watkins Singletary. Singletary has started every ball game. He played at Butler Community College a year, and Boo has been very good since coming to the youth. We're coming down to the 11-minute mark, and it's a five-point ball game. Godfrey in the paint, and a rebound by Singletary. Again, one of the primary concerns for Evansville was the rebounding. They have not out-rebounded but 11 opponents this year. And as you look at how well Utah has done, that was a big concern to Coach Jim Cruz. This time on the drive, and a foul on Keith Chapman. Chapman is really hard-nosed. He really goes after the ball hard in there. He's, he, you forget that he's 6'7". He's yeah. a big kid. Yeah, he's wide. And uh, Lynn Archibald is not going to waste any time. He's going to bring Madison back. Madison's got the four fouls. You mentioned that he's wide. He likes to play water polo. <laughs> That's not a, you don't see too many young men playing that. Ten and a half to go as the Aces set shop. Down goes Milt Donald and a foul on Jimmy Madison. 
And he is out. Took him nine seconds. So a critical foul comes at 10-28 in the ballgame. Jimmy Madison. He leaves unofficially with six points. The 6'8 junior out of Yuma. Four of them were big ones as uh, Utah was coming back here in the second half. We'll see what kind of an effect that has as Simmons inbounds it for Evansville. Again, this is the 51st annual NIT. After. And the rebound by Tommy Connor. The four semifinalists advance to the Garden in Madison Square in New York. But that's a long way from tonight. But that ball was coming into our lap, Dean. You mentioned the four finalists go to Madison Square Garden and a couple of winners tonight. Georgia over Georgia Southern, 53-48. Connecticut beat West Virginia. And Tommy Connor finds nothing but net. That's only his second basket, but it's a big one. And it's a three-point ball game, nine and a half remaining in the first in the ball game. A couple other scores to pass along. Boston College ahead of uh, beat Siena, 73-65 and Louisiana Tech over Arkansas Little Rock. And Mr. Simmons hits again. 21 points unofficially for Simmons. He averages 25. He was sixth in the nation. He was in the top 10. He was in seven of the statistical categories in conference play. And as he goes, so goes the Aces. Singletary loses it. Simmons with a steal. Gondrzek hounding him in a foul, a two-shot foul, as Gondrzek commits the foul underneath. Gunderzak just about ran out of Roberts Stadium. <laughs> he went down the tunnel trying to stop himself. With those knees, it may be a little hard just to come to an abrupt halt. And there he comes, hustling from behind, and gets Simmons on the wrist, knocks the ball free. That's Gondrzak's first. Simmons will go to the line. Tommy Connor's going to take a blow. As John Clark, out of Fort Wayne, number 44, checks in for the red. Should say crimson and white. We know what the colors of crimson and white are from IU. As Len Archibald talks to Jimmy Madison. Simmons, an 82% free throw shooter. That's his first free throw. He missed a couple. He can put a lot of points on the board. His last three regular season conference games averaged over 35 points a game. I don't know that he'll get that many tonight, but uh, he's doing pretty well right now. After working on Gondrasek. So the youth kind of made a ball game out of it. It looked like they were going to be left in the left in the dust at halftime. They trailed by 14, got back within three on a couple of occasions. Now they're staring as it's thrown away inside. They're staring at a seven-point deficit. Then Archibald said, what the heck is going on out there? Two consecutive turnovers. They pretty much put the clamps on Hafner. He has only one basket. This one's thrown away, but it's knocked away by Utah. Gondrasek pleading his case. Chris Fulton, I think, was detected for touching that. Gondrasek says, I didn't get it. Ref says, I know you did. Your buddy did over there. Coming down to the eight-minute mark as Tommy Connor comes back into the ballgame along with Chris Bamba. After, and a foul. And they're calling it on John Clark. Give it to Gondrasak. Beg your pardon? Gave it to, uh, get, I think he got him as he came across. I think Clark got him after he landed. The one ref pointed to Clark, but they do give it to Gondrasak, and here comes Mr. Chapman. And that's whom Lynn Archibald is talking to. There's Chapman. Singletary's going to sit down. Madison is already out. He fouled out with 10.28 to go. 
That was almost two and a half minutes ago as Mr. Hafner shoots a free one. Players are in and out pretty good tonight. Except for number 50 in white, Simmons will probably play the entire game unless uh, he gets in foul trouble. Evansville goes back up by nine. Eight minutes to go, 50-41. Ace is on a six-point run. And Lynn Archibald says this is time to call a timeout. 50-41, to 41. we're coming back right after this. It's amazing what a little paint will do for a room or a piece of furniture. You know, I've learned a lot about fixing up the houses we bought over the years, and I'll tell you who taught me. Keisters. The folks at Keisters know what they're doing. Hardware, paint, lumber, you name it, they've got the answers. And Keisters stores are practically everywhere. Hey, I'm no expert handyman, but with Keisters handy, I don't have to be. your dreams to life with Pella wood windows and beautiful new Pella wood doors. Bring your home to Pella. Whatever you dream of, from a sunny sunroom to a kitchen bay, we'll help bring your dreams to life. Talk to the window experts. Bring your home to Pella. You'll find Pella windows and doors in Evansville and in Owensboro. Back live at Roberts Stadium. 50 to 41, where we're going to pause here in this NIT opening round game for station identification. Your station for sports information, WFIE TV, Evansville. 7.55 remaining. As the Utes come out, they're bringing out Fulton, Smith, Clark, Connor and Chapman. Jimmy Madison has fouled out as Lynn Archibald checking on his timeouts with the official. The Aces will counter with Bamba, Hafner, Gottfried, Simmons, and Dawson. Marty Simmons, leading scorer in the ball game with 23 points. As the youth set up shot. Simmons off his feet, but they decide not to take the shot. You mentioned Simmons leading the way. He has eight of the Aces' 12 points here in the second half. Smith on the turnaround, and Dan Godfrey goes up for the rebound. Simmons. The All-America candidate, again, with another stellar performance before the home crowd. And Evansville goes back up on top by 11. Smith flares it out. This is Fulton for three, and he gets it. Chris Fulton. That's his first basket of the night out of San Anselmo, California. He was all Northern California in high school for three years. And it's back to an eight-point game. Hafner and a rebound by Mitch Smith. Again, Jimmy Madison, one of the top board men for... The use is out. Baba with a strong defensive effort knocks it out. Chapman will bring it in. As you see Singletary back in. Boo has got to be careful. He's got three fouls. Down to six minutes. Again, the winner of tonight's game will probably have to wait until Saturday to find out where they're going to be playing next. There's eight more opening round games tomorrow night. Chapman with a miss, strong rebound. He gets his own. So a new 45 seconds go on the clock. Fulton. 
Dawson. Hands it out, Chapman. And a rebound, Dawson. Utah showing good patience that time. Got the good shots they wanted. They got two of them. They're yelling, get on Simmons, for good reason. I think they want to go double down on Godfrey with the double team, but they don't want Simmons' man to do it. And we come down to the five-minute mark. And a foul on Keith Chapman as Simmons battling for position. That's the 17th foul, Chapman with his fourth. We talked about ball reversal in the first half, and there was a good example of it as the Aces swung it around. And it was Bamba with a good feed inside, and you see Chapman's hand up on Simmons trying to get Marty out of the way. And Simmons goes back to the free throw line. Marty can do it scoring. He can also do it rebounding. He's averaging seven rebounds a game, and he's had five double doubles, double points, and double figures and rebounds. I've got him unofficially with 26, so he's got his average. And the Aces maintain a nine-point advantage. Try to get it down low to Singletary, and the Aces steal it, and a foul on Singletary at this end. That's a little frustrating foul. Lynn Archibald turns around and says, is that number five? And the, one of the assistant coaches says, no, only four, coach. So Boo has to be careful. With 4.38 remaining, Simmons goes back to the line. Critical time right now for the Utes. They can't let this one get back into uh, double digits. For those who are seeing Simmons for the first time, forgive us for eulogizing the young man, but he is, uh, from people who have been watching the Aces here for many years, they feel that this guy would be the captain of the, the all-time Evansville team. They had a name familiar to U Utah fans, Jerry Sloan, an assistant coach for the Utah Jazz. Well, Sloan uh, played on some great teams. They feel this guy could play with the Sloan era. Simmons has been everything uh, the fans have wanted him to be, and he's been here only two years after transferring from Indiana. Quite a career for the Lawrenceville, Illinois native. We're under four and a half minutes, 10-point lead. Evansville, Utah with the basketball. Colton in a hurry gets it knocked away by the Aces, and Connor will bring it in underneath as you see the Evansville staff applauding. This time of the year, there's all kinds of rumors about coaches leaving. Uh, Evansville hoping that Jim Cruz will, will be sticking around. There's no reason why he wouldn't. He's been here three years, but when you've had a successful year, they start to say, well, his name starts popping up. Reed Monson has checked into the game for Utah. And a foul on Scott Hafner, I believe. And it is. That's his second personal. comes Hafner with a little push right there. But another final, I guess. Houston now in the NIT has beaten Fordham, so Houston advances into the second round. Last night, Ohio State a winner. Beating Old Dominion at St. John's Arena. Here's the back door, and it's works to Chris Fulton. And it's a Eight-point spread with 3.40 to go. The Aces may want to take some time here, may start running the clock a little bit. Help off, Keith! Help off, Keith! Defend the foul of the Aces attack would be number 40, Chris Bamba. And although the percentage is a little down for Velcher Dawson in crunch time, he does pretty well. 12 seconds on the shot clock. Double spray, Keith! L little over three minutes. Here's Simmons. Does not get the roll. Fulton with a rebound. Under three minutes. See if Utah looks for the three-pointer here. Connor is the man they'd like to get it to. Connor goes.
goes down. Both go down. Here's Fulton for three. And a foul on Dan Godfrey. And that is four on Godfrey. Fulton put up a three-pointer as we take another look. A frustrating foul for Godfrey. Dan trying to get position, but Monson in there doing a good job. Monson, Reed Monson just came in. A 6'8", 195-pound junior will now go to the free throw line. And here he is in the NIT, and he's only shot six free throws all year. He's five of six, 83%. And that percentage will go up. John Clark checks in as Monson gets his first point. He's a junior out of Salt Lake City. Played at East High School. Says so he's a talented musician. Plays the trumpet. Well, right now, he's trying to make some string music here as he tries to cut it to six. And a tip. And a follow-up by... Monson. Monson. He gets it. 54-49. Two and a half remaining. The guy that set that up is Clark. Clark's the one that went on the Kept it alive. Board. That's right. Bamba down to Godfrey. Loses on a foul and a basket. Dan Godfrey with a very big basket. The basket counts, and there is a foul. That is a big one. I thought they were going to call a two-shot foul there for a second, an intentional because Monson just jumped on his back. See right there, he says, you're not going up, big guy, and Dan says, I'm going up, and it goes in. That is Reed Monson's first, and Gaffrey will make his first appearance at the free throw line. He has 12 points, he averages 14. He completes the three-point play. And a timeout, 2.15 remaining. It's an eight-point ball game, 57-49. Don't just strike a deal on a new Chevy. Strike gold. Only at your gold medal Chevy dealer, Cook Chevy Land. And with every gold medal deal goes our commitment of 100% customer satisfaction. We want you satisfied. That's why Cook Chevy Land is Mid-America's number one gold medal deal beater. A golden opportunity for serious savings if you strike now. At your gold medal Chevy dealer, Cook Chevy Land. A special opportunity for home buyers from Old National Bank. Introducing Old National's ARM, the consumer's choice convertible adjustable rate mortgage that lets you convert your adjustable rate to a fixed rate at any time without the high cost of refinancing. Low interest rates today and rate security tomorrow. Just what you'd expect from your bank for life. For full details, stop in at any old National Bank office. There you see what Lynn Archibald and the Utah Utes are facing with 2.15 remaining. They have fought an uphill battle much of this ball game. But the purple and white of the Purple Aces, led by 14 at the half, it's been cut to as little as three. But now back up to eight. As the... Evansville Aces in their first ever NIT appearance are trying to make it a successful debut. This is the eighth trip to the NIT for Utah. They are seven and seven. Last year they lost at Boise State in the opener to the Broncos, 62 to 61. Here come the Utes. That Godfrey three-point play stopped a six-point run by Utah. We're under two minutes. They always say tempo is important. Smith had to alter his shot, give Godfrey credit. Godfrey with some fine defense. The tempo has been Utah's way tonight. The Aces play a much more up-tempo game. Utah's been holding their opponents to 58 points and a foul. John Clark with a minute 33 to go. So a newcomer coming into the lineup, John Hansen, number 34. 
He's a 6'4 sophomore out of Redlands, California. He played a year at Long Beach State. And he was all-conference academic this year as Chris Bamba toes the line. Bamba out of Bloomington, Indiana. That's his first point. He averages only two, but he could get two big ones right here for the Evansville Aces. A minute 33 remaining. And a foul on Chris Bamba. That was quite a quite a wrestling match between him and Singletary. And that's four on Bamba. Bamba, very much a lunch pail type defensive player. Is regarded the Aces' best defensive big man. He's number 40. He comes back to spread the spread the gospel of Jim Cruz. We're down to a minute 24. A Singletary comes to the line. That's his first free throw. He, as Dean mentioned, had six points very early. He's been kind of silent since then. He now has 11 points. And it remains a nine-point lead. And a foul in a hurry by Chris Fulton. You have to foul in a hurry, but you don't want to put Simmons and Hafner at the line. Simmons on the season, 82% free throw shooter. 89% in the conference play, so the last half of the season, he's picked that up a little bit. I'll tell you what, these are two class programs going at each other tonight. And this has been a good game. Marty Simmons will try to add to his game leading 27 points. He had 34, 39, and 33 in his last three regular season games. But like all the aces, he was as tight as can be in that conference game against Detroit, but they still almost won it. He wound up with 23. Simmons with 29, aces with an 11-point lead, a minute 15 to go. Ball partially deflected. Connor takes it inside, dumps it to Smith, comes around and in. Timeout as Mitch Smith puts it in off the window. 108 remains, and it's 61-52. Again, in addition to this game, all kinds of games are being played throughout this country. And again, some other NIT scores earlier. Houston a winner. Ohio State winning last night. And again, Dean, whoever wins tonight, if Evansville can hold on to this lead, or if Utah wins, they won't know, probably till Saturday. But I, I think Evansville's got to be happy. The crowd again, over 10,000, Over 10,000, 10,103. As you said, uh, a lot of important NIT games going on. One surprise maybe in the NCAA. Missouri goes down to defeat for the fourth consecutive year they lose in the first round of the NCAA tournament. They've got to be pulling their hair out down there. And uh, maybe another little bit of surprise tonight. SMU beats Notre Dame. No surprise that Utah has played well tonight. And Glenn Archibald is talking to his team. He says, guys, it's not over. We've got 68 seconds left, and somehow i got to believe that these guys are going to play these full 68 oh. seconds pretty tough. You better believe it. Archibald, like Cruz, has been coached, been an assistant to some good people. He coached with Bob Boyd out at Southern Cal. He was under Jerry Tarkanian as he was an assistant at Long Beach State, Cal Poly at San Luis Obispo, at UNLV, and also USC before becoming the head coach at Idaho State in Pocatello. But that's all years ago. He's now the head man at Utah. He's done a great job. He's taken the Utes into their third straight postseason appearance. They were in the NCAA two years ago. But they lost an opening round of the NIT last year, and they're trying to avoid that this year. So Marty Simmons, the team captain, will bring it in a minute eight on the clock. Gets it to Bamba. And again, you don't want to foul Hafner, but you have to. And that's Fulton with the foul. 
they gave Bamba a wide open lane to catch the ball, and I think they wanted to go in and try to foul him immediately. But the Aces, anticipating that was coming, other teams have tried that. They right back to Hafner. And Scott, a 84% free throw shooter on the season. And that is five on Chris Fulton. Unhappy young man, a talented senior playing his final moments, it appears. 61-52 with a minute four to go. And He's another senior comes in for him. There's only two on this team. Gail Gondrasak. After with a sixth free throw of the night. Boy, they've done a job on him, though. Uh, he was earlier, he was two of eight, I believe, from the field. Scott had really been scoring well in the last few ball games. Last uh, six games, he'd been shooting 56% or better. Under a minute. For three, Chapman from the twilight zone, he gets it, and a timeout. Keith Chapman has only two baskets, but they're for three points, and it's back within eight. The Utes won't go away. Chapman was some really strong defensive pressure by Simmons that time. He just said, well, I'm going to go up with a jump shot. If you uh, go and try to block it, maybe you'll foul me. And he went up and launched it, and it goes right in. 63-55, an eight-point lead, and this one is not over by a long shot. One of the things that Coach Jim Cruz said prior to the game when he was talking about Utah, he said they're very good at isolating on the post. What does he mean by that? Well, they run that double high stack, and, and you, you really have to have some versatile players, some guys that are, are really more swing, what they call swing men in a big man's body, and that's maybe why Smith gets away with being a little light. He's only uh, 6'8", 190 pounds, but he can get out there and move the ball pretty well. And uh, needless to say, uh, Boo Singletary knows how to run that high stack, and he has driven a couple of times tonight. But he, it doesn't seem like he's really gotten on track tonight. He doesn't. I think he had a little foul trouble uh, early and uh, has had to play kind of sparingly. Uh, it was interesting to see how they, they adjusted to uh, the way Marty Simmons started. They brought in Madison, but of course they lost Madison with 10.28 to go in the second half. I think that hurt the youth. Yeah, a guy comes in and he, he gets uh, four early points in the first four minutes of the second half, and he's really starting to do the things you want to do, and you bring him back with, with about ten and a half minutes to go, and you think maybe I'll get six or seven good minutes out of him down the stretch, and he fouls out after he plays nine seconds. So again, 54 seconds remaining. Evansville bringing it up. They even, I think they fouled him, but they didn't. They missed it. And they foul Bamba, and a foul on Mitch Smith. They'll give it one and one. I think they fouled Hafter, because I heard as they went by, the coaching staff said, hit him, get him. <laughs> Stop him. Jump on him. Down to 44 seconds. They're trying to play the percentages here and foul Bamba. He's a 49% free throw shooter on the season, but he went there just a little while ago and hit two. So Chris Bamba, a junior. This is the free throw with 43 seconds. It remains an eight-point lead. It is not over. Chapman gets a piece of the rim and a foul, turned it over rather, excuse me, touched it on the line. He goes out of bounds, it'll go back to Evansville. Down to 32 seconds. That was a tough one. They get it to Dawson and they'll send Simmons up to after with 25 and Mitch Smith finally gets a hand on it. Again, I'm sure they wanted to foul Dawson, and it looked like they did everything but undress him. Tommy Connor walked over to the official and said, are you watching the same game I am? <laughs> Again? He said, we, we mugged that guy down there. He had $12 on him, and they didn't call the foul. The guys in the black and white shirts have done a nice job tonight, though. They certainly have. After with his eighth free throw, he has 10 points, but eight come at the stripe. 24 seconds on the clock. So it appears that Evansville will advance here. A nine-point lead. Who they play and where they'll go, we don't know and probably won't for about 36 to 48 hours. A three-point shot, no good. 
Batted around and controlled by the Aces, and Hafter will go back to the line. A foul on Keith Chapman. Chapman reached around Hafner, not, not maliciously, but definitely trying to foul intentionally, and a two-shot foul was called. And the sophomore out of Murray will say farewell. Keith Chapman fouls out. He's the second Ute to hit the sideline. He good, fouls out with 11 seconds. Good-looking player. Yes. He became a starter through the Gondrasek injury. So just a few precious seconds remain. And Scott Hafter will go to the line. A couple of aces checking in. Troy Jones and Scott Morning. In fact, four players will check in. A nice hand for the starters as Godfrey, Bamba, Simmons, and Dawson come out. They've, uh, they deserve the hand. It's been a, this, this certainly takes the bitter taste of the loss against Detroit. They'll, uh, they would have not slept for a long time had they have had to have lived with Archie Tullis's three-point shot that knocked them out of the tournament. Of course, Utah got a second chance after their upset loss at Colorado State, and both teams trying to do some redeeming tonight. And the only problem only one team was going to get to. So the Evansville Aces will advance with a record of 21 and 7. The Utes put the lid on a very fine season. They will be 19 and 11. They had a, another fine year. And they will not foul. Utah is going to let the clock run out. Larry Brand in and out, tipped by Morning, and that is it. It's all over. The first round of the NIT is won by the Evansville Aces. The final, 66 to 55. We'll be back with a final word right after this. These are the sounds of Kentucky, the sounds of its people, of pure rushing waters, of the world's natural wonders, and the thunder of galloping thoroughbreds. They're the sounds you'll hear nowhere else in the world because they are pure Kentucky. For vacation information, call our toll-free number today. My old Kentucky home. Being at the right place at the right time is everything. Ayers. And Ayers has everything for spring. Ayers Spring Sale. And Ayers Spring Sale lets you have it now. Ayers here for you and it's here throughout the store our biggest sale of the season friday through sunday only so let's hear it for spring tom Selleck back as magnum Now every Monday through Friday morning at 9 a.m. following the Today Show, it's adventure, romance, and warm sunny days in Hawaii. Takes more than one kiss from a warm, attractive, bright-eyed woman to change my mind. You've requested Magnum, and he's back just for you. Thomas, I fell in love with. Knew it. I knew it. You are the best. Tom Selleck as Thomas Magnum, each Monday through Friday morning at 9 a.m., only on WFIE-TV, Channel 14. Tonight's NIT first-round basketball attributes, 55. The final, 66-55. Dean, a final comment. Well, I think maybe Utah may have even made their run a little bit early. They outscored the Aces 13-2 to start the second half, and basically it was Madison that brought him back, and then he got into foul trouble. When they did bring him back, he played nine seconds and fouled out. Uh, the Aces ran off six of eight straight points, uh, or six of Simmons ran off six of the Aces eight straight midway through, and that really kind of broke it back open, although Utah never really did die out. They hung tough. They hit some shots down the stretch, but it was Marty Simmons and his 31 points that carried the Aces 
aces to victory tonight. Another fine performance. Again, the aces advance with a record of 21 and 7. We wish them well. We also salute the Utah Utes who put the lid on a fine season 19 and 11. For Dean Webster, I'm Mike Blake. Thanks for watching, everybody. That's the story here at Roberts Stadium. The opening round of the 51st NIT. Evansville advances with a win 66 to 55. Good night. Tonight's NIT first round basketball action has been brought live from Robert Stadium. It's the second round of the NIT. Tonight's game between the Eagles of Boston College and the University of Evansville Aces is brought to you in part by Old National Bank, your bank for life. Ford and your local Ford dealers. King's Superstore. Keister's Hardware. Cook Chevrolet. Kite Home Centers, Hardee's, Grizzlies, and by Brorman Chevrolet. After tonight, there'll only be eight teams left in the quest for the championship of the 51st NIT. Who will it be here from Evansville? Will it be a team that's played in one of the toughest conferences in the country, the Eagles from the Big East? Or will it be the MCC Evansville Aces who are going for their 21st win in a row here at Roberts Stadium? Hi again, everybody. Mike Blake along with Dean Webster. Dean, contrasted to Utah, it's like night and day. It certainly is. Utah, they tried to take the crowd out of it. You said that the Aces have such an advantage here. Utah tried to take the Aces crowd out of it by running a slow, patient offense and tried to take a lot of time off the clock. It eventually did not work. I think Boston College will try to use, uh, Jim O'Brien says the Aces have a tremendous advantage tonight because they are playing in Roberts Stadium. And he will probably try to take the crowd out of it by using a transition game, an up-tempo game, to try to get on top and hopefully, he says, stay on top. Some interesting matchups. We hear this name, Barrows. What's he like? He is very quick. In fact, both guards, Jamie Benton and Dana Burrows, averaged 34 points uh, up in the backcourt. Last game, they only had 19 points between the two. They got some help up front. They can't rely on that tonight. They're going to have to have a good performance out of their guards. And Evansville, Marty Simmons, yeoman job the other night. I think he's got to get some more help, doesn't he? He's got to get some help from not only Dan Godfrey a little more, but Brian Hill's got to stay on the floor more than three minutes like he did the other night. He's only scored four points in the last two games. Well, as you can hear, the Aces are here. So is a terrific crowd. They're on their feet. We're ready to go in what should be a whale of a ball game. We'll be back with the introduction of the starting lineups right after this. It's the biggest event of the year, your Ford dealer's spring sell -out. now through March 31st. Save big on Ford's number one sellers with cash back, plus option savings on the best-selling car in the world, Ford Escort, on America's best-selling mid-size car, Ford Taurus. Save over $2,000 on a Thunderbird Turbo Coupe before you get our best deal. The spring sell -out. open extra hours, on-the-spot financing, high trading allowance, but it all ends March 31st at your Ford dealer. You are about to witness an incredibly effective fitness machine. Airdyne from Schwinn, the only machine of its kind that lets you exercise your lower body and upper body together for maximum cardiovascular benefits and healthy muscle tone. Use the Airdyne for as little as 20 minutes every other day to help achieve and maintain total fitness. Schwinn Airdyne, the ultimate fitness machine. See the Schwinn Airdyne at your nearest Gillis Schwinn Cyclery today. It's amazing what a little paint will do for a room or a piece of furniture. You know, I've learned a lot about fixing up the houses we bought over the years, and I'll tell you who taught me. Keisters. The folks at Keisters know what they're doing. Hardware, paint, lumber, you name it, they've got the answers. And Keisters stores are practically everywhere. Hey, I'm no expert handyman, but with Keisters handy, I don't have to be.
The Aces coming in with a record of 21 and 7. The Boston College Eagles with a record of 16 and 13. We're ready to go with the introduction of the starting lineups. For that, we go to the public address announcer here at Roberts Stadium, Mr. John McCauley. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Roberts Stadium, home for your University of Evansville Aces for tonight's game between the Aces and the Boston College Eagles. Here are the starting lineups. First for Boston College. At forward, a six foot five inch junior from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, number 24, Steve Benton. At forward, a six foot seven inch sophomore from Cambridge, Massachusetts, number 34, Bob Francis. At center, a six foot eight inch senior from Geneva, New York, number 44, Tyrone Scott. And guard, a five foot 11 inch junior from Mattapan, Massachusetts, number three, Dina Barros. And at guard, a six foot senior from Providence, Rhode Island, number 11, Jamie Benton. The head coach of the Eagles is Jim O'Brien. And now it is my privilege to introduce the starting lineup for your University of Evansville Aces. At forward, a six foot seven inch sophomore from Baltimore, Maryland, number 42, Brian Hill. At forward, a six foot six inch senior from Lawrenceville, Illinois, number 50, Marty Simmons. At center, a six foot nine and a half inch sophomore from Stillman Valley, Illinois, number 53, Dan Godfrey. At guard, a six foot four inch junior from Noblesville, Indiana, number three, Scott Hafner. And at guard, a six foot one inch senior from Highland Park, Illinois, number 10, Veltra Dawson. The assistant coaches are Steve Bennett, Will Ray, Kirk Sarf, and Woody Wilson. The Aces head coach is Jim Cruz. And here are the officials for tonight's game. From left to right, Ken Cox, he's the tallest of the three. Herman Ramsey in the middle. Willard Smith, all three gentlemen from the Ohio Valley Conference. We'll be back with the opening tip right after this. You've always known Hardee's for country fresh buttermilk biscuits made from scratch. And we mean scratch. Bet you didn't know you can get them with something new. A big country breakfast. Scrambled eggs, real potato hash rounds, ham, bacon, or sausage, your choice. So country big, we serve it on a platter. Hardy's new big country breakfast. Just $1.99. Because at Hardy's, we're out to win you over. A special opportunity for homeowners from your bank for life. Old National just put the lid on home equity rates, giving you low rates today and rate security tomorrow. Even if interest soars, your rate will never go higher than 11.99%. Guaranteed. If interest rates drop, yours will too. Our worry-free home equity line of credit. Guaranteed until January 1st, 1991. The only place you'll find it is Old National Bank. Kitchen Interiors invites you to discover all the beautiful possibilities in today's kitchens and baths. Visit us in Evansville on Boonville Highway. Whether you're building or remodeling, the experienced professional designers at Kitchen Interiors offer you the best. Plans tailored to your lifestyle in designs from traditional to contemporary. Expert workmanship to the smallest detail, quality building materials, and state-of-the-art appliances. Kitchen Interiors, for the quality your home deserves. The best-dressed hams wear the Amgi label from a festive holiday dinner to a late-night snack. Served on your finest china, 
or stacked in a hearty sandwich. Nothing beats the wonderful taste of M.G. Ham. It's tender and juicy with a rich flavor that's just right for so many occasions. And quality. Well, you know you can trust M.G. for the freshest, leanest ham anywhere. Your family will love it. Mmm, give me M.G. Here are the matchups, Dean. As you can see, some very interesting ones indeed. Well, Steve Benton is going to have a yeoman's job to try to stop Marty Simmons tonight. On the other hand, the Aces guards are going to have their hands full with VCs as Dana Barros and Jamie Benton can both light it up. Kevin Ramsey is going to throw it up. Tyrone Scott and Dan Gottfried will jump it up. Again, a near capacity crowd at Roberts Stadium where the Aces have drawn well all year. The ball goes off the hands of Steve Benton and it'll be retained by the Evansville Aces. Not a very good entry pass that time. Simmons was defensed pretty well in there and Hafner tried to force it in. The Aces, still one of the top shooting teams in the country, come in shooting 53% plus. That ranks them sixth in the nation. It's a man-to-man -man defense right now. Scott Hafner with a miss, batted around and retained by Dana Barros. Big East leading score gets a down low to Steve Benton in quickly, and it's 2-0. Steve Benton, he's had double figures the last 11 ball games. The ball almost stolen by Benton. Good pressure by the Eagles. We will see it all night. Full court pressure out of BC, and it will be the entire game. And talking to... Jim O'Brien, the coach, he said they're going to come at him right away, didn't he? They have to, and the Aces, on the other hand, have to take advantage of the break when they have it. They go low to Gottfried, and we're tied at 2-2. Dan Gottfried averaging 14 points, puts it in. BC will take those odds. It was one on three, and Gottfried threw in the hook shot. No rebounders for the Aces underneath. BC is described as a team that lives in the perimeter. They really like to put it up from outside like this. And right away, Dana Barros, for the 38th straight game, has hit a three-point shot. He's, the, he's third best in the country. Troy Lewis of Purdue has, they believe, a longer string. That is incredible, Dean. Certainly and is. You'd think he, once every eight or nine games, a kid wouldn't be able to hit one. Yeah, he's got the green light as soon as he gets off the bus. He and Benton both, that being Jamie Benton. Yes, there are two Bentons, as you know, in the starting lineup. We'll try to keep them straight. Jamie is the spark plug. Down low. Nice pass to Simmons, the basket, and the foul. Simmons got three that time underneath, and an excellent entry pass that time by Veltra Dawson. But what really set it up was a Dan Godfrey pick underneath. He really let Steve Benton have it underneath, and uh, Marty got free. So credit Tyrone Scott with the first foul of the ball game. Simmons now with his first basket can tie it. He is shooting 80%, coming in averaging 25 points per contest. Boston College, one of eight teams to go to the postseason tournament. One of two to go to the NIT, and we're tied at five. This is Jamie Benton. He goes 200 pounds in that six-foot frame. He likes. He was one of the top rebounders in the win over Siena last Thursday night. Deltra Dawson on him. Dawson has been a defensive standout the last several ball games for Evansville. This is Steve Benton. Nice feed. Somebody left somebody, but he traveled. Tyrone Scott had the stop, but it's nullified. If you want to talk about these guards, you might say Jamie Benton is more like a... An official's timeout. He wants to wipe the floor up right in front of our booth here. Dana Barrels got a drink there a while ago and spilled some water. If you want to try to compare these BC guards to some people, Benton may be a little like uh, a Sydney Rowe for North Carolina State a couple of years ago. And Barros may be a combination of maybe an Archie Tullis with uh, Gerald Fitz, uh, Fitzgerald. With uh, Butler. Yeah. They saw also a good point. They, uh, the name John Bagley, a familiar now an NBA player with, uh, from out of 
out of BC. He is one of the guys that they, they compare Benton to. Yeah, I don't think Darren Fitz, anyone quite has the uh, range that Darren Fitzgerald had, but certainly Barrows can put it up as soon as he gets around the, the NBA three-point range. He'll, he'll be uh, able to put it up from there from a good 22 feet. There you see the Eagles swarming on defense, but the Aces break it. Simmons gets it down, and he throws it away, trying to hit Brian Hill. So the Aces turn it over. We're tied at 5-5. This is the kind of pace that Boston College wants to get the Aces into. They want the Aces to throw some passes that they're not normally accustomed to, and that was one of them. Boston College finished seventh in the Big East. There's only nine teams in the league, and an offensive foul on Dana Barris. Marty Simmons wanted a technical for throwing the ball, but so does Jim Cruz. Barrows turned around and threw the ball and hit Brian Hill right in the chest with it. That's Barrows first, team second, and the Aces inbounded. We were watching them last night. We remarked on how hard they play defense. And a turnover by the Aces, so to go back to BC. I think they said Simmons shuffled his feet underneath. It was a nice pass by Marty. And that's what the Aces want to do. They're accustomed to bringing it in on the baseline and, and getting either Simmons or Godfrey free. That was a good play that time. Harris being worked on by Hafner. Short rebound Simmons. So the defense work. Here's a long pass to Hill. Back to Hafner. Gives Scott Hafner a deuce. And it's 7-5 Evansville. Nice transition that time by the Aces. Jamie Benton, number 11, led the Big East in three-point shooting percentage with 51%. Simmons with a rebound. Dawson down in a hurry. Hill, but he can't get it in a jump ball and a foul. It's on Brian. Hill came back and... Uh, they were both going after the ball, and they uh, said that Brian went over the back of Francis. We're going to look at it again. Brian should have probably went up and tried to dunk this. Instead, he tried to lay it off the glass and then went over the arm of, of uh, Bobby Francis. Barrows again, and a foul on Scott Hafner. You got to remember the Ohio Valley Conference, not a real physical conference. So the uh, officials may be not accustomed to let these guys play quite as much as maybe some Big Ten officials if they came in here and did the game. That's Scott's first, the Aces second. Both teams now with two team fouls. And we played just about four minutes. 7 5 Evansville. Steve Benton. Benton, a junior out of Philly, out of Philly, PA, averages 10 points. He's got four. He's almost halfway home to his average. Beltra tries to get it, gets knocked away. And here comes another big body, number 35, Doug Abel. He'll be in the starting lineup when we come back, but right now we're going to take a timeout at the stadium. 7-7. It's spring clearance time at King's Superstore, where they're preparing for the largest expansion ever in their history. VCR start as low as 198. 198. Tap and gas or electric ranges with a decorative black oven door start as low as 237. 237. Nothing cleans up kitchen work better than a built-in dishwasher, and King's has them starting as low as 199. 199. And King's has great deals on washers and dryers. Get the pair for only 488. 488. Wow. King's must move their inventory to make room for construction. Don't miss spring clearance time at King's Superstore. Nobody beats King's deal. At Red and White, we feel it's our civic duty as a progressive merchant to promote the welfare of our community. Hi, I'm Howdy Bell, and we'd like to help the churches, PTAs, or any nonprofit organizations. Have your group members save a thousand complete Red and White brand labels. Bring them into your local Red and White supermarket, and we'll give your treasurer a check for $15. It's one way we can help those that make our community such a wonderful place to live. For details, stop by your local Red and White store. Tell a friend. 
depending on how you look at it, this is either the second or third time these two teams have met. The Aces beat the Eagles 96-76 back in the holiday tournament of 1956. Mississippi State beat Denver in the other first round game. But later that night, the president of Mississippi State University ordered his team to return home, citing a state law that forbid racially mixed athletic events. Fortunately, we've come a long way, Dean. Boy, no kidding. But in the next day, Evansville's top team beat Denver for third, and Boston College beat Evansville's reserves 60-58. Not surprisingly, the Eagles counted the win. The Aces didn't count the loss. <laughs> well, if they're playing the reserves, they you can't fault them for that. But this is 1988, second round of the NIT for the alley-oop. Trying to get it to Brian Hill, stolen by Dana Barrows. He motors. Body! Body! And a foul on Scott Hafner. That, that voice you heard yelling body was Jim O'Brien, the colorful and 37-year-old coach of the Eagles. We're going to see it one more time. It happened right in front of the official, Ken Cox. He made no call. You see him right there. It's the behind official that saw the body contact made. It was definitely contact made. And Herman Ramsey says, or uh, Bill Smith, rather, says, Scott picked up foul number two. Barros is a very fine free throw shooter, 86%. And like all good players, he improves. He was an all Big East first team selection this year. He was the rookie of the year in his first freshman year. Was second team all Big East last year. Out of all the great players in that Big East, he led the conference in scoring. He gets it back, pops for three, and gets it. Look out. Dana Barros with his seventh point, and the Eagles go up 11-7. And a foul on Steve Benton, number 24. That's Boston College's third foul. The Aces will inbound it. Doug Abel has checked into the game. He is the man guarding Marty Simmons right now. Dean, it has to be quite a change from Utah for the Aces when they... Utah was a good ball club, but they're nowhere near as quick as these guys. Simmons a little long, almost an air ball. Might have caught a piece of the rim. So the captain couldn't find the range. Steve Benton at the other end. And a lot of banging going on, and a foul on Dan Godfrey. Big Dan, who is coming off a very fine ball game in the first tournament. He had 13 points and 10 rebounds for his ninth double-double and -double rebounds and scoring. But he picks up his first personal here with a little over 15 minutes to go in the first half. Jim Cruz pleading his case. A lot of banging, as you said, going on underneath, and that will certainly be a key as far as the foul situation is concerned. Barrows again. Blocked by Dan Godfrey, his 65th block of the year. He rejects Doug Abel, and here come the Aces. They trail by four. Godfrey, incidentally, was 65. It was tops in conference play. And we'll put a new 45 seconds on the clock. I think it's evident the Aces will have to go to the three-point shot to try to loosen the defense up. The uh, BC Eagles sagging inside right now into the paint. And the Aces continue to try to work it inside. Something that has to be of concern as Brian Hill loses it. But the Aces, Scott Hafter had a tough night the other night. Benton, and there's the, there's the Abel. Jim Cruz wants a foul. That can't, that can't be any more flagrant of a foul and an obvious of a foul, and there was no Doug Abel ball. went airborne like a true eagle and put it in. Obviously, this partisan crowd doesn't like it, and it's a 13-7 Boston College lead. Traveling on Scott Hefner. We're going to look at the play of controversy one more time. Here's the shot by Jamie Benton. Watch Brian Hill as he comes right over his back. I mean, that's an obvious foul. No call. We saw this during their practice last night. These guys go to the board with a vengeance, and you saw it just there. So now the crowd tries to get at it, and countering is Tyrone Scott. Hafner. Nice pass to Godfrey. You could see that one coming. Big Dan is going to slam that one. And it's 15-9. Knocked away. Hafner knocks it away. The Aces will get the ball. 
or make it the Eagles will. Coming in now is Bob Francis, who started number 34. The Godfrey bucket, or the slam dunk rather, was the first bucket to stop a string of 10 points by the Eagles. Boston College was 6 and 10 in the conference. But they beat Siena College, the ECAC North Atlantic regular season champion in the first round. Marty Simmons goes down. Jamie Benton looking for so now Benton has not pulled the trigger yet. And he travels. Or he and again, here comes the pressure. Play. About 13 and a half minutes remaining in the first half. Jim Cruz giving Bill Smith an earful. Simmons down in a hurry to Hill. The Godfrey to foul. And I think they have Mr. Godfrey just a little upset inside. Dan going to the boards with a vengeance with the ball that time. Picked up the foul. Bobby Francis, as you looked at the aces, he'll pick up the foul. As Dan Godfrey goes up, but it does not go in. He'll shoot a pair as Francis picks up his first and team fourth foul. Godfrey to 67% free throw shooter. Dan was among the leaders in field goal percentage in the conference during the regular season, rebounding and blocks. And it's a five point Boston College lead, 15 10. Give Godfrey five of the 10 points. It, retrieved by Bobby Francis. Benton loses it. Simmons has it into the hands of Abel and a foul on Jamie Benton. Benton has his first foul, team fifth, and the Aces will get it. There's got to be a lot of football teams that want him in their backfield. Benton, of course, Barrows was a very fine college prospect, a wide receiver and a defensive back. But he said he didn't want it. He wanted to take care of his body. He wanted to keep his body and parts together. So he chose basketball. Who can blame him? Aces try to get back. Nice feed into Hill, and he loses it, and a ball on Doug Abel. The Aces are working the ball inside well. Simmons with a nice, nice entry pass that time into Hill. And the Aces are going to have to start connecting on their free throws. Godfrey just missing one. And Brian Hill goes to the free throw line. Only a 47% free throw shooter. Checking in a freshman, Corey Beasley out of Baltimore. He comes in for the Eagles. Here's the play. See, wide open in there. And he just got Abel hanging on the wrist. Brian shooting at 47%. Francis clearing out Dan Godfrey. And he's, they talk to him and say, uh, play this one, boys. This one will probably get a little physical before it's over with. So the aces are two of four from the stripe, and they're back within four. It down low and a foul on Brian Hill. That'll send Steve Ben to the line. Eagles just a little quicker than the Aces at each position. Hill that time got caught on the backside and Ben really goes to the, the boards hard. I'm really impressed with him. Didn't realize he was going to be quite that strong inside. We knew that Francis and Scott up front would be tough. Brian picking up his second foul with 12.36 to go in the half and that brings in for the first time, Milt Donald, the sophomore out of Cincinnati. A lot of speculation that another kid from Cincinnati may be going home to Xavier. Ricky Callaway, what do you think? Oh, that would certainly uh, put Xavier in a pretty good stack for next year. They'd have Dave Miner, uh, another IU transfer, and then Callaway the following year. That would set them up with some pretty good quality players. Of course, that is pure speculation. The rumors are rampant. Yes, Jim Cruz knows Ricky Callaway, but I'm sure Jim Cruz hasn't given it a second thought. That's another matter where Ricky Callaway will go next year. 
17-11. The Eagles on top. Mike Blake and Dean Webster live from Robert Stadium. Second round of the NIT. There'll only be eight left. Aaron Pass as Barros cracks it down. There he is, pops it up. They wanted a palming. He really does have a nice shot. He now has, incidentally, almost as many points as he had of a win over Siena. He has nine. He had ten the other night. Dawson in the paint, and he travels. Beltra certainly didn't like that. You're watching your NIT station for basketball, WFIE-TV, Channel 14. We're coming back, 1911 B.C., 12 minutes to go in the half. It only takes a couple of minutes to drive to Broerman Chevrolet in Mount Vernon or Poseyville. Why go to Broerman to purchase a new Chevrolet? Because Broerman is committed to making you a satisfied customer with lower new car prices and superior factory service. No pressure, no gimmick, no hype, only the attention to detail that you deserve. Broerman Chevrolet knows as a satisfied customer, you will be back. Broerman's goal is to have your confidence. At Sunoco, you get more than just great automotive service every day. Many of your local Sunoco dealers now have Express Marts and are anxious to serve you. Enjoy mouth-watering fried chicken and delicious sandwiches from the deli. Step up and satisfy your craving for ice cream or stop by on your way to work for a fresh-brewed cup of coffee. All of this plus Sunoco still meets all your automotive needs with full and self-serve gasoline and complete car care. Express Mart, only at your nearby Sunoco dealer, more than just great automotive service every day. Some of the other games going on tonight will keep you abreast when we get scores. Cleveland State at Ohio State. Houston is at Colorado State. The Bulldogs of Georgia are at Middle Tennessee down at Murfreesboro. Southern Mississippi, the defending champions, taking on Mike Polio and Virginia Commonwealth. Oregon is at New Mexico and Arkansas State at Stanford. Those are the teams left. Connecticut, the Huskies won last night over Louisiana Tech. Dean, we, we've got our headsets on, but you know, it's, it's a great atmosphere tonight. It's kind of like the St. Louis finale. We talked about that earlier in our newscast at 5 o'clock. And needing that kind of atmosphere tonight for the Aces to uh, really get pumped up. But right now, they're being outshot from the field, 14 shots to 8. Simmons only has two of the eight, and the Aces have committed seven turnovers. The officials conferring with Jim O'Brien and also Jim Cruz. the timeouts there are 12 minutes remaining a lot of basketball left in the first half Evansville a slight favorite I don't know what we're Dick Kelly the SID is behind the table that's who they're pointing at he is he's the an official with Boston College Jim Cruz said something that made Jim O'Brien uh, kind of smile half-heartedly. We'll find out what that was all about. At any rate, we're ready to play ball. Jamie Benson out of Providence, Rhode Island. He's number 11. Beasley beating Benton. And Benton with his first basket. Aces down by 10. That's six straight points now by BC as they lead by 10, 21-11. Delta looking for some help, gets it to Simmons for three. And Marty with his sixth point. We Jim O'Brien said, you know, he was raving at how they set picks for Simmons. He says, I don't know if we can stay with them that well. We talked about the, the atmosphere that's in here like the St. Louis game. It may take a Marty Simmons type performance that he had in the St. Louis game. Eight of nine three-pointers. It might take a performance like that night to beat the BC Eagles today. Bobby Francis. Now Francis, who can't get away with that in the Big East with the dominating centers. Puts up his first two. He averages only five points a game. But Boston College felt they could, could go in a little, go inside a little more. A lot of banging going on and a foul on Francis. 
Francis weighs 220. He's banging around with Gottfried, who's 240. Some fresh troops coming in. Tyrone Scott coming back. And Bobby Moran, a very quick freshman. Number 30, he's out of the Queens in New York. 6'3", 180, got a nice looking body on him. Quick as a cat. They've got some athletes on this Boston College team. The foul is on Francis, his second. Team seventh. It'll be the Eagles ball. It remains 23-14, BC by nine. Some early telltale signs here. Uh, maybe a little tight, a little nervous. Uh, Aces haven't hit their free throws. If, if they're gonna get the ball inside, it better be to Simmons because he's gonna hit the free throws. Right now, Hill and Godfrey have both missed some early on. That's a difference in the game. Beasley, and now some unlikely people scoring. Beasley and Francis with buckets from the Right, and it's 25-14. Ten and a half to go in the first half. Ball, ball deflected. They wanted Jim O'Brien's thinking that it was a foul. I think both players were just going for the ball. So I don't think it was intentional. Milt Donald colliding with Bobby Morgan. Moran, rather. Both uh, coaches working the officials a little bit now. And both of them traveling on Milt. Milt Donald turns it over. Milt just picked up his pivot foot. He established the pivot foot and then just picked it right up. That's going to bring in Chris Bamba. Milt Donald a little upset with himself. Here comes Bamba for the first time tonight. Chris a junior out of Bloomington. He played 25 minutes against Utah last week, so you can expect him to see some playing time tonight. Still working it down in the paint. Beasley can't get it off, but Benson does. And a tip by Corey Beasley. Beasley out of Baltimore, Southern High School. He's only a 210 pounds on that frame. They want him to work out with weights, but he can jump. And the aces now have got to be careful. They get it to their main man. Simmons in the paint. And Marty. Simmons draws the contact, still gets it up, and gets the bucket. They want it traveling on Burroughs. They thought Burroughs drug his foot. He goes up now. And a rebound after, though, cannot control it. Aces Ace seems just a little out of sync right now. They haven't got a couple of calls early on. We've had an over a back call, and we've had a couple of traveling calls go the, the wrong way for the Aces, and they seem to be just a little bit frustrated right now as they trail by 11 points. You saw Mike Corcoran in. He's out of Hingham, Massachusetts. He he's is in, a freshman. He's in to play a little defense against Marty Simmons. He's probably going to get some extra playing time tonight to try to give Benton a rest. Milford Austin with the steal. But he loses it. And a foul on Dana Barrows. Barrows ran over Dawson from behind. Picked up the foul. That is Barrows' second. And it comes with 9.03 to go in the first half. That would certainly be a key. And uh, Jim O'Brien looks out at his leading scorer and says, hey, Dana, you've got two fouls. So Beltra Dawson, who says the main part of my game is definitely defense, will now try to generate some offense. There's a question about some team fouls. Beltra is at the line like he's going to shoot some. And he is going to. We've got him for seven. Barrows with two of the seven, and Dawson with his first free throw. He's averaging seven points shooting at 63% from the free throw line. Well, the Aces are going to have to play in the, you know, we've talked a, all, a long time about the Aces cannot play average or certainly not below average and win games, and especially against this caliber. They will have to play a good game. They're back within nine. 27-18, we're under nine minutes. Mike Corcoran. He travels, it'll come back. 
Here's a, one of the scores. Interesting score from St. John Arena. Kind of a surprise there. Cleveland State on top. Cleveland State's got a good team. Of course, coaching Ohio State is Gary Davis. Scott Hafner with the home run. 27th, make that Gary Williams, who used to coach BC. Hafner with a three-pointer. And the Aces get it back. And now this large crowd that for several minutes was not in the game is very much getting into it. And a second foul. They had a... They're calling a foul. Some of the people are yelling, what's going on? And that is a foul. And they're going to call it on Beasley. Corey Beasley, number 31 with his first personal. And Chris Bamba is going to go to the line. Seven straight points now by the Aces. It's been a game of streaks. And Bamba with his first point. He shoots 50%. He's 50-50 from the field and the free throw line. He had only a couple of points, but two assists in that 25 minutes against Utah. And the Aces are back within four. They trail 27-14. Again, the guards account for almost 40% of the offense of Boston College. They beat some pretty good teams. They beat St. John's twice, Syracuse, Jamie Benton, and it put another 45 on the clock. They also beat Syracuse at home. Barros, so now he's gone a little cold, his last three shots not going in. Again, Barros has two fouls, he must be careful. Ryan Hill has two, but he's out of the lineup for UE. They're trying to go to Godfrey, they do. Dan Godfrey with a seven, and Boston College wants to talk it over. 7.37 remaining in the first half. It's a two-point ball game. A special opportunity for homeowners from your bank for life. Old National just put the lid on home equity rates, giving you low rates today and rate security tomorrow. Even if interest soars, your rate will never go higher than 11.99%. Guaranteed. If interest rates drop, yours will too. Our worry-free home equity line of credit. Guaranteed until January 1st, 1991. The only place you'll find it is Old National Bank. If you're thinking about a new mini wagon, you have to be aware that we at Chrysler totally dominate this market, outselling both Ford and Chevrolet combined. And for good reason. We simply have the best built, best back, best value wagon in the industry today. A good example has got to be this 88 Plymouth Voyager with seven passenger seating, back with Chrysler 770 warranty, and loaded with options for $12,770 at Evansville Chrysler Plymouth or Owensboro Chrysler Dodge. Talk about doing a lot in a little amount of time. BC was on a 12-3 run with 10 minutes to go, led 27-14, a 13-point lead, and the Aces in about less than two and a half minutes have ripped off 11 straight points and now just trail it by two. There's the Eagle trying to get what very few Eagle supporters there are in this Roberts Stadium. Boston College plays at the Roberts Center in Boston. They also play eight games and played eight games at the Boston Garden. They are accustomed to large crowds. They played at the Carrier Dome. They played at Seton Hall. They played all over. So this crowd, uh, the size of it isn't going to be imposing. Beltra Dawson now working on Dana Barros. They've alternated with Hafner. Tyrone Scott, in it goes. A foul, and we'll see if the basket is good. They call it on Dan Gottfried, and it is good. Gottfried second. And Tyrone Scott, yes, it's a familiar name to Aces fans, former guard, who played under Dick Walters and who has an assist record uh, that's in jeopardy. 
but this guy's a little bigger. A lot bigger, to say the least. And Beltra Dawson gets it back. So UE now, down by four. 29-25, Boston. Stolen by J Steve Bennon. Barrows puts it up. He wanted three, they give him two. Simmons absolutely got mugged down there as BC came up with the steal. After brings it across, clears it out to Bamba. Here's Simmons for three. Rebound, Bobby Francis. Barrows. Jamie Benton for two. And now the outside tandem of Barrows and Benton, B and B, have put BC back up on top, 33-25. Six straight points now by BC. It seems to be a game of streaks. A foul, a push. We'll see if the basket is good. It is. And a foul on Tyrone Scott. Give Marty Simmons the basket. That could be a big turn of events. This could turn out to be a four-point play. Simmons with 10 points. Tyrone Scott now with his second personal. He may be coming out of there. As you look at Woody Wilson, Jim Cruz, and Will Ray discuss the situation. And yes, Scott comes out, and Willie Foley, a freshman, comes in. They've got a lot of nice freshmen on this team. And Jim O'Brien told us this afternoon, he said, I've got freshmen that just cannot compete right now in the Big East. The conference is so big inside and strong. If I get them outside of the conference, usually they can compete pretty well. Godfrey with his ninth point. 6.20 to go in the first half. Banging going on. They get it down low. A whistle and a foul on, I believe, Marty Simmons. Simmons got on the backside that time and tried to climb over the top, which is what you're supposed to do in that case. Try to get on top of the man, but he grabbed a hold of Benton. That's Simmons' first. And Steve Benton, who has been in double figures the last 11 games, goes to the line. He's got six points. a very hard-nosed type player. He's been a catalyst in this first half. He's done very well for D.C. and given him some points that maybe they don't normally get. He only shot 30 free throws last year, but he made 26 of them, or 27, to hit 89%. So he's good at the line, as indicated by those two there. Scott Hafner had a tough night against Siena. Beltra Dawson and Beltra with his first basket. Give Dawson four points and the Aces come back with it four. 5.45 to go in the first half. And a foul on Chris Bamba. Both of them fighting for position. Francis if you, if you lays some body on him, too, after the whistle blew. Kind of like hitting after the bell right here. If you don't think playing Division I is rugged underneath, just watch this. And these are two relative lightweights yeah. compared to some of the big-time bodies you yeah, got. These, yeah, these guys are only about 6'7", about 220. <laughs> so Bobby Francis, out of Cambridge, Mass., had a big night against Siena in the first NIT win at 13 points. Gets his third and first from the free throw line. He played with Ramil Robinson out of Michigan and John Evans from Rhode Island. He's played with some talented kids in high school. Pretty good company there. So the Aces will bring it up with about five and a half minutes to work with. Baseballs it up to Bamba. Here's Simmons, Marty, down to Godfrey. Godfrey with his 11th point. 
and it's 37-33, Boston College. Simmons set that up with his nice little pump fake. And a foul on UE. They call it on Beltra Dawson. Beltra picks up his first, and now it's one-on-one -on -one time for Boston College. At a time when the Aces looked like it was uh, do-or-die time, down by 13 points, 27 to 14, they have rallied, and they're back within four. One of the plans of Boston College was to play a lot of people in the event that if they could keep it up tempo, they try to run them into the ground. Do you think it's working? Certainly uh, worked for a while, and I don't know if maybe the Aces are getting getting accustomed to maybe not making that pass that they don't normally make, but the Aces are doing a much better job of getting the ball inside and getting the good shot off the transition where the odds are in their favor. Before Godfrey even hit the shot, and I mentioned that it was a one-on-three situation, and Boston College would certainly take that. Here's with a pair, we have another halftime score. Middle Tennessee beating the Bulldogs down at Murfreesboro by three. So Cleveland State, Middle Tennessee State leading at halftime in their respective games. Five minutes to go. Dawson. Retrieved by Dana Barros. Down to Steve Benton. The Aces fall asleep, and Benton puts it off the glass. Steve Benton now with 10 points, and it's an eight-point Boston College advantage. I know so many times the Aces fans, just when the game, uh, there's a home game, they just expect the Aces to walk over their opponent, and U of E in a real dogfight tonight. As they usually are with a quick team. You can take a lot of energy. Here's Hafner. Barrows pushes it up quickly. He stops, pulls the trigger, and look out. Three points, a home run. Barrows with his third three-pointer. He has unofficially 16 points. He and Benton were doing that today, playing a little game of horse, and Benton was just following Barrows around. They were just popping three-pointer after three-pointer. And a push on Jamie Benton, number 11. That's his second. So he, Tyrone Scott, Dana Barrows, and Bob Francis, four of the Boston College starters, have two fouls apiece. That could become a key down the stretch and another substitution as Corey Beasley will come in. Beasley, a good looking freshman, 6'9", 190 pounds. And Jim O'Brien says he's gonna be a real offensive force when he gets a little meat on him in a couple of years. He said he reminds him, Jim O'Brien, of Louis Orr. Yeah. Boy, there are so many talented athletes in this country of ours, aren't there, playing basketball? It's incredible. You, you take it 25 years ago and you know, there weren't that many coming out of the high schools, and now if you go into a Cleveland or a Memphis or a there's a host of kids to pick from. So Chris Bamba has four points, all from the free throw line. We're under four minutes. The Aces still down by nine. Gets it back to Corey Beasley, and Beasley with his first, second basket, and it's an 11-point advantage. They're getting their shots, certainly. Elfra Dawson barking out some instructions. I think they're trying to get Simmons free on the near side. Nice baseline move by Scott Hafner. Hafner with his third bucket. The junior out of Noblesville with three minutes to go. The Aces still a fair piece from being in this game. Dawson has to be careful now with his hands. Could be called for a hand check out front on Barros. Barris is like a water bug. He can really, really motor. Willie Foley and an offensive foul on the freshman. 
Good call, trying to force the action a little bit, and Foley just kind of lowered his shoulder and threw out the arm. Take another look. He says, I'm coming right at you, threw out the arm. Godfrey with pretty good position, picked up the foul. When we come back, there'll be 2.36 to go in the first half. BC by nine. Make your choice of the best from hundreds of high-performance values at Risley's. You'll find a complete selection of microwave ovens from Litton, like this compact model with a variable power control for just $119. It's a really affordable way to discover that nobody knows more about microwave cooking than Litton. Or choose this Litton full-size microwave with electronic touch control and temperature probe cooking for only $188. Either of these Litton microwave ovens can be mounted under your cabinet. Save on the quantity of Litton during the best choice sale at Risley's. For 50 years of service and dedication, this year's gold medal award goes to... Cook Chevy Land. It's been a wonderful 50 years, I mean it when I say, buy many new Chevrolet cars, trucks, or custom vans for $50 over our invoice during our 50th anniversary celebration. Cook Chevy Land, celebrating 50 wonderful years. NIT basketball, as you look in on the mentor of the Evansville Aces, trying to get it across very clearly. His team trails by nine with two and a half minutes to go in the first half. A critical stretch of the last two and a half minutes here, of course. Jim O'Brien on the BC side would like to extend that nine-point lead. And Jim Cruz certainly doesn't want to go in at halftime trailing by nine against a talented team like this. He'd like to cut it to two or three. The last time, this is BC's seventh appearance in the NIT. The last time they almost won it was 1969. There was a young guard on that team named Jim O'Brien. He was a sophomore under the great Bob Cousy. Hey, stay forward, forward. Belter had a little trouble getting it down the floor that time, so threw it off the leg of one of the defenders. I think they'd actually like Hafner to bring it up in this situation. The Aces, unbeaten at home this year, have won 20 in a row over the last two. Simmons, upset with himself. He fails to draw iron. I've noticed, Dean, they, they forced Simmons and Hafner both to alter their shot. Barrows goes up, and a foul on Veltra Dawson. They've done that a couple of times, and a real good defense, I'm telling you, by Boston College. There, They play it on both ends. They've got the good offense, but they can also play good defense. This is a nice offensive mood, and he got Veltra Dawson, that is Dana Burroughs did, to commit the foul, and that is Veltra's second. The key is you can't let him penetrate, right? Well, that's easier said than done no, when, I mean, when a guy like Barrows is just so quick. But he, they're doing the right thing by by try, trying to contain. You can't stop a guy out there, but what Veltra's just trying to do is just trying to contain him a little bit. But with the uh, the input of the three-point shot, you almost have to go out and play that man now. So the Big East leading score has already... 18 points here in the first half. He's coming out. He's going to take a blow with 208. And in comes another, probably even quicker guard, Bobby Moran, a freshman out of New York. Played at the Berkshire School. He was a three-sport captain. Missed by the Aces and a rebound by Benton. We're under two minutes. And he traveled. Benton turns it over. That was a good idea down here by Simmons. He stopped and took the three-pointer because he saw Godfrey with good position underneath. Dan didn't get the rebound, but he did have the inside position. After. So the Aces are putting up blanks right now as Beasley pulls down the rebound. Jim O'Brien says, take some time off. Down to a minute 40 in the first half. BC would be content right now to go to the locker room with an 11-point lead. Jamie Benton, Hafner's been doing a good job. Here's Foley, pivots. Willie Foley. This kid can score. He had 10 against Syracuse in the Big East tournament. Simmons pulls up, down to Godfrey to foul in the basket. Godfrey kind of rolled his eyes after the ball went in and said, I finally got one of those to go in when I got fouled. Dan has five baskets and three three throws. He's been leading the aces. 
Moran's coming out. Barrow's coming back in, number three. Give the foul to Foley. That's his second. The Aces trailed it by 13 for the second time. They cut it back to two after they did it the first time. And now it's back to a 10-point lead. Brian Hill, who's been out for several minutes, pick up his second foul early. Comes back in for Dan Godfrey. He's playing with two fouls. He's playing with a, against a couple of Baltimore products. So down to a minute, 50-40. UE wanting to stay in the hunt. Then they let him. They let him get free, and in he goes. Benton with 12. He's already over his average of 10. Simmons can't get it to go, so Marty's having problems. Down to 35 seconds. The shot clock is off. They can air it out if they want. And they will. BC head coach Jim O'Brien stood up and said, spread. Spread the offense. Again, the Eagles, they were 13 and one at home. They did not play a common opponent with Evansville. So you really can't compare scores. But if you're familiar at all with the Big East, you know it's tough. They don't, they don't get it off and that's the half. But nonetheless, it's Boston College 52, UE 40. We're coming back in just a moment. It's the biggest event of the year, your Ford dealer's spring sell-a-thon, now through March 31st. Save big on Ford's number one sellers, like Ford Ranger and F-Series trucks. Get free factory air conditioning plus $500 cash back. Total savings, almost $1,900 on Ranger, over $2,600 on F-Series, before you get our best deal. The spring sell-a-thon, open extra hours, on-the-spot financing, high trading allowance, but it all ends March 31st at your Ford dealer. Western Ribeye is the best seafood house around, so join in our seafood celebration. Now through the end of the month, Western Ribeye is reeling in five mouth-watering seafood dinners for only $8.95, including our famous salad bar and drink. Five seafood feasts for only $8.95. Western Ribeye, News Watch, the most trusted name in news. We've earned that reputation after years of caring, being involved, being accurate, being innovative, and because our news team remembers what news is all about, people. Remember, you can trust News Watch only on WFIE-TV Channel 14. Most businesses have ups and downs. But some have more downs than ups. The more they go down, the harder it is to go back up. One advertising medium can make your business highs higher and give you the jump on your competition. Television. Television advertising means business. More business for you. Call WFIE at 426-1414 today. 42-40, Boston College at the half. Zane, uh, kind of a half of streaks, huh? Well, it's been a strange one. It started off kind of back and forth, and then uh, BC outscored the Aces 12-3, got up by 13, but then Aces ran off 11 straight, and they got it back within two, but then another Boston College streak. This was 23-12 over the last half, and they lead it at the half, 52-40. Dana Barros, the leading scorer in the Big East, he's lived up to his billing. Well, he's creating things right now. Normally, Marty Simmons creates things for the Aces. Dana Barrels creates even more for BC right now. We knew he was a great scorer, but he's also a good penetrator and he dishes off well. For the Aces to get back in this thing, what what are one of the what's the absolute thing they've got to do? Well, they've got to they've got to try to contain Barrels a little more. Although Hafner and Dawson both have uh, two good. fouls here in the first half. Again. When they get it inside, the Aces are going to have to score. Hill and Godfrey got fouled early on and didn't hit their free throws. So when they get it inside, they're going to have to score. When we come back, we're going to talk to a representative of the NIT. 
and also the commissioner of the MCC, Jim Schaefer, standing by. We'll be right back. The best-dressed hams wear the Amgi label. From a festive holiday dinner to a late-night snack, served on your finest china or stacked in a hearty sandwich, nothing beats the wonderful taste of Amgi ham. It's tender and juicy with a rich flavor that's just right for so many occasions. And quality. Well, you know you can trust Emgi for the freshest, leanest ham anywhere. Your family will love it. Mmm, gimme Emgi. When you've worked on as many sinks and screen doors, walls and windows, lamps and lawns as I have, you find out where to get your hardware. That's why Keister's gets all my business. Hey, I've shopped around, but I've always come back to Keister's. There's no one more convenient or helpful, and Keister's always has the right price on everything I need when I need it. Hey, I'm no expert handyman, but with Keister's handy, I don't have to be. Red and white bakery bakers bake the bread that bakers buy. Do you? These red and white bakery breads are baked with all the care, ingredients, and nutrition bakers expect in quality breads. Every night, deep in the heart of red and white bakeries, bakers bake to bring you freshness when you shop. So if you haven't shopped today, shop the store where bread is best, your red and white food store. Remember, bakery buyers buy their bread at red and white. Do you? to have with us as one of our halftime guests, the commissioner, the well-traveled commissioner of the Midwest Collegiate Conference, Jim Schaefer. Jim, you've really been, you got your suitcase packed. Uh, you've been all over, haven't you? I really have. I was here uh, for the first NIT game. I left first thing the next morning, went out to Lincoln, Nebraska, and unfortunately, Xavier just didn't play too well and uh, went back to Indianapolis and came back here uh, for today's game. Were you surprised about Xavier? I know they felt terrible about not going on, but uh, were you surprised at all? Well, I, I really kind of was, because I think they were on a roll, as you know, from our tournament. They went out and just didn't play very well, but uh, hey, we all know that happens in the NCAA tournament, but they had a great year. Here, of course, uh, it's not what the folks wanted with the, at halftime, and you've seen it before. Evansville can come back. What do you know about the NIT and uh, and how this came about, or where they might go from here and so forth? It's been a great uh, tournament. We know it's the oldest college tournament in the country. They do a great job, and, and we're certainly pleased. Uh, Evansville got in for the first time ever, so now now we can say every team in our tournament in our conference has been in the NIT or the NCA. But uh, I think if they win, they got a good shot to host again. I know a lot of things coming in the new year. What excites you about 88-89 in the MCC? Certainly uh, Dayton coming in for basketball is probably the biggest thing. And then Marquette the next year. And, of course, we go to Dayton for our tournament. And we, we anticipate we'll have sellouts over there after having a great run at Market Square. And we improved every year. But we're looking forward to Dayton next year. Jim, we're looking forward to working with you. Thanks for the time. We hope it's a happy outcome. Jim Schaefer, the M MCC. Again, we're talking to someone from the NIT when we come back after this brief timeout. At Kite Home Center's fabulous anniversary sale, there are lots of things you won't find. Candlelight dinner for two with romantic music, flowers and candy and wine. Ah, oh, come on, no wine. Forgetful spouses searching for last-minute anniversary presents. Golly, do you think she'd like this garbage disposer? No, none of that cliche anniversary stuff. What you will find at Kite Home Center is terrific values for every part of your home. Come celebrate our anniversary with fabulous savings at Kite Home Center. Now Union Federal has a CD account to let you change your own rates. Uniflex. Uniflex means you don't have to wait for interest rates to go up. Because after you open your Uniflex account, you can upgrade the rate once without extending the term. You decide when to lock in the higher rate. Uniflex, the new flexible rate CD from Union Federal. Safe, secure, and now you don't have to wait. Depend on us. You've always known Hardee's for country fresh buttermilk biscuits made from scratch. And we mean scratch. Bet you didn't know you can get them with something new. A big country breakfast. Scrambled eggs, real potato hash rounds, ham, bacon, or sausage, your choice. So country big, we serve it on a platter. Hardee's new big country breakfast. Just $1.99. Because at Hardee's, we're out to win you over. 
Dean Webster back at Roberts Stadium. And the man in charge of this NIT game is Steve Sorkin. And Steve, you've got to be excited about coming into a place like this that is packed. I'll tell you, Dean, this is a great place to have a game. This is my first time in Evansville. It's a great crowd. It's a great band. And I think we're seeing a great game right now. And you know, hopefully it ends up as a great second half as well. You've got a great NIT tournament going. You've really got some good teams, haven't Yeah, there, there are some excellent teams in the field this year, and a lot of them are playing tonight. I had the privilege to see Virginia Commonwealth and Marshall and University of Connecticut, West Virginia last week, and all very fine teams. And the two teams out here tonight are just as good, and I don't know who's going to end up in New York, but I, I know it's going to be two good ones. All of this is going to culminate here in a couple of days, but you've got another big tournament coming up before the regular season next year. And, of course, that's the Big Apple NIT before the season really gets underway. Right. The Big Apple tournament is a preseason tournament, and next year it's going to feature some of the top teams in the nation. Just to name a few, Indiana and Louisville, Syracuse, North Carolina, and... There's uh, 28 more teams, and it's, it's going to be excellent. We're really looking forward to that. That seems to be the, the you know, everybody thought that was going to where the NIT would, would move. But the postseason tourney has really been going well, too. Yeah, you know, it's sometimes difficult with 64 teams playing ahead of you, but this term is going excellent. It's really the best we've had in a couple of years. Steve, thanks for being the NIT representative here. We're glad to have you. It's 52-40. The Aces trail Boston College. And when we come back, we'll have a look at those first half stats. Hello there, I'm the little old secretary who lived in a file. You know, the one with so many papers, she didn't know what to do? That is, until she found Smith & Butterfield, the filing place. Now her dilemma is solved. She's found two drawer and three drawer, four drawer and five drawer files, vertical files and lateral files, steel files and mobile files, home files and office files, and best of all, all at low economical budget prices. Smith & Butterfield, the filing place, with four convenient locations to serve you. Make your choice of the best from hundreds of high-performance values at Risley's. Mitsubishi quality and performance have never been more affordable. Get random access cable-ready tuner and wireless remote control with a forehead Mitsubishi VCR featuring on-screen programming. Or choose a 14-inch diagonal color television and enjoy vivid color reproduction with Mitsubishi's exclusive Diamond Vision Picture Tube. Your choice of the Mitsubishi VCR or television, just $3.99 during the best choice sale at Risley's. Once again, as you see, the Aces trailing by a dozen. Some of the uh, stats, Dean Webster. Well, I think that the big stat is is just the shooting-wise. The Aces uh, just aren't getting an, enough shots, and they're not getting enough of them to go down. They they're hitting 54 percent, but a a red hot 63 percent by Boston College and the uh, the free throws fairly even and of course the aces out rebounded as always this time 13 to 8 and the turnovers uh, 8 by the aces and 7 by Boston College I'm sure those numbers are up a little bit from what both coaches would like but with the tempo of that first half and 92 points scored you'd almost anticipate that as far as the scoring uh, pretty much from the expected quarters right pretty much the uh, top three for the aces the three you might expect and uh, maybe a little different order than one might anticipate Godfrey with 15 Simmons with 11 and Hafner with seven points on the other side everyone knew about Dana Barros coming in and he has 18 points Jamie or that is Steve Benton with 12 and Beasley also with six points and uh, really the, the foul trouble may be uh, kind of not noticed because a lot of people with two fouls on Boston College so if they pick up an early one here in the second half BC could run into a little bit of foul trouble as we mentioned before BC finished seventh in their Big East Conference but that's uh, that's nothing to be uh ashamed of eight of the nine teams are in postseason play six went to the NCAA Connecticut and Boston College came to the NIT. And the only team that didn't go to the tournament was a team that finished in the, uh, fi went to the Final Four, the NCAA tourney last year. And uh, when you lose a lot of players like that, it's hard to rebuild. And they say that, that talking about Providence. They say, and of course yesterday, Gordon Chiesa stepped down and they say he had to fill, uh, he had to fill the shoes of Rick Pitino. Tough shoes to fill in one year. They went 11 and 17. We're coming back with a second half tip right after this. It's the biggest event of the year, your Ford dealer's spring sell -a -thon. now through March 31st. 
save big on Ford's number one sellers with cash back plus option savings on the best selling car in the world, Ford Escort. On America's best selling mid sized car, Ford Taurus. Save over $2,000 on a Thunderbird Turbo Coupe before you get our best deal. The Spring Sellathon. Open extra hours. On the spot financing. High trading allowance. But it all ends March 31st at your Ford dealer. When you've got a big job to do, you're ready to move up to the limousine of lawn tractors, Snapper, with a high back system and smooth on-the-go shifting with disk drive. With Snapper riding mowers, you'll discover rugged dependability and innovative features. It's no wonder Snapper's rear-engine riders are America's number one choice. Youth Outdoor Power Equipment, Evansville, Indiana, Weidenbanner Ford Tractor, Jasper, Indiana, Windles Outdoor Equipment, Owensboro, Kentucky. Second round of the NIT and the second half to go. If the Aces are to win their 21st in a row at home, they're going to have to put it together here in the second half against a very fine Boston College team, which, as Dean mentioned, shot, shot very well in the first half, out to a lead of 52-40. When we talked to Jim O'Brien today at noon, the first question I asked him was just how important is tempo going to be? And he said, in this game, it may be very important. He said, we've got to run the ball. We've got to get the aces in a transition game. And uh, I, I think he wanted to shoot the ball well, but I don't know if he realized that his Eagles were going to shoot quite that good. Normally, when you come in to play a place, you might have kind of a cold shooting first half. But the Eagles have found the Roberts Stadium rims to their liking. 63%, and the Ace is not doing too badly at 54%. They're sixth in the United States in field goal percentage at 53. And as a team defensively, they are 11th, holding their opponents to 43%, so about 20% better is Boston College. Again, Marty Simmons with 11, Gottfried with 15, Hafner with seven. Those are the three leading scores. But we mentioned the other night where Simmons had 29 against Utah. He's got to get they got to get some help from some other factions as you look in on the Eagles. Well, he is uh, he's actually struggled just a little bit with his shot. He is is not hitting the three pointers like he was. And in fact, remember the the awesome game he had against St. Louis. He put on just an incredible show and a lot of it was from three point range. Since then, only three of 12 three point land in his last two games. And another thing that, that Marty normally does is he dishes off the assists and he's only handed out four assists. That means a pass that leads to a bucket only four times in the last two games. So Simmons will probably have to get his hands on the ball a little more. That's probably why he's not dishing out the assists. He just is having trouble getting the ball. Good defensive pressure being applied by the teams. So the maroon and gold, the papal colors of Boston College. Benton with a jump ball. It goes over to the Aces. We got one final in the NIT. And Mike Polio's Virginia Commonwealth crew goes to 23 and 11 with a 93-89 win over Southern Mississippi. So the defending champs are gone. There'll be a new champion in the 51st NIT. Scott after gets his man off the floor, takes it up and in. Scott with his ninth point, and the Aces are back within 10. You can bet the Aces made some adjustments at half. Jim Cruz and his assistants, very good. Jim O'Brien has some, he has surrounded himself with some excellent people. Barrels with an off-balance shot, and Beltra Dawson with a rebound. They want to alter Barrels as much as they can. Simmons. Hill with a tremendous rebound. The Eagles throw it away. The Eagles have the rebound. Boy, Hill got off the ground. Dana Barrels had two people around him that time as the outlet pass came, and then they tried to shift it over to Benton and threw it right out of bounds. Hafner. And a whistle and a push on Tyrone Scott. Scott back Godfrey clear off the floor. He put him almost onto the concrete. Get it, 
and that will be Scott's third. So now Scott and Francis, two of the big men up front, have 3,000 apiece. Ace is trying to get back into single digits. It's been a while. There's the feed. They try to go into Ryan Hill, and it'll be retained by UE. They're trying to utilize Hill's athleticism along the baseline. Jim O'Brien, a native of the of Brooklyn, New York. And a foul on Bobby Francis. And it's a big one. Well, we thought we had him for four fouls. That is just foul number three. So now Francis and Scott both have three fouls. Simmons looking for some help, gets it. Ace is still down by 10. Simmons pulls the trigger. And another foul, this one. And a push on Scott. Or wait a minute, they call 34. And that will be Francis' fourth foul. And Jim O'Brien is beside himself. He does not like what's going on. And now the crowd of nearly 10 and a half thousand starting to get into it. <laughs> nearly a five second call. So the fouls have piled up here quickly. Godfrey. <laughs> Pink long and around will be taken over by VC. Aces bench applauding. Some people have asked about Olaf Blop. He's been sidelined since February 22nd. I doubt if we'll see him again tonight. He's got that trouble with his leg. He hasn't played in the last seven games. Hasn't scored in the last seven. He, he got in against uh, Detroit late in the game. Dana Ferros gets it in and a foul on Veltra Dawson. Make that Brian Hill. They said Hill got him to shove him into Veltra. One ref looked like he was pointing at Dawson. And that's the third foul on Brian. Down low, and they left. Doug Abel was alone and puts it in. So it's a 12 point spread again. After the Simmons. Marty now will shoot for three. And it goes off. That's a terrible call. <laughs> it appeared to go off of Boston College, but it's going to the Aces. Went off of uh, Abel's hands, if we have another look at it. Right there, off of 35. And uh, Doug Abel says, gee, ref, I didn't get it. Coming down, almost. Three minutes have been played here in the second half. It is still a 12-point Boston College lead. Benton down low to Benton. Benton to Benton and a foul on Beltra Dawson. The B and B connection worked that time. That is Dawson's third. It is the team's second. Scott Hafter comes over to get some instructions. Jim Cruz, what a job he's done. The Aces, 21 and seven, making their first postseason tournament appearance in six years as the ball is knocked away by BC. Nice defense that time by Brian, and that's why the Aces have to keep Hill on the floor tonight. We'll try to get you an attendance figure. We saw one earlier at 9,600. Three by Barrows, home run. His first basket of the second half. He's now got 21. He's got his average. Biggest lead of the night at 15 for BC. Hafner. Hafner in a hurry. He's in double figures with 11. And that's a good wise move that time for the Aces to come down and take a two. Barrows tries to bring rain, but there again, Doug Abel was at the right spot with the putback. 
And the Baltimore freshman out of Calvert Hall High School puts the Eagles back on top by 15. We talked about how at, at halftime how Barrows, we knew he could shoot, but he really penetrates and creates things, and that time he did. Godfrey. Dan comes out and puts it in. Godfrey, a good shooter from out with his 17th point. And traveling, they turn it over on the inbounds pass. And we're going to take a timeout. When we return, it'll be 15-54 remaining. Aces trail it by 13. Have you noticed that most new car dealers are so busy dealing that they never bother to sell you a new car truck? While the other guys worry about where their next deal is coming from, Broerman Chevrolet's future sale comes from the customer they sold to today, because satisfied customers always come back. At Sunoco, you get more than just great automotive service every day. Many of your local Sunoco dealers now have Express Marts and are anxious to serve you. Enjoy mouth-watering fried chicken and delicious sandwiches from the deli. Step up and satisfy your craving for ice cream or stop by on your way to work for a fresh brewed cup of coffee. All of this plus Sunoco still meets all your automotive needs with full and self-serve gasoline and complete car care. Express Mart, only at your nearby Sunoco dealer, more than just great automotive service every day. There you see the boss, Ace Springsteen, there with his uh, group. They were some of the performers here at the timeout. Incidentally, exciting IHSAA boys basketball returns to 14, 9.30 a.m. Saturday. The finals from Market Square. Damon Bailey of the Bedford North Lawrence Stars and Company will go for the state crown. We'll have all three games for you Saturday on 14. Aces right. ball, they trail 59-46. They've only hit three of nine shots here in the second half, and Marty Simmons has missed his last six shots. Nice pass to Hill, who loses it as he tries to go baseline. They continue to try to work it inside to Hill, probably more than I've ever seen the Aces try to get it inside to Brian. They put the clamps pretty much on Jamie Benton. He averages 12, he's had four, but as we mentioned, he's hit 51% of his three-point shots. This guy has been murdered. He's already got 21, there he goes. Dumps it back to Benton, who couldn't get it off. This time he puts it up, and a tip, and a foul on Doug Abel. Abel, number 35, he can sky as we'll get another look. We saw Abel go hard in the first half to the boards and got away with an over-the-back call. This time comes over Godfrey Danhill and gets called for it. Simmons doesn't like what he sees inside, takes it back out. 15 minutes and seconds here remaining. And a foul on Marty Simmons. Offensive foul on Marty, his second personal. Marty leaned in, the man was moving, but the uh, referee said Marty initiated the contact. Steve Benton, who Boston College believes is their best defensive big man, draws the foul. And now BC will try to add to its 13-point lead. They led by a dozen at the half, 52-40. Will they try and air things out to keep the crowd out of it? They got the I don't they yeah. got the big lead by running. I don't I don't think they First, far be it for me to tell Jim O'Brien how to coach. I think they try to keep it going for a while. 14 and a half minutes to go in the game, and it's a little early to be trying to take the air out of it against a good defensive team like the Aces. That's the second foul on Steve Benton. Fourth team foul, so the Aces get it back with 14 and a half remaining. This is Dawson. Are just having trouble finding the bottom of the net. Barrows. The Aces did a good job that time. Closing off the transition. Abel with Hill with a rebound. Brian Hill. And Hill with a much 
overdue basket his first and the aces first at several moments and it's 59 48 UE back with an 11 and this crowd of 9600 plus trying to get into it and a foul on Scott Hafner Bobby Moran number 30 about to check in for Boston College Jim O'Brien hands on hips wants wants to make sure his troops know what's going on Benton's going to come out I think Barrels may be actually just raw quicker than Tullus of Detroit. You're watching your station for NIT basketball, WFIE TV, Channel 14, Evansville. Mike Blake along with Dean Webster. Second round of the NIT. Uh, five seconds. They did not penetrate it soon enough. And it goes back. And there you see what Jim O'Brien thinks of the call. He says, give me a break, ref. And for the first time, Boston College is going to go back, I think, into a zone. No, they're going to stay in the man-to-man. -man. They went back and almost set up in a 2-3 zone, but that's just the way they picked them up. Godfrey draws the foul, and it's on Doug Abel. Abel wants to stay in the game, pleading to Jim O'Brien to leave him in. Not so. That'll be his third. Corey Beasley comes in. Abel with four fouls will check out. No, no, wait a minute. They're giving that to Tyrone Scott. And Jim O'Brien says, wrong, wrong guy. That's right. It should be on 35. They're going to correct it. They may have called it on 44. Our replay showed Scott right in front, and no, Scott may have committed the be, foul first. But beforehand, it was 35 with the foul. Was it? And maybe we can take another look at it. Abel won't be able to come back into the game. He's trying to check back in. He pointed to 35, the official. He can't come back into the game. He was just taken out. There it is. Look, Dean, there's the foul there. Now they can't let him back in, and Willie Foley's going to come in. Well, let's mark this one down, 13-29, and Scott picks up foul number four. And Godfrey with his 18th point, first free throw of the second half. He's had six tonight from the strike. Ace is back within 10. crowd gets to its feet and Boston College brings it across nine point ball game Boston College 16 and 13 the aces 21 and 7 Benton in the paint and a foul on Marty Simmons and that's three on Simmons this really disrupts the flow at both ends it certainly does the uh, officials trying to trying to keep control of the game I suppose Again, the officials, if you're joining us late, are from the OVC. All three from the Ohio Valley Conference. They really haven't been into the flow. You know, everybody has their bad day, and they really haven't seemed to be in the flow tonight. Here's a guy that's been in the flow, Dana, Dana Barros. Boy, he drives you absolutely nuts and does not get the roll. Hafner with a rebound. A lot of banging that time inside. So a little banging, they call a foul. A lot of banging, no call. Hafner for three. Foley had the ball. Belcher Dawson gets it back to Gottfried. In and out. Gottfried again. And Jim O'Brien wants to talk it over. Timeout, Boston College. The Aces are back within seven, and they're on their feet at Roberts. 
spring clearance time at King Superstore, where they're preparing for the largest expansion in their history. Save on a complete Fisher home audio system. They start at only $229. 229. Take home a new frost-free family size refrigerator. They start as low as $399. $399. Check out the deals on 19-inch color TVs with remote control. They start as low as $238. $238. And microwaves start from just $77. $77. Bucks. Kings must move their inventory to make room for construction workers. Don't miss spring clearance time at King Superstore. Nobody beats King's deal. Want to go for a spin? I'm a wheel watcher. I'm a wheel watcher. Every day. Fortune, Monday through Saturday at 6.30, only on WFIE TV, Channel 14. Jim O'Brien out of Brooklyn, New York, getting it across. He spent four years as head coach at St. Bonaventure before taking over here at Boston College. Jim Cruz out of the Knight School of Coaching in his third year here with the Aces. There are the cheerleaders, the Boston College Eagle. The place is rocking. It's a seven-point, 59-52 Boston College lead. But at one time, Dean, it was 15. That's right. It was uh, a 57-42 Boston College lead. And the Aces, trailing 59-44, have ripped off eight straight. And they're back within seven, 59-52. And this game is a long way from over. Jamie Bent directing traffic. with a turnover. The Aces will get it back. Jim O'Brien pleads his case. Hafner and Godfrey are the dynamic duo right now that's bringing the Aces back. Ryan Hill, now Godfrey loses it. So does Barrows. They want to credit Barrows with an excellent play. Both plays, both teams lose it. Beasley and traveling is called. So again, we haven't gone more than about 15 seconds without a completed play. Barrows, who is only 5'10", but can stuff behind his, behind his head, jumped up there and knocked that ball away from a much taller Brian Hill. He was right up there with Brian Hill, and we all know how high Brian can get. So Yui, the aces again now, trying to reduce it even more. We're under 12 minutes, 11.49 to go. Here's Simmons. Godfrey bats it back to Hill, and they'll get a new 45 on the clock. So even though the captain's having trouble finding the range, nice pass to Godfrey, and he travels. Steve Benton just reached out as Simmons was trying to come around a pick and just shoved him back in the corner. Jim Cruz says, way to go. We're still in it. Both coaches up really working the officials. call it two. Jamie Benton with his first basket of the second half. He's got six points. That's the first points in a while. Hill. He'll bring it back out. We're down to 11 minutes. Godfrey. Big Dan right now is the Aces offense. He has scored eight of the last ten points. He's, he's tied his season high of 23. Barrows penetrates, and Brian Hill puts up his hand and says, I got him. I believe that is four on Brian. It is. And in this situation, I wouldn't be surprised to maybe see a Jeff Morning as opposed to Chris Bamba. The Aces will have to be looking for some offense out of that other forward spot. Seven point, 61, 54 lead, Boston College. Down to almost 10 and a half minutes. 
Benton gets it blocked. Beasley retrieves it, puts it up. Beasley gets it back, loses it, and Dawson has it. Hill, despite four fouls, stayed right in there and was aggressive. Simmons in the paint. Ari Simmons with his first second half basket. And with 10 minutes remaining, it's 61-56. Artie Simmons went to the basket that time like he just got his wake-up call. And a foul on Scott Hafner. Perros fighting the pick. And Scott now has to be careful. That's four with, at the 9.56 mark. Scott picks up his fourth. Bobby Francis, number 34, back in for the maroon and gold. You know, you think as long as he has chased Barrows tonight, all it takes is just a mistake here and there, and you're going to pick one up to the first half, to the second half, and he's got four, and he'll have to go out now. That brings in Milt Donald, number 22, as Scott Hafner will come out. And this is a position where the Aces miss Curtis Jackson more and more. Barrows looking for his 22nd point. He had five free throws in the first half. He's a finalist for the Pomeroy, Naismith Pomeroy Award, which is, goes to the top player in America under 5'10", five, under five or under six feet, I guess. We've seen a couple of this year. He's a good one. I think Stan Kimbrough of Xavier is another one. So Barros with two. And the Eagles go back up by seven. fortunate enough to win tonight. The word is they would host another game or would have a chance of hosting and that it would probably be Friday night. But that's a long way off. Right now, Boston College almost playing. Well, now they have gone to a zone, it looks like. Dawson. Simmons, or rather Hill, goes back up. Could not get the tip. This is Jamie Benton. The Aces got within five. They trail by as many as 15. Nice picking set for the, and a foul on Dana Barrows. Simmons draws the foul. Barrows got the green light, but blew the bunny and drew the foul. I think Barrows realized that he turned around as soon as he made contact. And that is three on him. Foul number three. And we're into the one and one, so Simmons will go to the free throw line. 5 on the clock. Hardy, by the way, has now become the third highest single season score in UE history. We congratulate him. With his 13 tonight, he's now got 736. He Only Larry Humes is ahead of him. Humes got 941 points in 64-65 and then came back with 837 the next year. So Simmons with another milestone in his illustrious career. You see a portion of the crowd, this large crowd behind Marty as Simmons hits them both as the Aces draw back within five. 15 for Simmons, nine minutes remaining, a five-point ball game. Boston College with a rich tradition of its own. It's the largest Jesuit school in America. It's got an enrollment of about 15,000. Barros on a fadeaway, pretty shot. Dana Barros, he's now got 25. When you're hot, you are hot. Absolutely. Simmons, length of the court, doesn't get it, but draws the foul. Simmons right now is just saying, Folks, we're not going to be denied, and he has taken the ball and going straight to the hoop. That time he got it at the 10 second line, and he took it all the way in himself. And Jim O'Brien says, I don't care how many of you have to get in front of him, stop him. Willie Foley will commit the foul here right there. He's number 50, and that's three on Foley, the freshman. 
and the senior Marty Simmons who aces fans of course hope is not playing his final game he has really had a year full of memories first team all MCC for the second year in a row Sixth leading scorer in America, averaging 25 points a game. He's got 17. Aces still within five. We're down to 820. Jamie Benton gets around and puts it up. Well, he's got to be like moving a moving a truck out there. He is really broad and really smooth for as big as he is. And now with Hafner out of the lineup, the Aces have a little trouble with breaking. Whoever wins this game probably will know tonight between midnight and 1 a.m. whom they'll play and where they'll play next. Simmons. Godfrey. Tips again and it's in. Give it to Simmons. Simmons with the tip. He's got 19. Barros almost loses it. Beltra Dawson with the hustle. And we're still involved in a five-point ball game. Seven and a half minutes remaining. BC has led nearly the entire game. This time Benton gets the position and draws the foul. Is it on Godfrey, Donald, or Simmons? They were all three there and they give it to Marty. I don't know. It is. And that is foul number four. He picks it up with 726 remaining. So Simmons, Hafner, and Hill now, all three. Four fouls. So the ace is getting in a little bit of foul trouble. Steve Benton, who is now in double figures for the 12th straight time, goes to the line. He's a good free throw shooter. That's his fifth free throw and his 13th point. He's a junior out of St. John Newman in Philadelphia. And in the last 11 games, besides being in double figures, he's been the leading rebounder six times. He's actually a forward. And a timeout at Roberts Stadium, 7.26 remaining. Boston College on top, 68-62. You are about to witness an incredibly effective fitness machine. Airdyne from Schwinn, the only machine of its kind that lets you exercise your lower body and upper body together for maximum cardiovascular benefits and healthy muscle tone. Use the Airdyne for as little as 20 minutes every other day to help achieve and maintain total fitness. Schwinn Airdyne, the ultimate fitness machine. See the Schwinn Airdyne at your nearest Gillis Schwinn Cyclery today. If you're thinking about a new mini wagon, you have to be aware that we at Chrysler totally dominate this market, outselling both Ford and Chevrolet combined. And for good reason. We simply have the best built, best backed, best value wagon in the industry today. A good example has got to be this 88 Plymouth Voyager with seven passenger seating, backed with Chrysler's 770 warranty, and loaded with options for $12,770 at Evansville Chrysler Plymouth or Owensboro Chrysler Dodge. They're trying to get the beat here for the Evansville Aces who trail 69-62. Seven point ball game with seven and a half or 726 remaining. The Boston College Brain Trust has the Eagles break camp. They're gonna go with Beasley, Benton, Benton, Barros, and Bobby Francis. The Aces will come out in a moment. In the meantime, you've got a couple of finals. Ohio State has come back and beaten Cleveland State 86 to 80. We told you Virginia Commonwealth had beaten Southern Mississippi 93-89. And now Middle Tennessee by 10 points over Georgia. Boy, that is surprising. 69-59, of course, that one at Middle Tennessee. So Middle Tennessee goes to 23 and 10. And they, along with Virginia Commonwealth, are the winningest teams left in the NIT. Beltra Dawson flares it out to Hafner. Strong rebound by Beasley. Here's Barrows, or rather Benton at the other end. Jammed by Bobby Francis. Under seven minutes, 6.55. 
the aces have brought Hafner back in. So three aces with four fouls. So when the whistle blows, there could be a purple ace headed for the bench. Try to go to Hill. They get it, and he gets it in. There's the ace. There's a the man they could use right now with a good leg, Curtis Jackson. Unfortunately, his, his year and career came to an end at Xavier, February 20th, with torn ligaments. But we salute him for his outstanding season as Steve Benton operates inside for his 15th point, 73-64. He averages 11 points a game, but he has hit in double figures his last 11s, and Benton has averaged 15 points during that. Ryan Hill again. Nice feed from Simmons and Bryan with a second straight bucket. Six minutes exactly remaining as Jamie Benton walks it up. Mike Corcoran, number 32, about to check in for the Eagles. Dana Barros, who has 25, has had 20 games in which he's been over 20 points, muscling their way in, and a rebound by Hill. He has been over 35 times. Nice defensive play that time by the Aces. Godfrey came over and forced the alteration of the shot. Down to five and a half. Simmons. And the captain goes into the 20s. 21 points for Marty Simmons, and Jim O'Brien calls another timeout. This time with 5.19 remaining, 73-68. Jim O'Brien did not like what he was seeing. He saw Brian Hill get a wide open layup and Marty Simmons a wide open shot. And he has surrounded him right now with his assistant coach. And he's got some good ones. He has surrounded himself with some good people. That's Joe Gallagher, Eddie Jordan, and Paul Ward. And a graduate assistant, Brendan uh, McGee. Of course, uh, O'Brien, a graduate of Boston College in 1971. The rest are foreigners. They're nowhere near Boston College. Jim O'Brien, of course, was an outstanding ABA player. He left, uh, he's a Hall of Famer at Boston College where he played for Cousy and Chuck Daly, another NBA coach. 11th on the all-time scoring list with 1,200 points. And he's a former New England Player of the Year, so he knows what he's doing. And a nice guy, as we, uh, as we found out. But as you can see here on the sidelines, like all the coaches and like Jim Cruz, his counterpart, very much into the game between the years. He certainly is. They both both coaches know their X's and O's and surround themselves with good people. And when you do that, you have a successful program. And both of these programs right now on the upswing, the Aces, with their 21 and 7 slate. And on the other side, Jim O'Brien's 16 and 13 Boston College Eagles, but playing in that Big East, and you're going to get beat up in that conference. He finished 6 and 10. Some people said, how did uh, how did the team do to show you how home court can be a difference? The Eagles lost at the Carrier Dome by 30, 90 to 60, but they beat, beat the, the Big East Orangemen by a score of 68-66 in Boston. Five-point ball game, five minutes and 14 seconds to go. BC with the lead and the basketball. Mike Corcoran. Ball battling around and controlled by Brian Hill. UE trying to win for the 21st straight time here at the stadium. They're 15-0 this year in what has been a truly outstanding year. done so many times down at crunch time Marty Simmons beginning to take over that brings Steve Benton off the bench here's Barrows he's got 25 the Aces do a good job that time of containing Barrows Belfort Dawson this time it's Jamie Benton, and he gets it. Benton with his fifth field goal. That's a big shot. That silenced the crowd, but they're back in it. And we're under four minutes. And a foul on Corey Beasley. Beasley can't believe it.
Beasley falls to the ground and slams his hands on the floor in disgust. Corcoran and Beasley both come out. Benton and Tyrone Scott. There's Beasley having a seat. And here's Godfrey going back to the line. And then with a career high 24th point. Godfrey has been the instigator of this comeback. He has kept the aces in it. We haven't heard from him in a while. For about three or four minutes in the second half, he was the man that brought him back, and he continues to hit his free throws. Big free throws down the stretch. Godfrey with 25, 75, 72, 345 remaining. Aces down by as many as 15. They're back within three. Barrows. Ball knocked away. Knocked away by Tyrone Scott. Now, wait a minute. Now, the other officials coming in. Bill Smith may have a foul. He's got a foul on Evansville. Calling it on Beltra Dawson. I think at both ends of the court, there have been some very bizarre calls. That was a strange one, and Jim O'Brien kind of turns around to his assistants and laughs and he said we'll take that one I don't know where that one came from but we'll take it if you're gonna put someone at the line you don't want it to be this guy 334 on the clock is the Big East scoring leader and here's what he's shooting into Barros now with his 26th point his high was 34 against Seton Hall he had 32 against Pitt Big points right there. That's a big turnaround. Aces break it well. Godfrey brings it back out. 325. Simmons for three. How often has he done it, Mike? All season in crunch time. Not set that time. A little off balance. Flips it up with a flick of the wrist. And Aces back within two. 310 on the clock. The mule doing it again. Jamie Benton flares it out. This is Barrows. And a foul. And they're giving him a three-point basket now. The basket is good. Dean, I think they're bringing the... They're causing a lot of criticism because they're delaying these calls. They, Jim Cruz can't believe what he's seeing out there. Some big calls right now going against the Aces. Give Barrows his 30th point. It's now a five-point spread. Give Bamba the foul. That's number two. And send Steve Benton to the line, and he'll get two shots if he makes the first. Fraction. They call it on Hafner or Godfrey. So Benton will get another chance. 2.52 remains. And there again, you allow an 86% free throw shooter. Last year, he's shooting 71 this year. He's got 16. It's a six point spread. And there is a case, Mike, where another two points. 2.52, timeout on the court. 82.75, Boston College. For 50 years of service and dedication, this year's gold medal award goes to... Cook Chevy Land. It's been a wonderful 50 years, I mean it when I say, buy many new Chevrolet cars, trucks, or custom vans for $50 over our invoice during our 50th anniversary celebration. 
Cook Chevy Land, celebrating 50 wonderful years. There's good news for the Tri-State every day on WFIE's News Watch at 5. We know you want more than just a preview of the 6 o'clock news. So on WFIE-TV's News Watch at 5, we give you a different look at the news, not just a preview of the news at 6. That's right, Mike. Plus, we give you news you can use, like Dr. Red Duke, our daily health cast, and segment 2. It's important to us to be helpful to you. Get a different newscast, a useful newscast, at 5 p.m. Switch to News Watch at 5, only on WFIE-TV Channel 14. Okay, Dean, a few minutes ago, there was a, uh, a lane infraction or whatever. Let's watch and see. Watch this now. They say Godfrey was pushed off. Watch. Yep, right there. Benton. Benton with a little shove on the shoulder. Good play if you can get away with it. And Boston College got away with it and got two free throws. UE has 243 to cut it down. They've got to hurry. Dawson will pull the trigger. Beltra, who had not hit a three-pointer all year, cannot connect, and we're down to two and a half. Now you've got to be careful. You don't want to foul this guy or Steve Benton, both of whom are top free throw shooters, and that's who they're keeping the ball in. And I, he loses control of it. So the ball comes back to the Aces with 2.14 on the clock. This could be a critical possession right here. Jim O'Brien in disgust. His counterpart, Jim Cruz, has been in disgust a good portion of the evening as well. Oh, Marty. It was a tough shot. Simmons was anything but set. He had to really shoot very quickly. And we go under two minutes. 152. Boston College with a 82-75 advantage. Ball batted around, controlled by the Aces. Dawson brings it across. Godfrey posts up and gets it. Dan Godfrey. He's having a career high tonight. His previous high was 23. We've got him with 27. A lot of time left with a five-point lead. Boston College, 115 left. I think you got to fall pretty quick. They wanted a traveling. Jamie Benton down to 15 on the shot clock. They're going to have to unload it. There again, they wanted a traveling. Down to nine seconds. Benton and a foul. The foul is on Godfrey. There are 50 seconds remaining. That is Dan Godfrey's third personal, and the Aces want to talk it over. Here it is again. Benton with a little shove there, and then Godfrey gets pushed from behind by Bamba. Bamba ended up shoving Godfrey right into Benton, and Benton made the contact and drew the foul on Mr. Godfrey. And for Dan, that's three. And we are at 50 seconds, 82 to 77. And when we come back to action, it'll be Jamie Benton, who will be going to the free throw line, where he shoots 84%. Again, don't forget, IHSAA basketball returns to Channel 14 Saturday morning. We'll have both semifinals for Market Square beginning at 9.30. And then the championship game at 7 o'clock on Saturday night. Well, it has been a tremendous year. The Aces hoping it does not come to an end 50 seconds from now. They have pulled out games like this. But right now, it's, they certainly have their backs up against the wall. 50 seconds to go against a Dean, what has lived up to be a pretty good BCT. Well, the positive is for the Aces is that Hafner and Simmons are both still in the game. So the three-point shot, if it is to come into play, the Aces have both guys that can squeeze the trigger into the game. It's amazing that Hafner, Dawson, Simmons, and Hill all have four. That was Godfrey's third. And Jamie Benson made an 84% free throw shooter will toe the line. 
Hill is out of the game right now. Bamba is in. And Jamie Benton will go and shoot free throws. And his 84% proficiency knocks down the first one. His career high in the Big East was 22. He had 27. Tonight, he has 12 points. That is his average. 45 seconds to go. Aces down by seven. After looking for help. Simmons draws the foul by Benton. That is one way to stop the three-point shot as Simmons tried to, to get it off. Benton reached in and committed the foul. I think Jim O'Brien would rather have the clock running in this situation. With 38 seconds, Marty Simmons will go back to the free throw line. Brian Hill comes in for Chris Bamba. And Marty Simmons goes back to the free throw line. These are big free throws. Down the stretch, the Aces are going to have to connect on everything from here on out. Twenty-seven for Simmons. He averages twenty-five. And as, again, he delivers. Thirty-eight seconds, five points. Get out of the way. Barrows. He has murdered a guard. Now, Boston College wants a technical call because of the debris thrown on the court. Jim Cruz wants a timeout. Timeout. 28 seconds to go. Still a five-point ball game. Well, Boston College is wanting a technical, but you really can't call it technical in that situation. 30, 28 seconds to go in the game, and someone throws some toilet paper on the floor. The, the Aces will definitely have a uphill battle with the last 28 seconds. They need to come up with a turnover. They wasted just a little bit too much time that uh, last time trip up the floor trying to get a shot off. Finally, Simmons got fouled with 38 seconds to go. Milt Donald about to check in as you look at the Aces coaching staff. He's number 22. He'll be coming into your picture. There he is. Meanwhile, at the other end, Boston College wanting to make sure they have no slip-ups. Dean, we go back, and Jeff Morning is going to come in, number 41 for Evansville. Go back to the early going, 27-14. Aces come back quickly against a team, a very athletic team like Boston College. Takes a lot of gas out of the tank, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does. In fact, Jim Cruz has even stated that when the Aces are ahead, sometimes they'll try to deliver the knockout punch and keep the regulars in there. In contrast, when they get behind, the uh, Marty Simmons, Scott Hafner, and Dan Gottfried will have to stay in there and play a few more minutes, and that was Jim O'Brien's philosophy tonight, was to keep the Aces frontliners on the floor and try to get them to run up and down the floor and expend some energy and try to get them worn out so when the end of the game came, like right now, they would not have a lot of energy left. Don't forget the latest news, weather, and sports. News Watch at 10. Ohio State has won. VCU, Virginia Commonwealth, and Middle Tennessee beat the Dogs of Georgia. Bulldogs by 10. Dan Katz will have it for you at 10 o'clock. Down to 25. Dana Barrows. And Steve Benton. This is Barrows and a foul on Milt Donald. Down to 20 seconds. And again, you'll send a very fine free throw shooter to the line. Milford Austin checks in. Eight seconds runs off the clock. And now free throws become a key for BC. If they hit them, they should win it. If they fail, that opens the door for the Aces. Boston College celebrating a little bit at the 10 second line. Barrows with 31. the line 15 seconds after for three down to 12 seconds as the aces are the eagles will bring it in dean it has been 
Although this is awfully tough, it has been a great season. It certainly has. And it's been a great run here at Roberts Stadium, but like all good things, unfortunately, it comes to an end uh, prematurely. The Aces 20 game win streak appears to be over with 11 seconds to go. Boston College has an 86 79. Belcher Dawson comes out, gets a, gets a great hug from a very appreciative and proud coach, Jim Cruz. And it will probably not be, but a few more seconds. And number 50 will come out. He doesn't want to come out, but I hope for his sake, I hope they pull him out and I hope they raise the roof. They should. They should for all these guys. Simmons will bring it down. It's been a great, great show by Marty Simmons. He draws the foul by Tyrone Scott. Five seconds on the clock. And Simmons, in typical Simmons fashion, comes down and tries to draw the foul and get the shot up. The guy just will not give up, Mike. It's not in the cards. Larry Brand coming back, coming in for the Aces. Doug Abel in. And a lot of the fans that started for the exits have stopped now and turned around because they realize Simmons is going to come out of the game after the free throws. What a career. To many, he was the MCC Player of the Year, but lost it to a great player, Byron Larkin. He has scored in double figures in every game this year. And when you put down the all-time team of UE, Put this guy on the starting five. Here he comes out. Hardy's upset. And listen to the hand for one of the best to ever wear the purple and white. A bitter ending to Marty Simmons and the Aces season. But hey, it wasn't to be. Four seconds. They're going to let it run out. It's all over. Boston College, a good Boston College team, beats a good Evansville team, 86 to 81. We congratulate the Eagles, but we also congratulate the Aces, who finished 21 and 8. We'll be back in just a moment. Your Ford dealer's spring sellathon, now through March 31st. Save big on Ford's number one sellers, like Ford Ranger and F-Series Plus. Get free factory air conditioning plus $500 cash back. Total savings, almost $1,900 on Ranger. Over $2,600 on F-Series, before you get our best deal. The Spring Sellathon. Open extra hours. On-the-spot financing. High trading allowance. But it all ends March 31st at your Ford dealer. One of my fondest memories as a little boy was sitting in my grandfather's big office chair behind his massive desk. Today, now that I'm ready to furnish my own office, I've found that same traditional beauty, solid construction, and old-fashioned budget pricing I can afford at Smith and Butterfield. Me, I'm the traditional type. Joe, my partner, goes in for the more contemporary. Either way, Smith and Butterfield, with four convenient locations to serve you, makes it affordable for both of us. If Grandpa could only see me now. Well, it is over here at Roberts Stadium, 86-81. Dean, uh, it's just a, you kind of saw it coming early, didn't you? Well, the Aces got behind early. They erased a 13-point lead, got it back down to two, but then it ballooned up to 13 again in the first half. It went to 15 at one point in the second half, and the Aces kept trying to mount those rallies and finally got back, you know, within four or five and a couple at one point, but they could just never get over the hump and could never quite get over and get in front to where they could get in their kind of tempo. It was always in Boston College's tempo tonight. Boston College, they should be tough if they go home. Of course, they'll be tough up there, I would think. I, I tell you, I like them. I, uh, 17 and 13 now. They played in the Big Ten, playing that kind of competition night in and night out, prepares you to play in front of crowds like this. They're playing in front of the Carrier Dome, and the people are going gaga up there. They're accustomed to coming in here and playing against in front of 10,000. Speaking of the crowds, what a crowd. You've been a great crowd all year. It's been a great ride for these Evansville Aces, who unfortunately ended early tonight. But uh, the sun will come out tomorrow, they can hold their heads up with a 21 and 8 record. We salute them. Salute Aces basketball. For Dean Webster and all of us, this is Mike Blake. Thanks for watching, everyone. Again, the final here tonight. It will be the Eagles advancing 86 to 81. For all of us, good night from Robert Stadium.
Tonight's NIT basketball game has been brought to you in part by Ford and your local Ford dealers. By Han Oil. By Evansville Chrysler Plymouth. By M.G. Meats. Smith and Butterfield. By Gillis Schwinn Cyclery. And by your area red and white stores. personal banking business, we're not so sure that the biggest is always best. It's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. Maybe that's why one of the most successful banks in the tri-state is a smaller, friendlier bank, People's Savings Bank. It's run by smart people who are committed to doing things the right way, not just the old way. And you've never seen a better trained bank staff. But then you've never seen a bank like this before, People's Savings Bank. Back at Darlington International Raceway. The race still being led by Mark Martin as he is now in some heavy traffic coming down the main straightaway. That's Fred Bodine now right ahead of him. There's a car in between himself and the second place Jeff Bodine. That car being driven by Derek Cope. Of course, Brett Bodine was involved in that early wreck when Kyle Petty blew an engine, but he has made repairs on the car. He's a few laps down, but he's been out there running good since then, and his brother Jeff about to move around on the outside. Of course, Brett gives him plenty of room to do so. And look who's in third. That purple car, driven by Lake Speed, is in third, and now he's right on the, almost uh, in a, on the back bumper of Bodine, and Rusty Wallace is right there behind Lake Speed. Let's go to Jerry Punch. You mentioned some people might be surprised about how well Mark Martin is running here, but you got to remember, you know, Mark Martin, the four-time ASA champion, as you mentioned, Bob, has run here very well in the past. In fact, one of his best career Winston Cup finishes came here in this race in 1983. He finished third driving a Buick behind Harry Gant and Darrell Walter, but he ran them all day long with the leader. So Mark Martin, no stranger to running well here at Darlington. And, of course, this is only the fifth race for this Jack Roush team. Back in October, they were still working on their new shop, but they put it all together, and they're, uh, they're being rewarded here this afternoon with that fine performance by Mark. You know, that's an impressive run for that team. I, I got a feeling we're going to see more and more from that Mark Martin, Jack Roush, Steve Neal, Robin Pemberton, the whole crowd. I know them pretty well. I know the chassis engineer that helps them with the setups. He has one of the better records in the sport. The whole team has the potential to really dominate later in this season. Historically, in Trans Am competition, Jack Roush doesn't do anything unless he does it absolutely first class. Well, definitely, and they're going first class here in NASCAR racing. They got a, a lot of things going for them. Mark Martin's a good, uh, experienced driver. A lot of people don't know how many laps and miles Mark Martin has run in Winston Cup competition, but he's been racing for years and years. Lake Speed now really putting the pressure on Jeff Bodine for second place. This is one of the longer runs we've had in a green flag competition. Are the Hoosier tires now beginning to come into play? The high feet. Lake Speed, of course, running the Hoosier tires, and he's putting the pressure on Jeff Bodine, who is on Goodyear. That's a very good point. Uh, Lake has really uh, closed in on Jeff Bodine in the last several laps, and now is right there bidding for second position. Yeah, Jeff seems to have slipped just a little bit, although he was, maybe it's not so much that Jeff has slipped. I think uh, Lake Speed has caught them because Jeff and Mark Martin are running about the same as they've been for quite a while. And we mentioned earlier that it looked like they were closing in on Earnhardt, but uh, since then, that has changed. Earnhardt has moved out to a comfortable position, perhaps three or four seconds ahead of the leader, but uh, still remains one lap plus uh, about four-fifths of a lap down. Lake Speed in the number 83 car, the only one of the three on Hoosier tires, Mark Martin and Jeff Bodine on the Goodyears. Now Bodine, rather, uh, Lake Speed looks to the inside of Bodine coming down the straightaway, but they fall in a single file formation once again. There's Lake Speed in third. Let's see what happens here. Lake Speed dives to the inside, coming out of corner number two. They race down the back stretch. There is a slower car that may play a part here. And that slower car is that of Rick Wilson, but he moves down nicely. Nevertheless, Lake Speed cannot make it pass for second. And Rusty Wallace, you can see him almost coming into the picture. There he is. He's beginning to move up a little bit now on the front runners. So the first four cars are that close on the racetrack. There is fourth, Rusty Wallace. That 
is quite a race, you know, at Darlington. It, it just, this place always produces kind of races like this, competition from start to finish. Lake Speed wants to try it again. As they have been to turn three. I yes. believe he has it this time. Nice move by Speed, but look at the car wash out. Nevertheless, Jeff Bodine, his car also moves high on the racetrack, and Lake Speed has moved to second position. As we told you at the opening of the show, this is the oldest super speedway built back in 1950. And they've been racing on this track ever since, and uh, I guess when you're thinking of a super speedway in this day and age, uh, you wouldn't think of building one like this, but it sure does make an interesting race. It certainly does, and I don't think they'll ever change it. You know, a couple of years ago, they did pay to put in some new walls and made a lot of improvements here after the International Speedway Corporation bought this track, and a lot of people were concerned that maybe they were going to change that racetrack. They said never. They'll just leave it like it is because too much tradition, too much action here. No need to change a successful uh, operation, and this indeed is one here at Darlington International Raceway. Third place, Jeff Bodine. Fourth place, Rusty Wallace. We'll be back with more of our live coverage from the Trans-South 500 here at Darlington. Ken's custom van outlet is fantastic. Whether it's hauling the kids to a ball game or a quick run to the grocery, an Astro custom van is the way to make a busy life much easier. Now is the time to plan that long-awaited vacation, and the only way to travel is in a beautiful custom van from the good people. Kenny Kent's the Tri-State's only discount custom van outlet with the largest selection and unbeatable prices. Kenny Kent's custom van outlet, 220 Diamond Avenue, is fantastic. <laughs> At Hardee's, we don't use just any old fish for our fish sandwich. No, 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 no. To win you over, we go to the icy depths of the North Atlantic for whole fillets of moist, flaky fish in our own special coating with real breadcrumbs on a multigrain bun. Next time you're in the neighborhood... <laughs> Why not drop in? Fisherman's Fillet Sandwich from Hardee's. It's the least we can do to win you over. Former lightweight champion Livingstone Brambo battles back as he takes on hard-hitting Edwin Turek. Budweiser presents Top Rank Boxing, Wednesday night at 9 Eastern, live on ESPN. Back at Darlington International Raceway in South Carolina, in a couple of more weeks, our next Winston Cup telecast will come from Bristol International Raceway, the Valley Dale 500. And of course, that racetrack also a very challenging one for these drivers as it is only a half mile in length and some very steep banking on the turn saturday april 9th at 3 30 eastern time the budweiser grand national 200 and then the valleydale 500 winston cup race sunday april the 10th at one o'clock eastern time Lake Speed has moved right up on the back bumper of Mark Martin. He is really putting the pressure on, and just behind them, Rusty Wallace is trying to move around Jeff Bodine. So two good battles going on for first and third. That's an example of how the track changes. The two cars that looked like they were the quickest now are falling back a little bit, and cars that look like they may have been top five but not much better are moving up. So the track changes. Maybe it comes to you. Maybe it goes away from you. It's, it's something that the crews are always gambling with. And Lake Speed is trying to find the opportunity to pass Mark Martin for the lead. He may have it here. They're side by side in turn number two. That's Lake Speed on the bottom and Mark Martin up top. Ooh, did they touch coming out of the second corner? Got off the close. Down the back stretch into turn number three. Lake Speed is going to have the lead. Boy, that's bad news for Dale Earnhardt. He's not far from getting down two laps again if Lake Speed can gain on Earnhardt like he's done the other two drivers. Look at these top four closing in on each other. It's really becoming a great race now as Speed, Martin, Bodine, and Wallace are right there together on the racetrack. Dick Bergman. A lot of mechanical conversation going on in Mark Martin's pit area right now, guys. The problem, the car is simply too tight. Now, Darlington has a reputation for being a racetrack that tightens up a car, makes it push, understeer as the event goes on. That is the problem Mark Martin suffers from now. It is not, however, a terminal problem. It can be adjusted either with tire stagger in the next pit stop or with a spring change on the next pit stop. They're certainly going to do something to try to square away Mark Martin's car. He'll go faster after the next pit stop if they make the right guess. Well, this has been one of the longest periods that we have run under green, and I think maybe we're seeing uh, the 
result of that on the racetrack. I think that is true. The, the, as the tires heat up, it changes the handling characteristics of the automobile. As Gary pointed out a little bit earlier, the racetrack itself changes, and it changes more, Gary, during a long green flag run than it does uh, as we see them run a while under caution and then... Well, well you're right, Ned. You know, one of the key things besides the tires going away and the the track changing, the fuel load changes. There's a lot of weight in the back of the car, in the trunk area, when you put 22 gallons of fuel in there. And as that fuel starts going away, it affects the handling. It usually takes a car that is loose and helps him make, be, make him a little tighter. I could see Rusty Wallace was on, more on the loose side earlier than he is now, so that fuel going away, the weight of that fuel has helped Rusty Wallace. And Dr. Jerry Punch has a report from the pits. We are standing in the Lake Speed Pit with crew chief Daryl Bryan. And Daryl, you talk about chasing the racetrack with a chassis setup. You told me the track is coming to you guys. What's that mean? Well, we were kind of set up for a slick racetrack all week. And now the track's beginning to come to us. So I think we'll be in pretty good shape the rest of the day. Well, the track had been awfully tight early on. The car was tight for Lake Speed. Now the track is getting a little bit slippery. They're moving their way to the front. This is the same car that Speed finished second in Rockingham a few weeks ago here on ESPN. Gentlemen? Well, Lake right. Speed has had some awfully good runs at this racetrack in the past. A few years ago, when he was driving for Haas Ellington, he was running in second place. He developed an oil leak, but he was bearing down on the leader at that time. Surprised a lot of people. Lake did not have that much experience on the racetrack or on the Western Cup circuit, I should have said, at that time, but it was very impressive. And every time he's been here with a good car under him, he has run this track very well. And he also has had some good performances uh, earlier this year, a sixth at Richmond, a second at Rockingham. We talked to him earlier about, do you set the car up for one corner over another? I look at the track as an overall, and just it's just a compromise. I have to try to get good at both ends. And I, I try not to give up in either one. I want to be real good at both ends of the racetrack. And when I get the car with that feel that I'm hunting for, each time I'll be tough at both ends of the racetrack. I don't have to give up either one. Boy, that's, a, that's quite a tall order to get the car right at both ends. And here we have a battle for second as Mark Martin and now Rusty Wallace are right behind, uh, Wallace right behind Mark Martin. Bobby Hillen Jr. comes in for a pit stop. You can see he has been one of the ones involved in the two earlier crashes that we had, some uh, body damage on that machine. In fact, he was involved in the very first accident that took Richard Petty out of the race. Bobby just made a pit stop about 10 laps ago, so he was running one lap down at that particular time, but now he's going to be at least three laps down after making two green flag pit stops. And Neil Bonnet, another one of those involved in the early uh, crashes. There he is on the inside of the race back track being passed by the leaders. Now, Neil, tough break for Neil. He's had such a strong start this season to be involved in that early race. Let's run down uh, the 12 cars that are on the lead nap lap now as we watch Rusty Wallace. It's Lake Speed, Mark Martin, Rusty Wallace, Jeff Bodine, Bill Elliott is in fifth, Davey Allison sixth, Sterling Marlin is seventh, in eighth position is Alan Kowicki, ninth is Bobby Allison, tenth is Phil Parsons, eleventh is Ricky Rudd, and in twelfth position is Buddy Baker in the number 88 car. Earnhardt hanging on for his life at the moment. Uh, there's uh, Mark Martin and Rusty Wallace racing. But uh, slowly but surely, Lake Speed is gaining on Earnhardt. So Lake Speed is looking good and also looking for his very first Winston Cup win, his best career finish, uh, second on two different occasions. Hold it. Ho, ho, ho. So you're going to finally meet Cindy huh? tonight. Good, so first impressions are very important. I think. Okay, now imagine, lights are low, the music's soft, knock the door, the door opens up, somebody's out there doing this. What is this? She's got dandruff? No, you have dandruff. No, yes, you I do. shampoo every day. You shampoo your brains out with regular shampoo, shampoo wouldn't matter. Your brains out? Yeah, well, so use that. Head and shoulders? Works for me, my friend. But you don't have dandruff. Exactamundo! <laughs> Head and shoulders, because you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Wouldn't it be great if you could finance a new Kawasaki and put zero down? And what if you could have up to 60 months to pay? 
And even better, get a yes or no answer in as little as five minutes. The new Good Times Credit Plan, from your Kawasaki dealer. Not quite halfway in the Trans-South 500, lead held by Lake Speed there in the car number 83. And second position is Mark Martin, and third is Rusty Wallace. Now, our race strategy advisor, that's a little computer that we have employed to help us through our Winston Cup races this year. It indicates, as far as next pit stops are concerned, that we should be seeing the cars come in for their next round of pit stops in about eight or so more laps. You know, uh, figuring out the fuel mileage in these races is, is loose at best because it changes, you know, uh, how long the driver's on the gas, the, the traffic, the, how quick it's lap to run. It's really complicated to try and pinpoint that fuel mileage. What we've done and a lot of teams have done recently is gone to computers to try to try and calculate what the mileage is. Here's a guy, he, he hasn't got the computer yet. He's still doing it uh, <laughs> the hard still way. Doing it the old way. But, but you can try and calculate based on the last time how quick the car went around and what his mileage was. It takes a few stops to really to get that down, and then the track changes again, and it's, it's still an estimate at best. They should have pit stops coming up before too long, maybe another six or eight laps, and it'd be green flag pit stops. And so far, the leaders have not had to stop during uh, the green flag runs here today. They've been able to catch cautions to do that. But you know, an interesting thing, the back straightaway pits are good for yellow flag pit stops if you're the leader. You can get in and get out. It's marginal on getting lapped like Dale Jarrett and Rodney Combs earlier got lapped. But if you are the leader and you're pitted on the back stretch, you can you can pit in, get in and get out good on a, on a yellow flag. But if you're the, uh, if, if it's under green, the entrance is so tight going in the back straightaway that you lose time. So Mark Martin put it on the back stretch and Lake Speed and uh, the rest of them on the front stretch is gonna be interesting. Here at Lake Speed is moving up on Dale Earnhardt. He was up beside of him just a moment ago before they ran in on rookie driver Ken Bouchard. Earnhardt took advantage of the traffic situation and moved out ahead of Lake Speed, but Speed has caught him, wants to put him two laps down again. Yeah, he's already one lap down, and if the Lake should get by Dale right here, Dale would go two laps down to the leader. And of course, that was a result of two unscheduled pit stops, four tires, first a right side tire change, then a left side tire change for the fans that might have just joined us late. For you Dale Earnhardt fans, things have not gone well for him because of the incidents that uh, Ned just mentioned and the pole sitter Ken Schrader was involved in an early accident that has eliminated him from a possible win. Now here is Lake Speed trying to put Dale two laps down. He looks to the inside but decides better of it. And now we'll see what happens as Dale's car slides high on the racetrack and almost uh, puts a Darlington stripe on the car. Speed hitting the accelerator hard coming out of turn number two down the back stretch and Lake Speed has put another lap on Dale Earnhardt. This car is very really strong. He's getting such good traction off the turn, particularly off the turn two where he just uh, passed Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt's pitting. Earnhardt is making another pit stop. There he is entering on pit road. That's a, that's a smart move to pit as soon as you lose that lap. Here's Dick Bergren. Let that take into pit road. When he came in here, the front wheels were absolutely locked up. This is almost certainly going to be a two-tire change rather than a four-tire change. They've captured the tires. Right side tires done. Crew chief Kurt Schumann does the right side. Earnhardt is away. Boy, I hope his day improves. He's got to if he's going to win this thing. Now, let's see where he comes out in relationship to the leader. The leader goes by on these three laps down. If the leader's behind him, we'll see where, where he ends up. Green flag pit stops coming up. You see Alan Kowinki in the pits now. Greg Sachs just went by coasting a moment ago, I believe. Greg ran out of gas. At least he's pitting on the back stretch and coasting around to that area. And uh, Alan Kowinki gets his service now. As we see, shift the gears as he heads out of the pits. You'll be watching the traffic coming down the front straightaway as it goes back on through the racetrack, trying to get his speed back up as quickly as possible. Dale Earnhardt did get out ahead of leg speed, so he's not three laps down. Yeah, heck of a pit stop. It's so close here at Darlington. If you have one little slip in the pits, you're going to end up losing that uh, another lap, so Earnhardt is still two down. Rusty Wallace is coming in for a pit stop. Here comes Rusty. He's running up at the top five, and Dick Bergman is right there to call this pit stop. They're ready for Rusty Wallace. A little tiny dig on the right front of this car, and that's it. Rusty jazzing the engine. He doesn't want to stall it. He says, no thanks to a drink of water. Engine does not sound particularly good as he sits here at the pit. Sounds a little ragged. 
right side tire change. Certainly not the fastest tire change we've seen today. And there he goes. Kodiak Pontiac getting back up to speed as Rusty Wallace rejoins the fray. It'll be interesting now. Earnhardt's got the fresh tires. Leg speed's out there with worn tires. Earnhardt's pulling away a little bit. Now Mark Martin is heading into the pits on the back stretch, the car number six. And this would be a scheduled pit stop for Mark Martin you as can, he goes into the pits on the back. You can see how slow, well, he has to enter the pits real slow because of the narrow entrance to pit road. He's going to lose some time. Here comes the leader. Lake Speed as we mar watch Mark Martin enter his pits on the backstretch. Second place, Mark Martin. Here comes the leader, Lake Speed, in for service. Okay, now Lake Speed, the leader, pits. We'll see where he comes out in relationship to Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt was out there for several laps on fresh tires. Plus, he had a good pit stop. If, if Lake Speed's pit stop is a little off, Earnhardt's going to be back to the two-lap down position. Let's see how the work on speeds pit stop goes. Looks like it could be a very quick pit stop. The gas is the last to go in. Tires are changed on the right side. Now the tank is full, and there goes Lake Speed back in the race. Jeff Bodine remains on pit road. There goes Bodine. Bobby Allison pitting also as Bodine goes out of the pit. These are green flag scheduled pit stops. Bill Elliott comes into the pits up uh, a little further up pit road as Jeff Bodine gets back in the action. Bodine moving on to the racetrack right ahead of Jimmy Horton. Here's the Bill Elliott crew going to work on that car and removing and changing the tires on the right side. Second and can of gas being put in. You can see the gas man waiting for the, to be, uh, the jack man, waiting for the car to be full of gas before he lets the jack down. That's the signal to go. There's Davey Allison in for a routine stop. Same thing, the jack man's watching the gas man, watching, watching, go. This uh, momentarily should have put Sterling Marlin into the lead, but he's coming down pit road right now in the Piedmont Airlines car along with Brett Bodine and Neil Bonnie. There is Brett pulling into his pit area right e ahead of Ken Schrader, who moves back out onto the racetrack. But of course, that Ken Schrader car does not look very much like a race car, in fact, but Ken out there trying to get some valuable Winston Cup points. 190 more laps are completed. The Napa mid-race recap. Lake Speed at the halfway point was the leader. He had led 14 of the 184 circuits. The average speed of the race, 125.520. And Lake had pitted on laps 33, 63, and 123. We had five caution periods for a total of 29 laps in the first half of the race. Seven leaders and eight lead changes. 41 cars started, 33 remain, and 12 were running on the lead lap. Out of the race, Kyle Petty, who blew an engine early. Dave, or rather Richard Petty, who crashed right behind his son. Dave Marcus and Harry Gann also out. Also dropping out of competition, Morgan Shepard, Brad Knopfsinger, Benny Parsons, Rodney Combs, and Daryl Waltrip. So the race continues under green, and being shown as a leader right now is Sterling Marlin, but remember, at the moment, he has not made a scheduled pit stop. If you like to drive, really like to drive, this is what your next car should be. This is the all-new Pontiac Grand Prix. This is the 1988 Motor Trend Car of the Year. And that ought to be you driving it. Get on your party, yeah. We build excitement. Party. Just how good are genuine GM parts? Good enough for Dale Earnhardt, three-time Winston Cup driving champion. And the same kind of quality that goes into the GM parts for his car goes into the GM parts for your car. So get the goods under your hood. Genuine GM Parts. From your General Motors dealer. It's time to get serious. Battle lines are drawn for the NHL's Cold War. ESPN presents the Stanley Cup Playoffs. All live all the way to the championship finals as teams take their shots at the defending champion Edmonton Oilers. The showdown heats up. The Stanley Cup playoffs beginning April 6th here on ESPN. 
ESPN Speed World at Darlington International Raceway for the Trans South 500. And since we left you, Sterling Marlin had the lead. He put it. But uh, Buddy Baker was in the lead momentarily. He has pitted. Phil Parsons was in the lead momentarily. He has pitted. And that's so that gives the lead back to Lake Speed in car number 83. And Rusty Wallace is running in second position. But we've talked all uh, year long, really, about the tire war that has been now raging in Winston Cup since the season began. Of course, this tire war really started in Bush Grand National Racing. But now it is a real war between Hoosier and Goodyear here in Winston Cup Racing. Here's Larry. Hoosier Tire, the newest name on the big league circuit. Amazingly, they won the second Winston Cup race they ever entered. It's a David versus Goliath story, but David has some advantages, too. Akron, the worldwide headquarters for Goodyear. Around the globe, more than 100 total plants, all reproduced in their impressive model room, and over 125,000 employees, $11 billion in sales. Rural Lakeville, Indiana. Town population, eh, maybe more than 1,000. Hoosier is the Newton family, which lives on the grounds. So private they choose to not discuss tires produced, company worth, or even number of employees. I guess less than 500. This is the Hoosier Complex at Darlington. The folks in Akron have noticed they're growing a lot more than basketball talent in Hoosier land. And while Goodyear is a worldwide operation, the entire world of Hoosier, when not at the racetrack, is a couple of plants, one administration building, and a small annex. I think that uh, the short track part of it, we kind of thought we could win pretty quick with that. We had done well last year with Bush Grand National, and uh, we felt we were capable of doing it. Just a matter of getting some good cars. Being an employee for the past several years and an ex-official member of the family, uh, maybe you're the best one to ask, how has Hoosier been so successful? What's the secret? Uh, I don't think that uh, you'll find anybody that works any harder at it than the Newtons. They put a lot of hard, long hours into it way back before any word even got out that, that Hoosier Tire was going Winston Cup racing. Bob Newton is the, is the one guy that I, I admire. He, he lives with a stopwatch. Constantly. I mean, he has always got a stopwatch, and that stopwatch tells you a lot. And he could see that the other, other uh, brands of tires, they have a tendency, they go fast in the beginning, and then they start to slow down towards the end. And then he's thinking, well, if I can build that tire, so the longer I run it, the better it's going to be. I'm going to be there in the end, and that's when I want to be there. When the checker sheet drops, I want to be there in the end. So I think that's part of the reason of, of why our success is in uh, Winston Cup Racing. Both stressed that safety is their first priority. But when Goodyear introduced new technology at Indy last year, radials, a compatibility problem with the new March chassis resulted in several crashes. Now, they're not radials, but some drivers experience control problems with cold Hoosiers at the start of the recent Richmond race. But others said that once they got going, the Hoosiers, at least at Richmond, lasted longer and were better tires. The Goodyear Hoosier tire battle has really heated up and provided some very good competition both on and off the track. Now, Hoosier tires have won two Bush Grand National races already this year, and they've won two of four or half of the Winston Cup races so far this season. And here at Darlington this weekend, well, they look pretty strong also. Well, indeed, the Hoosiers do look strong, and here is a perfect example of the tire war going on because we have Hoosier against Goodyear here as Lake Speed is on the Hoosiers and Rusty Wallace on the Goodyears, and Rusty is really making a race out of it. Boy, he sure is. He caught Lake Speed from quite a ways back. You remember, Rusty was back there racing with Bill Elliott for fifth place, about 10 seconds behind the leader, so he's been steadily moving up. At the same time, Earnhardt is still only one lap down, about three seconds ahead of this group. Now, one thing, Gary, they only changed the right side tires during that green flag pit stop. It might be that the, the Goodyear worked better with the two tires on as opposed to a complete four tire change. And we'll also make note of the fact that Sterling Marlin has just made an unscheduled pit stop for left side tire change. And he was running in sixth position. Let's go to Jerry Punch. Well, as we said, the standard bearer for Hoosier is Lake Speed. And we are here in the Hoosier tire mounting compound area. This is an area sort of wedged back behind the fence, somewhat the Bob Euchre maybe portion of the racetrack uh, in between a couple of semis. These guys can't even see the racetrack, so they have no idea what's going on. But intermittently, Bob Newton, the president of Hoosier, will run back here and tell them, hey, we're leading. Lake Speed's out front. These guys will all begin to smile and mount tires that much quicker. So we're back here in the Hoosier compound. Larry Newman. 
and introducing on your left the latest model from Lakeville, Indiana. This is the Hoosier Tire for Darlington Raceway. And on your right, the latest of the worldwide fruits of the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Now, the interesting thing is, look how similar these two tires appear in profile. We did the same demonstration at uh, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina a couple weeks ago, and there was a marked difference in the height and the profile of the two tires, but very similar here in Darlington. Now, here is the leaderboard. This is before the last series of pit stops. You can see Hoosier had only Lake Speed and Sterling Marlin in the top 10. The other eight drivers in the top 10, all racing on the Eagles. And some statistical information regarding Goodyear. As you can see, this battle for the lead is opened up a little bit now. The first Goodyear win in Winston Cup racing was by Jack Smith, March 3rd of 1957. We have a blown engine or some problem with Ricky Rudd in turn number two. Going to the backstretch. Ricky Rudd in the Quaker State Buick has some smoke coming from the rear end of that car, and he's dropped low on the racetrack. Bob, he had been smoking for several laps out the exhaust pipes. I saw some about 50 laps ago, and then it continued to get worse, and it looks like it's going to take Ricky Rudd out of the race now. Right after a pit stop is the most likely time for engine problems to develop. The engine's been running at a steady RPM or, or somewhat steady RPM on the racetrack. Then the driver gears down to get into the pits, and that's where most likely the damage occurs. What do you do to prevent that from happening? Just treat the engine a little gently there? Well, it's hard on the green flag pit stops for the driver, especially, to, to not abuse the engine with the downshift. Try and rely more on the brakes to get into the pits. But if Ricky Rudd has an early pit area, one of the first ones on pit road, I'm sure he had to really gear down and heavy to get in and get stopped. So the crew works on the Ricky Rudd machine. It doesn't look good for the Quaker State Buick operation headed by Kenny Bernstein. 210 laps completed. We'll be back in just a moment. This is the all-new Pontiac Grand Prix. Motor Trend called its advanced design squarely in step with the 90s. They said its spectacular interior produced a driving environment second to none. They said where the new Grand Prix really stands out is its handling. They liked it so much, they named it the 1988 Motor Trend Car of the Year. The hot new Pontiac Grand Prix. Why does the Monte Carlo of NASCAR champion Dale Earnhardt race on Goodyear Eagles exclusively? Because of the Goodyear Eagle contact patch and how it responds to the track. And why does Chevrolet choose Goodyear Eagle street radials for every new Monte Carlo SS? A major reason is the Goodyear Eagle contact patch, where the car ultimately responds to the road. Goodyear Eagles, because there really is a difference. some it's routine maintenance to others it's an act of love if you truly appreciate fine machinery you protect it with pure later filters honey game's gonna start soon i think i'll give the lawn a quick cut <laughs> good luck when you're long on grass and short on time you need a mower with a briggs and stratton engine dad the pre-game show's on It'll start quickly and work hard till the job's done. Sure hope he makes it. Yes, there he is. Briggs and Stratton, the power in power equipment. We hope you're enjoying today's live coverage of the Trans South 500 from Darlington International Raceway in South Carolina, being brought to you by Pontiac Grand Prix, the 1988 Motor Trend Car of the Year by Goodyear Eagle Tires. Goodyear, because there really is a difference. By Purolator, the first name in filters for Pure Oil now and Pure Oil later, it's Purolator. And by Briggs & Stratton, proud sponsor of the 1988 U.S. Olympic team. Ricky Rudd continues to sit in the area behind the wall. Troubles on that car, here's Dick Bergman. Well, Ricky, you've had a tough weekend. One blown engine, power steering problems. What's the problem now? 
I think we must have burned a piston, probably uh, trying to get too much horsepower out of the engine, ran it too lean, and probably burned a piston. Uh, it was either that or broke a valve. We're not really sure just yet. It's a disappointed team. They had hoped for much better here this weekend at Darlington. So Jeff Bodine is coming in right now. Bodine having a problem. Jerry Punch, you anywhere near it? All right, let's call this Jeff Bodine pit stop. It certainly isn't a scheduled stop, Gary. No, it definitely not scheduled. They're changing right side tires. Uh, Waddell's looking at the left side tires. It appears the right rear, yeah, the right rear tire was low on air. Yeah, apparently a puncture. That, it should get them back in contention, but we'll see how much time he loses to the leader on the race track. Well, the leader just went by, Gary, as he was going out of the pits late speed, who is just right on the back bumper of Dale Earnhardt, trying to put him two laps down once again. So Jeff Bodine has gone a lap down. Well, here's the uh, Quaker State crew that we're trying to look at the car to see if it's repairable to get back in the race. They got the air cleaner off. You know, that's a tough job. I feel sorry for the crew chief and the mechanic because it's so hot. Everything, you can't really tell what's wrong. You just have to take things apart to look at it and, and hopefully get back in the race. But, you know, you really want to go home at this point. All right, now we're ready for a report from Jerry Punch. Back a few years ago when there were gas lines at the service station. We'll take a look here. There are gas lines every Sunday here at a NASCAR race. These wagons line up one by one. There's a race after a routine pit stop to come to the Unical pumps. They are allowed to fill up two cans. And the crew member here watching these gallon by gallon going in, each can will hold exactly 11 gallons of gasoline. Now, some of the guys can make some adjustments in the cans. It may hold a little bit more, but if NASCAR catches you, it can be awfully serious. 11 gallons of gas here in the gas line on pit road. Well, Gary, you want to comment on a uh, car holding 22 gallons, or uh, <laughs> are there instances in which a car holds 22.67 or 8? Well, you know, NASCAR has its rules, and it's the crew chiefs and the team's uh, job to try and make the most of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if they say if one, you know, one man's 22 gallons might may not be the same as someone else. We saw on the screen there as uh, Rusty Wallace moved around Dale Earnhardt. Late speed had already passed him. Now Earnhardt is two laps down, but Earnhardt moved to the inside of the racetrack, let Rusty Wallace go, did not hold him up, didn't race with him for a moment. Very courteous move by Earnhardt. Now he fought hard trying to keep late speed from getting around him, but once the leader goes around him, no, there's no point in him holding off the second place car. Right here, Re Earnhardt just went back down to where he was before that round of pit stops. He had gained a good 30 laps of hopefully another caution come out and give him a break, be only one lap down. Well, here's a look at some lap leaders that we've had. Schrader, Jeff Bodine, Davey Allison, Darrell Waltrip, and Mark Martin have all led this race. So has Buddy Baker, Lake Speed, who is the current leader, Bill Elliott, Bill Parsons, and Sterling Marlin. And Jerry Punch is standing by in the pits. Well, Jeff Bodine's unscheduled pit stop was indeed a situation where they had to come down pit road, had no choice. Take a look why. This is the right rear tire on Bodine's car. You see where it's been written, cut on the tire. There is a slice in the rubber all the way down the tire. This tire was going down. You see it's already beginning to deflate somewhat. Another lap or two and Bodine would have been in the wall. He had to pit. Certainly he had to pit. He lost some valuable time. That's an unusual cut on a tire. Normally, you see just more or less a pinhole in a tire, Gary, but that was a, a slit of a sort. Well, that looks like a debris-type cut. Uh, not long after a green flag pit stop, he most likely picked it up leaving the pits. He changed right side tires to left the pit area. One of the things we can watch later in the race is the line the drivers take from the time they leave pit road till they get on the racetrack. Under green flag conditions, there's a lot of debris that gathers kind of right at the edge of the apron, but not to the grass area. So if the driver cuts across that area, he takes a big chance on cutting the tire. That's why a lot of times we see cars, when they come out of the pits, will go immediately or as quickly as they can into the racing group. Earlier today, we saw Earnhardt give us two examples. One, he would stay on against the grass all the way to the back straightaway. Second time, he pulled right up into the groove, right across all the debris. He was taking more of a chance then, but he had more, you know, he didn't have as much to lose. By the way, Jeff Bodine's unscheduled pit stop dropped him from third, a lap down, to eighth position. Also running a lap down is Buddy Baker, car number 88, Bill Parsons at number 55, and Sterling Marlin with his unscheduled pit stop for left side tires also went a lap down. Sterling now running in the 11th position. We were talking about the uh, tire situation, and then uh, Ricky Rudd had the problem. I was reciting some uh, Goodyear statistics. Their first win in Winston Cup racing was back in 1957 at Concord, North Carolina. Jack Smith, the winner. 
the first super speedway win was here at Darlington, September 7th of 1959, when Jim Reed won the race. Goodyear had won 526 consecutive Winston Cup races before Neil Bott had won at Richmond, February of this year, on the Hoosiers. And the last brand of tire to win before Hoosiers, other than Goodyear, Firestone, January 10th, 1971, at Riverside, California. Lake Speed in the Wins Kmart Oldsmobile leads Rusty Wallace is second, followed by the number three position, number nine, Bill Elliott. Then Mark Martin is in fourth, and Alan Kowicki runs in fifth position with 225 out of 367 laps completed. We'll be back in just a moment, live from Darlington, South Carolina. Hi, I'm Bob Barthel. For over 20 years, the Barthel Agency has been showing people how to reduce the cost of their life insurance programs. We've shown some how to keep their coverage while eliminating their premiums. Others have tripled the coverage without any premium increase. If that sounds good to you, call for our free brochure with actual case histories about savings that our clients have achieved. Give us a call. It won't cost you anything and it could save you money positive and safe experience for your children, the YMCA brings you two special programs, YMCA Camp Carson and Evansville YMCA Day Camp. Each provides an enjoyable, fun-filled experience in a safe and healthy environment. Sports, swimming, field trips, activities designed to develop your child physically, mentally, and spiritually. Call the YMCA and find out about these summer programs today. Evansville YMCA Day Camp and YMCA Camp Carson, the experience that lasts a lifetime. from Darlington International Raceway in the Trans South 500 on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. And there's your leader, Lake Speed. In second is Rusty Wallace, and third is Bill Elliott. At the very beginning of the program, we talked about the drivers who were seeking a first win desperately, and Lake Speed is one of those who has never won a Winston Cup race, yet he has looked so good on so many racetracks, including here in Darlington, but things have just been uh, never been able to uh, go exactly right for a win. It certainly looks like today that he's in the best position he's been in a long, long time. Although he did lead the race at Richmond earlier this year, he also led at Rockingham, looked very strong, but uh, of course did not come out the victor. But things are certainly working in his direction right now. And Rusty Wallace, who's running in second position, is another one of those who would very much like to have a win this year. And he would like to have a win on a super speedway because he has won four Winston Cup races, two on road courses, two on the short tracks. He would love to register a super speedway victory. Well, Rusty, is, he's one of my favorite drivers. He drives a lot like Dale Earnhardt, flat out. He wants to win. You can you see him on the short tracks and the road courses where he grew up. He feels a lot more at home on the short track. But he is putting on a heck of a driving show today. He's moved his car up steadily all day long. And in third position is Bill Elliott. There is Davey Allison as he is uh, battling with Mark Martin out there on the racetrack. Martin was running in the fifth position, so evidently Allison had just moved around him for that position. And we'll take a look at the replay, and you can see uh, how strong Davey was in the past. He came up, moved right around him on the outside very easily. It looked like Mark just pulled down and let him go. And earlier, this is how Alan Kowicki disposed of Mark. Well, he comes up and then looks to the inside and finally decides that's the place to make his move. Mark Martin's car is definitely not running like it was earlier when we saw him leading the race. And he's gone from the leader to the next car to be lapped. If the leader can catch him, it's about a half a lap back. Mark Martin's the next car to go lap down. That is right. He is in sixth position, and there are six cars on the lead lap. Darrell Waltrip, as we watch the action on the speedway, comes in for another stop, and uh, they apparently have gotten that car all repaired, and Darrell is ready to reach join the race. Yeah, he just came out of the garage area and he came back down pit road to get the fuel. That's where the gas was. They did, I'm sure they changed the tires and everything else while he was in the garage area. But he needed a little fuel to go, so he's back out the road. Many laps down. Now Jeff Bodine is trying to get his lap back. He lost one with a uh, unscheduled pit stop. He has passed Rusty Wallace. Wallace in second, but Jeff would still have to pass the leader on Lake Street before being able to get that lap back. This 
Larry Dotson. Rusty Wallace's crew chief is standing by in the pit area. Well, Larry, you guys have been running way up in the lead pack all day, but you can't seem to quite close. What do you have to do to get this lead and hang on to it? Well, the first thing you got to do at this place is stay out of trouble. We're trying to do that. Rusty's doing a great job. Jimmy's got the car set up well, and Harold's got the motor running good. We'll probably make some changes. The cars are going to do some three and four. If you're too tight, then you're too tight in one and two, sir. We got a couple changes in store. You know, we need to be a little better. Okay, that's the story on Rusty Wallace Park. Pit Central, Larry Newbert, take it away. Earlier in the show, we were talking about that list of people who has never won a race, a Winston Cup race, and among those who have never won a race, obviously, Lake Speed is the man who's doing the best. Now, standing by with me is J.D. McDuffie, and I know that a lot of you like to follow Winston Cup racing. Want an update on J.D.'s condition? Seriously burned this February down in Daytona. J.D., how about the condition? How do you feel? I've always been pretty good now. My hand is still mighty tender. I, I don't know it'll be a month or so for be back, probably. I'd like to thank all the fans that sent me mail and everything. I really appreciate it. Say hello to my wife back home. J.D., all those years of struggling as an independent driver, sometimes it's hard to kind of pull all the money to get together on top of the dining room table and come up with enough cash to go to the next race. Ever any thoughts about stopping this, maybe becoming a car owner like Richard Childress has done? Well, not quite yet. I, I still enjoy driving. I'm going to do a couple more years there. And, uh, a, lot of, a lot of good people. Bodine is crashing. I think I'll, I'll have some better help when I do come back. J.D., we've got a crash out on the racetrack. Jeff Bodine is involved. You can see a multi-car accident. There are three or four cars involved. Oh, yeah. Uh, Buddy Arrington hit the wall pretty hard. Jeff Bodine started it. He uh, scraped the fourth turn wall and began to spin, and then cars behind him were also involved. Is that Dale Earnhardt? Yeah, Dale Earnhardt involved. Bill Elliott squeezed through. I don't know how he made it. Earnhardt is getting his car. And he's coming back out in front of some other cars that are racing down towards the start finish line, including Lake Speed, but they miss him as he comes down the front straightaway. <laughs> Boy, what a, what a deal that was. Earnhardt, nowhere to go. Jeff Bodine up against the wall. Everybody had to let off the gas and somebody hit Earnhardt from behind, it appeared to me. Buddy hit the wall pretty hard, I'll tell you. It was almost a head-on collision. You can see the movement in the cockpit, though, so Buddy, we hope, is not injured. Yellow coming out of lap number 239. The front end of that car is written off. Boy, tough break for uh, Buddy Arrington. You know, he's a lot like that J.D. McDuffie who, mm -hmm. that was just being interviewed. I'm a big fan of these guys. I know how hard it is when you have 15 guys on your crew. These guys do it on a shoestring. The leader has come in for a pit stop or is making his way toward the pit area for a stop and so is Rusty Wallace and just about all of those who are in the lead lap. There's Lake stopping the Oldsmobile and the crew going to work on it. Will this be a two or a four tire change, I think? Four tires, definitely. Uh, Jeff Bodine's crew is going to have to do some cosmetic work also on the car. It looked like the right side tires were rubbing. You can see Lake Speed's jack man let the jack down. He's running around to the left side to get the left side changed. Wallace, Rusty Wallace is lined up to get out. He's ready for a jump. His crew is a little behind, though. They're just now jacking up the left side. Lake Speed's up, already up and ready to go. Bobby Allison comes out in the number 12 machine. Lake Speed, good stop for him. Here he is uh, pulling away, and now Rusty Wallace begins to move off pit road. And here comes Elliot, Bodine. They got it. Bodine's car fixed quick. They may have to come back in again. We'll have to watch Bodine. He did have some sheet metal damage on the right side as he got it into the wall. Boy, that traffic is so heavy. And look at it. The tires they have to steer around, crew members, other cars. They have to look in their mirror to see if anybody's coming from behind. It's very hectic. There is the rescue squad at the Buddy Arrington car. Hill sweatshirt company sponsoring that machine. You know, you gotta you gotta really pull for Buddy Arrington, J.D. McDuffie, those kind of guys. They, they do it. So it's, I know how hard it is when you have 20 people on your team. Those guys just work on the car. They get in it and they drive it. They, they you know, when there's a wreck like this, they gotta take it home and fix it themselves. I'm a big fan of those guys because I think they're definitely the hardest workers in the sport. There you can see Buddy is uh, on the stretcher, but he doesn't look to be in uh, all that bad a shape. They will take him into the infield care center to be checked over. So Buddy Arrington crashing here at about lap 237. 
bringing out our sixth caution period of the day. You can see the medical personnel going into the ambulance with him, and we'll have a report on Buddy Arrington's condition in just a moment, but again, it didn't seem all that serious. Well, you can see that the car has been severely damaged, and we have had a lot of damaged cars so far in this Trans South 500, which is forcing crew members and owners to go to the parts store to find exactly what they need. Here is an ESPN track fact. Quick Facts are brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. How many of you folks have watched Home Shopping Club? Well, there's anything you want to buy there on television. Well, here at the racetrack, anything you want to buy right here at the parts truck. Let's take a look. Well, we got goggles to start with. We got window netting. We got restrictor plates. This is the one that's legal right here. One inch plate, Daytona Talladega, makes you go about 185 miles an hour. But this big guy right here will put you over 200 miles an hour. It's illegal, but it has been used, and it's on sale right here. Well, how about parts? Take a look at the catalog. The front few pages of this catalog show what's legal. You don't want those guys. If you want to go to the back three or four pages, that's where everybody buys from. Those ones aren't legal, but they go awfully quick. What else do we have here? Collar. Collar to put underneath the helmet. Your head won't flop around on Sunday. It makes it very comfortable during the race. On Monday, you go home, take the collar, stick it in your mother-in-law's mouth, keeps her quiet all week, and you're happy, too. What else do we have here? Bell helmets for sale. A nice, soft, padded seat. These things here are excellent. They actually are on the side of the seat to keep you from sliding around in the car, but some car owners have been able to use these things and put them on either side of their driver's heads as blinders. The drivers won't get scared in traffic. Some guys have been accused of using these for years. They can't see a thing in traffic. Well, what else do we have? All kinds of things, anything you want to buy here. Covers, transmissions, all kinds of parts, a virtual hodgepodge of parts on sale right here at the garage area. Come by and see me. Now, now, Gary, in your many times of uh, going to the parts store, did you ever uh, get some of those blinders or uh, the neck collar to keep your mother-in-law quiet? I, I thought about getting blinders like that, but uh, no, th that's a pretty uh, accurate uh, example of what a parts, a parts store looks like here at the racetrack. You spend a lot of time there. The Trans South 500 at Darlington International Speedway is 242 laps. Gone, and we're under caution for the sixth time. talks about Quaker State with QSX. If you're like me, you want your engine to perform. You want it to run clean, and you don't want sludge. That's why you and I both need Quaker State with QSX. QSX keeps dirt particles in suspension, so they're trapped in your oil filter instead of sludging up your engine. No other oil runs cleaner or fights sludge better. And the Quaker State I use in my car is the same oil you can buy right off the shelf for your car. Quaker State, the big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. Of all the cars that come out each year, only one can be the Motor Trend Car of the Year. For 1988, that one is this one. The hot new Pontiac Grand Prix. Get on the Pontiac and ride! Pontiac ride! The new Grand Prix, Motor Trend's Car of the Year. You've got to drive it. Get on the Pontiac! Rebuild the site! This bug's for all that you do. Papers say you busted it up pretty good. This is where we start? You got Come on. on roll it back. You missed the no. cheers. No. Can you beat Come those on, doubts no. and fears? You make the For that something that won't let us quit, the clean, crisp taste of Beechwood-aged Budweiser. To your first game back. This bug's for you. Speed. Power. More speed. If it has a moment and goes fast, you'll see it on Speed Week. Every Friday night at 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. Still under caution in the Trans South 500 because of an accident coming out of turn number four that was triggered by Jeff Bodine. And we'll take a replay of it and see if we can determine exactly what happened. Bodine's car got very high as he came off of turn four and scraped the wall. And behind him, there's Buddy Arrington hitting the wall. Dale Earnhardt, of course, right behind Arrington. He got into it. A lot of cars coming down through there. Neil Bonnet down on the inside. The second time today that Neil Bonnet has been involved in one of these uh, straightaway skirmishes. Well, Buddy Arrington took the hardest shot as he hit the inside wall nearly head on. He's been taken to the care center. Here's a report from Dick Bergman. 
Well, Bob, they just brought him in here on a stretcher, but as they brought Arrington in, his eyes were open and he was alert, and he waved at all those of us who had assembled here concerned about his condition. Jerry Punch, what's going on where you are? Well, Deal Bonnet is still sitting in the car. They're trying to get some work done on the car here. And Neil Bonnet, they're trying to, he's been involved in accidents, numerous accidents today. And Neil, it's not been your day today, partner. Well, I tell you, the start, somebody rammed us in the rear and we got in that big mess. And then coming off this corner, uh, I guess the five car wreck, Dale lifted and I ran right in the back of it. Well, you can hear them beating and banging. They're trying to get this Babylon Pontiac back on the racetrack. All right, thank you, Jerry and Dick. And we'll be back to continue our coverage of the Trans South 500 right after these messages. When you replace ordinary spark plugs with Bosch Platinum plugs, you may not notice the change immediately. The quicker starts, the smoother acceleration, the extra performance only pure platinum delivers. So how long will it take you to notice the improvement Bosch Platinum plugs make? About that long. Available at Kmart and other fine auto parts stores installed at most precision tune centers. Ricky Rudd talks about Quaker State with QSX. If you're like me, you want your engine to perform. You want it to run clean, and you don't want sludge. That's why you and I both need Quaker State with QSX. QSX keeps dirt particles in suspension, so they're trapped in your oil filter instead of sludging up your engine. No other oil runs cleaner or fights sludge better. And the Quaker State I use in my car is the same oil you can buy right off the shelf for your car. Quaker State, the big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. The world's most important magazine of science fact and fiction, Omni, will take you on a fantastic voyage to the future. Imagine everything you'll need for the next thousand years, including handheld lasers, your own personal cloning kit, and step-by-step -step instructions on how you can achieve an actual out-of-body experience. It's the Omni Whole Universe Catalog, and it's free in the April issue of Omni Magazine. On sale now. They were thinking about going green, but we're still under caution. Sterling Marlin has made up a lap that he lost, and Mark Martin has lost a lap because he pitted on the backstretch. Yes, he did. He apparently went in too early, or whatever the situation was. Mark Martin did lose a lap back there, and we got some cars that are coming down pit road here again before the green reflies. Now, Gary, what's the strategy here? Well, they're looking to the end of the race. I'd have to figure it out on a uh, calculator, but if they can make it with one more stop to the end. It's a smart move to stop now. Um, I'm sure Ernie Elliott and, the, and his crew have thought about that. Uh, although they are changing four tires on Elliott's car, possibly he had a vibration, something like that. And he, too, could have run over some debris on the racetrack, taking no chances. They've come in and changed those tires. We are really in a position now that there are only six cars on the lead lap. So making a, a pit stop and having to go back in the field at this point of the race is not nearly as costly to you as it would have been earlier when you would have had to go on behind 25 or 30 cars that might have been in the lead lap. Now they're on behind five or six. Gary, do you look in the record books and study previous races to determine possibly uh, when you do make a stop? You know, it's interesting, Bob. We've done that over the years with the, uh, the history of the last 10 years. Uh, we did it on a computer. What we did was we've documented all the, all the caution flags from start to finish of every race and when they were most likely to occur. Darlington seemed to have, be the track that had the most clear pattern over all the years. The, uh, the, it seemed like sometimes uh, there would be a caution, a lot of cautions early, just like today. Then, uh, then later on in the race, not many, then a long green spell to the end. So it's something you got to really watch. All right, we're still under caution, so we're going to take another break and be right back for racing action here at the Trans South 500. We'll be right back. great wheels look their best eagle one doesn't miss a beat eagle one a complete line of wheel and body care products for those who love cars as much as we do just how good are genuine gm parts good enough for dale earnhardt three-time winston cup driving champion 
and the same kind of quality that goes into the GM parts for his car goes into the GM parts for your car. So get the goods under your hood. Genuine GM parts. From your General Motors dealer. When Radio Shack put their $849 computer on sale for only $599, I just had to have it because it runs the same IBM PC software I use at the office. I got this complete system, including color monitor, for only $899. And it came with seven programs in one, like word processing, budgeting. My wife uses it to run her catering business. Oh, my God. <laughs> they use it so much, I'm thinking of getting my own. Save $250 on a Tandy 1000 SX, only $599 with software. Complete system only $899 at Radio Shack. It's every cowboy's worst nightmare. Arr! And when the worst is over, you head for the beer that goes down smooth as a mountain stream. Boy. Does anybody want to start the campfire? <laughs> head for the mountains of Bush beer. Just went back to green, and we've had another spin up in turn number three involving Eddie Pierce-Wynn and I believe Ken Bouchard, the other car involved. But all cars are moving. The yellow does, however, come out once again. And it's going to be a break for Jeff Bodine. He had moved around leader late speed to get back in the lead lap. So, like Sterling Marlin a moment ago, Jeff Bodine has got back in the lead lap. The green had just come out. Jeff Bodine had gotten a jump on Lake Speed and had passed Lake, and then the caution comes out again, so Jeff is going to get the lap back. He'll be able to encircle the entire racetrack now. Yeah, now what Jeff should do is stay on the track, get caught up to the pack, and then come in for a pit stop since he's last anyway. Four tires and gas right now would be a good move. All right, lap 252. Gary, you had done some calculating, and you had determined that those guys who pitted just a couple of laps ago, namely Bill Elliott and Davey Allison, had themselves been calculated and probably now can go the rest of the race. Yeah, really, uh, so I'm surprised Lake Speed didn't come in there. Caution, he's had two opportunities now to pit and get some gas. Uh, it would allow him to make only one more pit stop to the end of the race. Bill Elliott obviously did it, Davey Allison did it. They can make it to the end with one stop where these other guys will probably have to make two stops. Yeah, Jeff Bodine coming from last now. He's the last car in the lead lap. Here, here we go with Dick for the pit stop. Well, Gary, you're right on the button. Just about the time when you said these guys ought to make a pit stop for four tires and gas, they all scurried around the pits, came up with the four tires, got the gas cans ready, and here they are, going to do their thing. They're also taping over the windshield to try to prevent some of the glare from bothering. But now the jack band just fell down, coming around the corner. Even pit road is slippery. Bodine now helping himself by taping a little bit of the windshield over. Right side tires are on, left side tires going on. This will put Bodine in good shape. But she takes off out of the pit area with a full load of fuel and four good tires. So Bodine now moves back out, and here is a replay of the incident up in turns three and four. Andy Beerswall down on the inside, or trying to go on the inside, follow Dale Earnhardt through there of Kenny Bouchard, the leading rookie driver, and they tangle, and around they go, and then the caution comes out. Nobody hurt real bad, though, and... Uh, the caution does come out, however. Sterling Marlin is on pit road as everybody else stays out now, waiting for resumption of this race here in South Carolina. Lindsay Lincoln Mercury Isuzu presents Cougar, the 1988 Mercury Cougar. Distinctive styling, competitive performance. Now Lindsay gives you the opportunity to tame your own Cougar with zero money down and payments as low as $273.45 a month. That's right, zero money down on an 88 Cougar LS loaded. Tame the wind, tame the untamable. Mercury Cougar. Division at Congress. Getting some people excited about the Train XL 1200 air conditioner is tough. We can tell people that it's the best we've ever built, that it's up to 50% more energy efficient than their old air conditioner, and all too often nothing happens until the electric bill arrives. <laughs> Call Bracket Sheet Metal. We have the calming solution to high utility bills and a $300 rebate when you buy a Train XL furnace and air conditioner. 
This is where champions begin. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Tyson, Terrence Ali, Ray Boom Boom Mancini, superstars who forge steel nerves and iron punches on Budweiser's top-ranked boxing. Former lightweight champion Livingstone Bramble battles the hard-hitting Edwin Curet Wednesday night at 9 Eastern, live on ESPN. The green flag is out again, and Rusty Wallace has taken over the top spot from Lake Speed. Bobby Allison is there leading the contingent down the back stretch, but Bobby is getting a lap back. Rusty Wallace, the leader, now with Lake Speed in second. Yes, Bobby Allison is hoping for a caution, just like Jeff Bedine got a moment ago, but now Rusty Wallace moves on the inside of him, and he's going to put Bobby a lap down. Close as they came out in oh. corner number four. Look, Look at the war of breath. Can't they make it into turn one? Speed! Bobby Allison and Rusty Wallace run side by side. We're watching from the Xerox Ford of Alan Kowicki. He's the fourth car involved in all of this. Something's got to give in turn three there, yeah. Bobby let Rusty in front. Kowicki is third in the race. Remember, Allison is a lap car right ahead of Allen. See the sun coming into the windshield going down the front straightaway. It gets worse and worse now as the day goes on. You almost lose all sight of the other traveling. And we heard that there was some tape being put on the front windshields of the Jeff Bodine car, and there was some earlier of the uh, Davy Allison car. Is that legal? And Rusty Wallace is off the pace as he heads into turn three. Rusty's oh, going down. Yes. As we see his uh, Bobby Allison moving on the outside of him, Rusty must have thought he had a tire going down or something because he's definitely off of the pace. He's to the inside, and here comes Bill Elliott. And uh, don't forget, Jeff Bodine is back on the lead lap. Jeff Bodine's right back in it. Davey Allison is also right there. He's on the lead lap, but Rusty Wallace is going backwards. you got to really watch it. Elliott, see how sharp the fenders are on Jeff Bodine's car. Elliott has to really watch him as he comes by. That was a little close. So a sharp fender like that can really cut your tires. Now we're beginning to see some real activity second win for many of these drivers Bill Elliott and Jeff Bodine are side by side watching from behind is Davey Allison in front of that group is Alan Kowicki and leading the race is Lake Speed and he's gone for the moment at least he has really moved out into about a two-second lead Alan Kowicki tries to move around to Bobby Allison you the question about the tape on the windshield. Are they supposed to do that? Well, NASCAR frowns on it. Uh, you're supposed to put any tinting or any kind of uh, uh, tape on the windshield from the inside, not from the outside. Several of the teams have been putting tape on the outside. You can see Jeff Bodine right above his vision. They put tape as a sun visor. You almost have to have it here at Darlington. I was going to say that becomes more of a safety thing than it does anything else. Yeah, I think NASCAR kind of looks the other way on that. Here's Davey Allison trying to make a move on Jeff Bodine. Well, let's go to Dick Bergeron, who perhaps has an explanation on the Rusty Wallace situation. Well, Bob, for the Rusty Wallace fans, the news is not good. He has lost a cylinder. He is down to seven. That is something that is almost unfixable. They have even brought the water hose around, indicating that the engine is overheating. He had run well, but today is not going to be it for Rusty. Well, on this replay, uh, Ned, you can see that everybody was aware that something was going wrong with the car there coming out of the fourth turn. Yes, and that's why we saw as many cars. They went four wide for just a moment as it came down the front straightaway, but they did sense that something was wrong with Rusty Wallace's car, so they started started making their move to try to get around him before they got into turn one. Davey Allison has moved to third, Bodine fourth, and Bill Elliott fifth. And look who's back there in the group, Dale Earnhardt. After all the bumps and bangs he has taken today, he won't give up. He's still passing cars. You know, that is Rusty Wallace uh, losing a cylinder. Probably will have a hard time finishing. It's tough on these engines to restart a race, making green flag pit stops and restarting is the most critical time on the engine. Rusty Wallace jumped out to the lead on that restart and uh, might have overstressed his engine doing that. And it's possible they could have over revved it on the start of it. On a restart, a lot of times drivers uh, get anxious and they'll just simply over rev them. And the biggest thing that can happen there, Gary, is breaking a valve train. Exactly, the valve train is the weak link, especially 
mostly RPM related. Uh, if you over rev the engine above 82, 8300, you're asking for trouble in the valve train. The valve springs probably, uh, in Rusty's case here, he's probably lost one cylinder. The leader is Lake Speed, and as Ned indicated, he has taken off from the rest of the field, although Alan Kowicki now begins to close in just a little bit. For a while there, Lake Speed had a tremendous lead, but now Alan Kowicki in the Xerox Ford, and that's who we're riding with right now, is beginning to close in just a little bit on the leader. Allison Davey, third, fourth Elliott, fifth for nine, sixth is Sterling Marlin, and the number 27 car of Rusty Wallace is in seventh position. Then a lap down is Bobby Allison, ninth is Phil Parsons, in 10th position is Mark Martin, and 11th is Buddy Baker. Those cars are lapped down. And now the battle is between Jeff Bodine and Sterling Marlin for 5th position. Here's the in car from Dale Jarrett. Well, Dale's windshield beginning to get fitted quite a bit, and as you can see, as he heads down into turn one, he couldn't see too well. Dale's car is running very strong now. He's trying to move around Jeff Bodine, even though Dale is three laps down. Yeah, Bodine's car, I don't think, is working as well as it was, too. No, he took an, an awful hard hit on the wall there. Uh, he was fortunate to get his lap back on that quick descent, quick caution from one after the other, but I think he may have a little trouble racing for the lead as we go here. Dale Jarrett's car, and he's right behind Jeff Bodine. Next time around, we'll have 100 laps to go. Next time around will be the completion of the 267th lap. And Rusty Wallace is pulling into the pits and into the garage area, calling it quits for the day. A very tough break for Rusty Wallace. As once again, a super speedway victory eludes him. And the next opportunity he'll have to win a super speedway event will be in Talladega. <laughs> to some, it's routine maintenance. To others, it's an act of love. If you truly appreciate fine machinery, you protect it with Purolator filters. I heard you got one, Fred. I just had to come over and take a look. Yeah, wanted one all my life. Great. Look at the way it's put together. Well, no wonder they last. Mind if I just, you know, sit behind the wheel? Oh, boy, would I like one of these. Can I take it for a spin? Well, just in the front yard. Oh, boy. <laughs> Nothing runs like a deer. <laughs> the Oldsmobile of Lake Speed leads the Trans South 500, and there you can see that that make of car has never won this race. Lake Speed looks awful strong. He just seems like he's gaining as the race goes on. That's that's almost unusual for a car uh, you know, of that uh, team, like a uh, non-winner like Lake Speed, to get stronger as the race goes on. But he is obviously picking up momentum. And uh, the car number seven of Alan Kowicki is picking up some momentum, too, because it looks like he might be gaining a little bit on Lake Speed. Lake, he jumped out to a good lead after the restart. But now, Alan Kowicki began to move in a little bit on and it's interesting to note that the drivers that are running first and second here are non-Winston Cup winners. Neither has ever won a Winston Cup race, so we could have a first-time winner in the next uh, 97 laps or so. Just a moment ago, while we were on the commercial break, Derek Cope blew the engine in his Pure Later Ford number 68, so he is another of those that have uh, had to back the dust here today. Yeah, that was a shame. He was running pretty good in that Ford, uh, Derek Cope. He's been putting on a pretty good show the last several races. Lake Speed is 40 years of age, hailing from Jackson, Mississippi. He goes into this race 14th in the point standings. He has competed in every race this year, and his best finish was a second at Rockingham. He also finished sixth at Richmond. He was running at the, both, uh, at the end of both of those races. The other two events so far this year, he finished 37th at Daytona, not finishing because of an engine problem, and he lost a cylinder in Atlanta last weekend also. Jerry Punch is with Rusty Wallace. 
Well, a heck of a job by this young man, Rusty Wallace, who just climbed out of the Kodiak Pontiac. And Rusty, they're still working on the car. Are you going to be able to get back in? Well, I don't know, Jerry. We lost a cylinder in the engine, and the guys are going to try to patch it up, so they're running seven cylinders when we get back out there for some points. You're running awfully well out there. Yeah, the car's running real good. I'm pretty sure I could have won the race. We made a chassis adjustment that very last pit stop, and the car really went to run it down turn three and four. So too bad this happened because I think we've had a good shot at it today. Now, with you out of it, who's the strong horse out there? Who would you pick? Well, Lake's definitely real strong, but now there's a couple cars that got their late, their laps back up. Uh, the 44 cars back up there, uh, the 9 car. But Lake, he's been pretty dominant all day long, and him and I have been able to pretty well run away from the field. So uh, I got to say that Lake's got the best shot there right now. Well, we talked about it at the top of the show. A new winner possibly here at Darlington. It could dictate Lake's speed. Well, Lake is leading, but he is not running away with the show at the moment. As a matter of fact, Alan Kowicki is staying right with him. He has caught him. Boy. And he's right on his back bumper. Kowicki is definitely running faster than Lake Speed because he was about two and a half seconds behind him. Now he's a half a car length behind him. Well, that's a good shot. Here they go right down the back straightaway into three. Right up to his bumper. There used to be a bump right there in turn number four, Ned, but I guess they sort of eliminated it when they paved the track a couple of years ago. They did a great deal to eliminate it, Bob. It's still a very sharp turn as you come off of there, and you really have a lot of speed as you're coming off of there because you, as you decelerate, as we talked earlier, going into turn three, and then if your car is working properly, you can just accelerate fully through that turn, and you've really built up a lot of speed until you get there, and that wall comes up in a hurry, but uh, they eliminating a portion of that bump, in fact, most of it, has helped them coming off there, and I think has helped them make better race in your car. And there once again, Gary, is your uh, point that you wanted to make about the sun and how terrible it is going into turn number one. Boy, can you imagine driving at that speed, that close to another competitor and going into that sun and, and not being able to see? I know what it's like on the freeway when the sun's in your eyes. Can you imagine at these speeds? It's almost as bad as uh, the visibility was when Kyle Petty blew his engine down here in the uh, early going. The yeah. visibility is almost that bad. You're right. The windshield is sandblasted. The sun is reflecting off those pits on the windshield, and it makes it difficult, very difficult to see. Gary, I think that your eyes somewhat adjust to the conditions as you move along. I remember back in the dirt track days when, when I was driving race cars, we were running a lot of dirt tracks, and, and the dirt would build up on the windshield of the car, and you could just hardly see anything. As a matter of fact, after the race, you'd look, how in the world did I see out? Apparently, your eyes adjust to it to some degree. Yeah, your body's pretty resourceful to, to get you through these kind of things, but, well, I tell you, I'm glad it's them, not me. <laughs> with just about a car length advantage over Alan Kowicki. Now they approach some slower traffic, and this is uh, one of the places to watch for a lead change. H.P. Bailey in car number 36 from Houston, Texas, moves out of the way and gives them plenty of running. You know, that's one race H.P. always comes to is Darlington. You, you, you don't see him for three or four months, and he always shows up at Darlington. And he usually makes the field here, too. I mean, yeah. in fact, most every time he comes here, but he had a real bad accident here several years ago as we see Alan Kowicki trying to set Lake Speed up, but he was not able to do it that time. Yeah, I remember HB took a shot like Buddy Arrington took down here coming out of turn number four a few years ago, head, in, head on into the inside wall. Yeah, broke the wall in fact. Yeah, when he hit right. It. So they've disposed of that slower traffic now and have moved into somewhat cleaner air. Back in 1961 at this racetrack, very popular chief mechanic played an instrument a role, and that chief mechanic was Smokey Eunuch. That's the subject of our Winston Cup replay. Winston Cup replays are brought to you by Purolator, the first name in filters. For Pure Oil now and Pure Oil later, it's Purolator. Smokey Eunuch was one of the all-time great Grand National mechanics. He won three Southern 500s. Fireball Roberts drove his cars to four wins in the first eight races at Daytona. There are many stories about Eunuch and his rule bending, but the end result was Smokey was a winner. He helped many drivers to stardom and won a place for himself in the Hall of Fame. Who will be the winner and the winning chief mechanic at this race? Well, we'll tell you in about 80 more laps as we continue our coverage of the Trans-South 500.
some, it's routine maintenance. To others, it's an act of love. If you truly appreciate fine machinery, you protect it with Purolator filters. If you're looking for the only sports car in the world that gives you the superior traction of front-wheel drive, a competition suspension, and an unbeatable 770 protection plan, then look no further. It's got to be the intercooled, turbocharged Dodge Daytona Shelby Z. Now get up to $1,500 cash back on Daytona models in stock. CarQuest Auto Parts stores salute the professional mechanic. He does a job once, does it right. He makes a promise on service and repairs. He keeps it. He's a professional. He depends on other professionals like CarQuest. We know our parts as well as he knows how to repair cars. And CarQuest sells only the highest quality products. Guaranteed by over 2,300 CarQuest stores coast to coast to fit right every time. CarQuest Auto Parts stores. The professionals, professionals prefer. Back at Darlington, where Lake Speed in car number 83 continues to lead the number seven car of Alan Kowicki. But still some great racing going on behind these two. There is Jeff Bodine in the number five car. Behind him is Phil Parsons. Dale Jarrett is in on this battle also in turn number three. And Mark Martin in the car number six. And there's two sets of drivers running side by side around that turn. And two abreast racing. There we are inside Dale Jarrett's car. Jerry Punch has a report from the pit area. We're talking about how important it is to get in a race car and be 100%. Now, we talk about stock car therapy. There is no better medicine for a race car driver than getting back on board the stock cars. Take a look at some of the walking wounded over the years. Richard Petty, of course, at Daytona, he did somersaults along the fence, came back a week later and finished third in Richmond. Remember Ricky Rudd's violent crash during the Bush Clash at Daytona, Rudd somersaulting the Bud Moore car? Well, Rudd came back a week later and won at Richmond. How about Bill Elliott here after last week? spending two days in the hospital, his shoulder unable to raise it more than about 15 degrees off the side of his body. He is in a race car here driving now close to 300 laps here at Darlington. So the walking wounded, hey, don't forget Neil Bonnet, what happened to him? His career was almost over. He climbed back in the race car and he felt great. Not only did he feel good, he drove good and won two of the first three races. Sure good medicine here, stock car therapy, they call it, on track to get healing in NASCAR. Ned can relate to stock car therapy because uh, 1965, I believe, was the year, Ned. Yes, it was. And here at the Darlington Raceway, the biggest win of my career, really. And I won that race with a back brace on. I had a wreck at Greenville, South Carolina on a half a mile dirt track back in June and had to wear a back brace for three months. Had a cracked vertebrae in the lower part of my back. And uh, after that win here at Darlington, I didn't have any more back problems for a long, <laughs> long time. Okay. It's amazing medicine. Yes, it? it is. <laughs> that therapy, yes, yeah, sir. You know, I worked with Bobby Allison for three years, and I can remember he never was healthy. He had broken fingers, broken toes, broken ribs, a broken shoulder one time, and he only missed maybe one or two races that whole time. Our race summary shows that Lake Speed has led 108 out of 285 laps. The average speed of the race up to 127.804. Eight caution periods, total 41 laps. 11 leaders, 16 lead changes, and six cars remain on the lead lap. There is number one, Lake Speed, the number 83 car, and number two, Alan Kowicki in the number seven car. You wonder, if, if, you wonder if Kowicki, he caught Lake pretty easily. He made an attempt or two to pass him, but now he just sort of backed off and just sitting there riding. And uh, you wonder if he is just sort of taking it easy now, biding his time, not going to show his complete hand at this point of the race. 77 laps to go, so if somebody is going to do something, it will probably occur within the next 20 or 30 laps or so. But right now, Lake Speed is the leader, and we'll be back with more from Darlington.
every Ferrari 328 and every Ferrari Testarossa that comes to America comes on Goodyear Eagles. And only on Goodyear Eagles. Why? Because Mr. Ferrari wants it that way. Goodyear Eagles, Ferrari's choice as America's best tires. Honey, game's gonna start soon. I think I'll give the lawn a quick cut. <laughs> Good luck. When you're long on grass and short on time, you need a mower with a Briggs and Stratton engine. Dad, the pregame show's on! It'll start quickly and work hard till the job's done. Sure hope he makes it. Yes, there he is. Briggs and Stratton, the power in power equipment. Dodge Shadow ES. When you look at its 60 standard features, its turbocharged engine, its 770 protection plan, when you consider the fact that the Shadow ES is a better value, almost $700 less than the Chevy Cavalier C24, you'll agree, when it comes to outstanding value, it's gotta be a Dodge. And with $500 cash back, you've now got an even better value. You give your all to all you do. Don't settle for less from your shampoo. Wash and go, Pert Plus. Ordinary shampoo can't give you this kind of manageability. You need Pert Plus with a unique combination of effective shampoo for cleaning plus conditioner for control all in one. For great, easy-to-manage hair, it's one of a kind. Just one shampoo does it all for you. Wash and go. With shampoo, conditioner in one. Pert Plus. Back at Darlington, where Lake Speed leads the Trans South 500, we're on lap 295, and our race strategy advisor indicates that his next pit stop will cap on lap number 305. So 10 more to go in Lake Speed. We'll be headed for Pit Road once again. And now let's uh, go to Pit Central and Larry Newber. Thanks, Bob. Well, here is a rundown of the leaders of this race up to this point. You can see that Lake Speed's had a very stout afternoon staying in the top 10. By the way, a profile very similar to what we saw from Neil Bonnet during the Rockingham race. Sterling Marlin right here with the 8, 7, 7, and 8. He, too, has remained very consistent in the top 10. Alan Kowicki, you can see he was languishing back in the 13th and 10th positions earlier in the race. He has gradually moved up. I'll tell you, the profile that most closely matches the winner of the race at Rockingham, Neil Bonnet, is the one that Lake Speed's been turning in. One comment about the crew chiefs of Lake Speed and Alan Kowicki. Daryl Bryant is the crew chief of Lake Speed. He's been around since 1978. He has only won one race himself. That was with Terry Labonte back in 1980. And what about Alan Kowicki? A gentleman by the name of Paul Andrews is listed as, as his crew chief. Paul has been associated with Alan, but Alan probably comes as close to being a driver crew chief as any driver on the trail. As of yesterday, the budget is so tight for Alan Kowicki. As of yesterday, Saturday, he did not even have a jack man. Friday was here practicing with the truck driver slash mechanic and himself. And our indication is that Alan Kowicki, when he comes in for his next pit stop, will be loosening up the, up the car. Now, how would they do that, Jerry? Well, they'll probably do it, obviously, with the tires. Uh, they're going to change right side tires and gas, I'm sure. Um, Possibly a mechanic may jump in the window and turn one of the wedge bolts. It's unusual to loosen up a car as the race goes, but I think the temperature may be dropping a little bit. They're running through a shadow in turn two. When the track temperature gets colder or cooler from where you were running, the car that may have been neutral will tend to push then, plow the front end. And if, when they say loosen up the car, what they want to do is get the balance back, get the car more neutral driving again. So, Ned, how will that affect uh, the handling for Alex? Well, that made it run a little bit faster. Now, one thing, we've talked about how tough this race is on this particular race track. If the car is uncomfortable and a little too loose for the first 400 miles, I'll tell you, it can make a miserable long day for you. And, but you want it a little bit tight so that you're feeling good and you're still there to make that run at the end. And then at the end, you loosen her up a little bit, let her go faster, and so you just battle it for the rest of the way. There's a battle for fourth position. That is Bill Elliott and Sterling Marlin as we once, ago, go, uh, once again go to the pit area. Well, we're, we're at Alan Kowicki's pits with Paul Andrews, and Paul is one of only three employees Alan has running this operation. And Paul, you're going to pit in about 
about, what, four or five laps, and we understand you may have to adjust the chassis on the car. Can you, you can get around possibly late speed? He caught him pretty easily, but then he didn't pass him. Well, I think he's more or less just kind of working with his tires a little bit, trying not to burn them out, because we are just about ready for a pit stop here. Well, this car that Alan Kowicki is driving here, remember, this is the car he set on a pole with at Dover a year or so ago, and it's the car he finished second to Dale Earnhardt with at Pocono last year. It's his best race car. We've had a change for fourth position as Sterling Marlin has passed Bill Elliott and moved to fourth. And one interesting fact is that Bill Elliott has run this spring race nine times and has never finished out of the top ten. And he's now in fifth position, so he is threatening to continue that streak. Bill has run a good steady race. He hasn't been up there battling for the lead much today. Whether that's part of his strategy or whether the car just won't do any better than that, he uh, certainly has driven a good, smart race. I know, Gary, you've uh, complimented Bill all race long and thought that he could be very, very strong here in the late going. Well, I've been following Bill Elliott. You know, he's always a threat at Darlington. His record shows that, but he doesn't run in traffic. This is my first real view from up above. I'm always in the pits watching, and you don't see what you see up here, but Bill Elliott runs by himself here at Darlington. When there's traffic around him, he lets them go. And if he gets a chance to pass somebody, he waits until they get a real good open shot. Bill Elliott is very patient. I think he learned a lot from watching David Pearson as he grew up. David Pearson drove much like that. This completes lap number 304, so we should be seeing some pit, seeing some pit stops now in just a, a lap or so as Lake Speed's pit crew readies, and he may be coming in next lap. Evidently, they are ready for him to come in, and I suppose they'll change the right side tires and, of course, fill it up with gasoline. It'll be interesting to see when they leave the pits what drivers take the line straight out to the racetrack and which ones stay against the grass. You, you, can, you may gain some time by going straight out the racetrack at the risk of puncturing a tire. Okay, he is coming into the pits this time around, I believe. Lake Speed dips down as he comes off of the fourth turn and heads down pit road. This should be the final pit stop of the race for Lake Speed if we should continue to go green the rest of the way. His Speed crew, brings the Oldsmobile in. His crew chief said they were going to do some tires, change tires, but maybe change some wedge. I don't see anybody yet working on the wedge bolt. Now, that was Kowicki's crew that was going to do that, uh, Gary. And uh, Kowicki will be coming up here very shortly as Lake Speed gets to service on his car. They are just changing the right side tires. Of course, they fill it up with gasoline. Now, my stopwatch says he made it 16 and 16 seconds. Here is Kowicki coming out of corner number four. He's in the uh, upper right of your screen. There was there for a moment. And Bobby Hillen Jr. is pulling out of the pit area. There is Kowicki high on the racetrack. Below Alan Kowicki is the car of Bobby Hillen Jr. When he came by in front of us, the uh, right front wheel wasn't moving. No, it wasn't. It was uh, absolutely not turning. And he's going to get stalled, it looks like, over on the second turn. He might be able to make it back around. But he is, I'm sure, already has blown the right front tire as he went out of the pits. The wheel, as you said, was locked up. It was not turning. But what causes that is the lug nut gets caught in between the brake rotor and the wheel. All he has to do is back up and it falls out. But he's going to continue on around the track. Here is Kowicki as we see him bringing the Ford into his pit area for a stop. Okay, here's the one that they said it may make a chassis adjustment. Yeah, there's a man going in the window now, bumping the camera. Lake speed in the upper right. Coming out of corner number four as the jack goes down on the Kowicki car. They're still trying to get fuel in the car. Yeah. Alan was a little late getting out, and Lake Speed now is going to have quite an advantage. Yes, he is. Lake Speed moving around Dale Earnhardt uh, out on the racetrack, but Kowicki was in the pits about a second and a half longer than Lake Speed was in. They got the tires changed very quickly, but they didn't get the fuel in quite as quickly as Lake Speed's crew did. And that means that uh, Davey Allison is in the lead because he has not made a stop. And you can see that Dale Earnhardt has been passed once again by Lake. So Davey Allison is the leader. Sterling Marlin is running second and Bill Elliott third. And there is the leader, Davey Allison. Oh, we have a car spinning, entering the pit area. Brent Bodine in car number 15. It looked like that he was out of gas as he, as he slowed coming around turns three and four and then got down on the inside. But he has fun 
at the upper end of the pit area. He gets the car riding. Apparently, he's not completely out of gas because he's, uh, he's running. It must be very slippery coming into the pit area up there on the turn four. Would that have caused a caution had the car stalled there? I suppose it would have. Well, really yeah. Given a break to uh, Allison and uh, Sterling Marlin and Bill Elliott. Yeah, it sure could have, but since he was uh, able to get it to going again, of course, he was not in need of danger of those out on the racetrack. But uh, those that have to enter the pits, and Bill Elliott is coming into the pits right now. He could have been a hazard to them. One of those contending for the lead is Bill Elliott. Here is Dick Bergman. And you talk about a sandblasted windshield, this guy's got one. By the way, the problem with Brent Bodine may well have been he is ill in the car. Rusty Wallace just walked down in the direction of his pit with helmet in hand, prepared to relieve an ill-feeling Brent Bodine. Bill Elliott has taken two tires, and he is back. He should not need to return again. Bill Elliott, one of the walking wounded that Jerry talked about earlier, suffering that shoulder injury last week at Atlanta and Davey Allison's pit crew now prepares for him to stop. There's Davey entering turn number three. Now Davey has taken over the lead as a result of the other drivers making pit stops. Allison up very high on the racetrack but is not going to stop this time. It's Alan Kowicki right behind him. Certainly they would like to run as far as they possibly can. They like to catch a caution, but, uh, you know, the cautions don't always come at your convenience. And you don't want to do what Benny Parsons did last week, and that is stretch it just a little too far. Well, Jerry can tell us, perhaps, of the fuel situation regarding Davy Allison. They're telling us here in the Allison pits that Allison could actually make it as far as maybe lap 317 or 318. And the question mark is, do they want to gamble? Do they want to stretch it and maybe get a caution flag? And Allison could pit under yellow for four tires. Remember what happened in Atlanta with Benny Parsons when he tried to stretch it that one last lap and he ran out of fuel and it cost him a shot at winning. Well, they are ready here in the Falcon pitch. They have the tires up on the wall, the gas cans are ready, and they're going to stretch it maybe at least two or three more laps, maybe all the way to 317 or 318. Well, our indication was that Davey and Bill Elliott stopped on lap 247, so you add 70 to that, and that would allow Davey Allison to complete 317 laps before having to come in. Of course, Bill has already stopped for uh, his last pit stop of the day, but uh, yeah, Davey could go to lap 317. We're in Alan Kowicki's car once again, looking out from the back class. Leg speed, after this round of pit stops, if there's no cautions, leg speed is definitely going to be the one that uh, benefited the most. And Lake is on Hoosier tires, don't forget. He just passed Dale Earnhardt, Alan Bowlicky did. Yeah, what's the groove Earnhardt's been running? He just, he's all, he's fighting that car every inch of the way, right up to the wall. I think Dale would have to win my Perseverance Award for the Trans-South 500 today. Oh, for sure. He's driven his heart out. Of course, that's nothing unusual for Dale Earnhardt because he drives as hard as he'll go every lap he'll go. Now, we are going to see a Davy Allison pit stop. There you see the crew with the board. Here comes Davy Allison down off the banking, headed for pit road, and Jerry Punch will call this pit stop by Davy Allison. Tony Price and Robert Gates, the rest of the Haviland crew, waiting for Davey Allison, their young driver, breaks the car in slowly. Remember, those brakes are critical late to race here. The car comes to a halt, and they go to work on the right side of the car. Two tires on the right side of the car, cleaning that windshield. The windshields have been sandblasted so much, they are so difficult to see out of here. They will add the second can of fuel in the car. Remember, they go all the way here. And don't. Davey Allison's car getting ready to come down off the jack. Scrooby Marlin's car coming down out of turn four, and maybe Davey Allison will get back on the speedway. Davey headed back, and Marlin comes by the strike. Oh, that, uh, they really didn't need to wait on the gas. They lost a couple seconds there. They've got, they didn't need a full tank of gas to get to the finish with the mileage they're getting and the distance to the finish. They, they would have saved themselves a couple seconds just going when the tires were down. Well, of course, Sterling Marlin has taken over the lead, but his crew chief, Jake Elder, is about standing by ready for him to come into the pits. Of course, Davey Allison did go a lap down, but Sterling Marlin will be coming in here very shortly, and that'll probably put late speed back in the lead. But not this time. Sterling Marlin stays out on the racetrack with 318 laps completed now. And the Piedmont Airlines Holzmobile is still out there, but the crew is 
readying itself for Sterling to drop down off the bank and can come in. And it could come this time. We'll see. He's in turns three and four. And yes, he makes the turn to the left and heads for pit road. So here comes Sterling Marlin, who was the leader. And now all of those who were up front have come in for a stop. Jerry Punch, once again, will be calling this pit stop. And Sterling's pit just a couple ahead of the uh, Davy Allison pit. Jerry? Jay Gelder brings the car to a stop rather abruptly as Sterling to get the car halted. They were working on the right side of the car, and they're changing right side rubber. Lake Speed in the right upper part of your screen. Lake Speed trying to come around. Sterling Marlin trying to get his crew. Good pit stop. Marlin down the way, and we'll watch Lake Speed coming down and see who will win the race back to the track. Well, Lake Speed has already gone by, Jerry. However, Sterling Marlin was running quite a bit behind him, but Sterling Marlin has made the best pit stop, according to our watches up here. That pit stop was a little less than 14 seconds, and as Gary pointed out a little bit earlier, they don't have to take on a fuel tank of fuel right now because they don't have that many laps left, and they can change tires faster than they can put in the fuel. Yeah, as a crew chief, I always used to tell my gas man, okay, we're not going to wait on you this time. You better be quick. Jeff Bodine, who temporarily uh, went into the lead, comes in for a pit stop now, and this will be his final of the afternoon. There is the crew going to work on the right side of that car. Now, you guys definitely don't have to wait on the gas. As soon as that drop, jack drops, you need to go. Power man's already been, but they're waiting on the gas. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah they were in for about 15 to 9, 10 seconds. So they perhaps could have gotten away a couple of seconds earlier, but uh, decided to not do that. And those couple of seconds are very important when you come down to the closing stages of the race. So after our pit stops, we still have Lake Speed in the lead as Rusty Wallace stands by for relief driving. Folks, Crazy Larry here for Crazy Larry's Waterbeds. Little inconvenient around here, building this new I-164, Boonville Highway. Hey, dust, grime, dirt, inconvenient? I've lowered all my prices on all waterbeds, bedroom furniture, and accessories to make it easy for you to buy. Hey, Felicia says that ain't fair just to have low prices at one store. We got low prices at all stores. Construction prices low at all Crazy Larry's Waterbed stores. Yeah! Please place a check mark next to the Subaru. No, this is a Subaru. And during the month of March, you can receive the best deals of the year on our full lineup of Subaru DL hatchbacks and sedans. We're wheeling and dealing at the new Evansville Subaru. And we know that once you drive this remarkable automobile, you'll be proud to say, that's a Subaru. The new Evansville Subaru, 5600 Division. I'm telling you something, you yellow-bellied rat. Stop. What he's trying to tell you is the legends of world-class championship wrestling are back weekday afternoons at 4 Eastern on ESPN. Don't miss it. Because you're no good, son. The closing stages of ESPN Speed World presentation of the Trans-South 500 from Darlington International Raceway. Tonight at 7.30 Eastern Time from Memorial Auditorium in Buffalo, New York, the Detroit Red Wings and the Buffalo Sabres. Now, of course, Detroit has a top spot in the Campbell Conference sewed up. The Sabres have a firm grip on the number three spot in the Adams Division. It should be good at 7.30 tonight, live here on ESPN as the NHL season winds down. All right, Lake Speed leads with Alan Kulwicki second, Sterling Marlin third, Davey Allison fourth, and Bill Elliott fifth. The guys running first, second, and third have never won a Winston Cup race, and Davey Allison, a rookie last year, is also in a very good spot to win here at Darlington. This is a, an excellent story that we've unveiled here. This is, that is incredible, Bob. Can you imagine how tough this track is for those inexperienced, well, not really inexperienced, but non-winning drivers to be in contention to win? Well, Sterling, I mean, uh, Terry Labonte, the first time he came here, he finished fourth in this race. He had never seen the place before and came and finished fourth, and then his first super speedway victory came on this racetrack. So, you know, it, it's hard to believe that they could do it with a little experience or win their first race here, but uh, it has happened in the past. Here's a battle for third. Sterling Marlin, number 44, and Davey Allison in number 28, as Allison now is beginning to move the Ford in on the rear bumper of the Oldsmobile driven by Sterling Marlin. 
it's really time to, for all of them that can do it to start making their moves. And it, Bill Elliott sitting in the worst spot at this time. He's over a half a lap down, farther back than he's been all day. It's time to get moving for all of them. Now, there are only five cars in the lead lap. You mentioned those, uh, of course, Lake Speed leading. Al Kowicki second, Sterling Marlin third, Davey Allison fourth, and Bill Elliott fifth. One lap down to sixth place is Jeff Bodine, Bill Parsons is seventh, and Mark Martin eighth. Those three cars all one lap down. Two laps down in ninth is Buddy Baker, and in fifth place is Bobby Allison, also two laps down. This is where the crew chief really becomes the cheerleader. He's done it all now. The last pit stop's done. All the adjustments are done. He's got to talk to his driver on the radio every chance he can. Tell him that give him the encouragement he needs to just if he's leg speed to stay out of trouble if it's uh say uh alan kowicki his crew chief needs to be telling him you the interval yeah you may have a little ground good lap good lap don't tell him about the bad laps and and uh, sterling marlin's crew chief and davy allison's also how much conversation is it though is it something that you do every lap every half lap or is it a constant thing i've always thought that it was best to talk to your driver every lap if you can only just give him his time from the previous lap that lets him know that you are part of his team, that he's not out there alone, and you're you're in the behind the scenes, and you're paying attention. You're not on coffee break. You you are concerned about how he's doing. It. And so, and other crew chiefs have a different way of doing of looking at that. But I would give him a lap time or good lap uh, or uh, so much. You know, you're three seconds behind the leader. Next lap, you're 3.4 behind the leader. Just give him any kind of encouragement you can. One of those who has had a tough day, Rick Wilson and Jerry Punch is with him. Well, Rick is the latest retiree from here at Darlington, and Rick, it's been a rough afternoon for you. It sure has. You know, it started out first of the race. We, you know, it looked like Kenny Strader got sideways. We got in a crash there. We come into the pits. We worked on the car and got it where I could go back out and drive it. You know, we are just making laps, and, uh, you know, it's been running hot. We had a radiator here and there. It wouldn't really fit good. It wouldn't cool good. So, but I got to skip it a little bit, so we, we come back to the end of Rick, we said at the beginning of the show that maybe a young driver would get his first win. You're looking for your first win. You were close to Rockingham. He had to be pretty happy for Lake Speed. Looks like he may get his first one here. Yeah, Lake's working real good, you know. Allen's was only pretty, pretty tight while ago, but Lake's working real good. The Oldsmobile's working good. The Hoosier Tires are working good. Well, Rick Wilson out of it now cheering for his buddy, Lake Speed. Speed continues to set the pace. This, the battle, the best battle on the racetrack between Sterling Marlin and Davey Allison for third. Remember, Allen Kowicki is running in second. Bob, we took you down through 10th position a little while ago. The scoring has uh, given us a few more positions. Dale Earnhardt is running in the 11th position. Eddie Beersball is running 12th. Kenny Richard is 13th. Dale Jarrett currently running in the 14th position. And the leader is in traffic. There is a Lake Speed going underneath Phil Parsons. And right behind Lake Speed is the number six car of Mark Martin that led this race for a while. And Dick Bergren has some comments on the leader. I'll tell you, Gary, you were talking a minute ago about conversations between crew chief and driver. Just a lap or two ago, I'm in Lake Speed's pit, and this whole place just broke up. It was if it was the comedy hour or something. Here's what happened. Daryl Bryant had been feeding Lake Speed lap times. All of a sudden, he said, hey, do you want intervals? Do you want to know how far behind they are? And Lake said, forget it. I don't want to know any of that sort of stuff. The whole place went nuts. It really did. Well, that is interesting. That, that means Daryl Bryant gives the same kind of information that I was talking about to his driver. Uh, intervals are important, but if the driver doesn't want it, just keep talking to him. It, the encouragement is the main thing that the driver needs right now. But sometimes, uh, evidently, Blake doesn't doesn't want to know how far that guy is behind him. I remember the first race that I ever won in my life was at Hickory, North Carolina, on the dirt track. I had run well. I'd run second many, many times, but I could never get that checkered flag. And I'd get past near the end of the race. We tore our car up, built a new one, took it back up there. They didn't put a rearview mirror on that thing, and I won the race with it. <laughs> I couldn't see the guys behind me. You don't need rearview mirrors. All you need to do is look in front of you. 334 <laughs> laps out of 367 as we continue our coverage of the Trans South 500. Dodge Daytona. When you look at its long list of standards, its 770 protection plan, when you consider that Daytona is $346 less than the Ford Mustang LX hatchback, we think you'll agree. When it comes to price and performance, it's gotta be a Dodge. The Dodge Daytona, just $89.95. Now get up to $1,500 cash back on Daytona models in stock. Man has always been fascinated with speed. But 
Winning is more than a quest for speed. It's a measure of skill, a test of guts. And though NASCAR has changed through the decades, its spirit never will. It's not just the machine, it's the man who drives it. We're proud to be a part of this great sport. Bush, the official beer of NASCAR. Quaker State, the big Q stands for quality. We engineer quality into every drop of Quaker State motor oil. Only Quaker State has QSX, an advanced formula proven to run clean for unbeatable protection from wear and tear. Before our oil's good enough for your car, we prove that it works in our car. Quaker State quality. We don't just talk about it, we live by it. Quaker State, the big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. Dodge Shadow ES. When you look at its 60 standard features, its turbocharged engine, its 770 protection plan. When you consider the fact that the Shadow ES is a better value, almost $700 less than the Chevy Cavalier's E24, you'll agree, when it comes to outstanding value, it's gotta be a Dodge. And with $500 cash back, you've now got an even better value. Lake Speed is in command of the Trans South 500, leading Alan Kowicki, Sterling Marlin, Davey Allison, and Bill Elliott. Now, we're going to get an interval here next time around when uh, Lake Speed crosses the start finish line. We'll get the interval clock going. He's going down the back stretch right now and into turn number three, and we'll see how much of an interval there is between first and second. And we'll do that for a couple of laps to see if the interval is shrinking or gaining. Now, Bill Elliott, I mean, uh, Dale Earnhardt, once again, down low on the racetrack to allow the faster cars to pass. Earnhardt has not had a good day. He is uh, three laps down to the leaders. Here comes Alan Kowicki out of the corner, passing the stripe, and it's a 10 and a half second lead for Lake Speed. And once again, Nick will do it this time around also to see if the interval is shrinking or increasing. Bob, a good deal of that lead came on the pit stop exchange. Uh, Lake Speed got out of the pits a little faster and didn't stay in quite as long as Alan Kowicki did, and uh, that has made part of that difference. It was 10 and a half seconds last time. Here comes Allen out of the fourth corner once again. Second car. There it is. Ten, well, it's just about the same. Hardly enough to really mention. Certainly a tenth of a second to lap is not enough. There's not enough laps remaining if he can only gain that much per lap from now to the end of the race. Yeah. Jerry Punch is in the Brett Bodine pits, and we've talked about uh, the last several laps about how Brett is not feeling well at all. Jerry, what's the update? Well, it may only be 25 laps to go for us, but it's an eternity for Brett Bodine. I'm with Greg Moore, the son of Bud Moore, and the engine builder for the car. And, Greg, what has Brett said to you on the radio? Well, Jerry, essentially what's happened since that earlier wreck, when Bob was right earlier today, the front suspension and stuff has been on the car to where the car's real hard to steer. And the situation is his arms was getting tired. We, we thought he was going to need relief. We had Rusty St Wally standing by, but now we think he's going to be okay. Well, Brett Bodine's arms are just about giving out. He's going to try to hang on these final 22 or 23 laps. We'll, we'll keep an eye and see if he can hang on. Let's go to Larry Newber in Pitt Central. Larry? Uh, Jerry, there is great consistency among the top five cars and drivers in terms of the amount of time and work that's been completed in the pit area. Each of them has stopped either six or seven times. Interestingly enough, our race leader, Lake Speed, has only stopped six times. Each of the five cars has also changed either 18 or 20 tires, so a great deal of parity there. Remember that Hoosier tires are on the leading car of Lake Speed and the number 44 car of Sterling Marlin. So the top five cars have had a relatively smooth day considering uh, how much complexities and how many tragedies are out there waiting in lying in wait for you at Darlington. And here's Dick Bergman with more from his vantage point on Pit Road. Well, Larry, as the laps wind down, there is little that can be done here on Pit Road. The crews of the two cars in first and second are wandering back and forth, checking tires, rechecking them again. It's the caution happens. Lake Speed's guys are hoping and praying none does. Kowicki's guys are hoping and praying that one does. 
So we've got a very different strategy here, but everybody is just calm, waiting, and crossing fingers. It is winding down, getting near the end. Boy, the one that really needs the caution right now is Bill Elliott. He's one and a half seconds from being lapped. If he gets out of the lead lap, he's going to have a hard time from here out. Uh, you know, Bill Elliott's been taking it easy in, in our eyes, but it looks like he may be a little bit off right now. You can see the difference there, one car between them. Elliott moves into turn number one, and that is uh, Brent Bodine, I believe. And the leader there is the third car on the right side of your screen, Lake Speed. You know, one time, you know, it's funny when you talk about drivers needing relief, because anytime a driver would say that to me, and then I'd end up getting a, one of the name or a good driver in the pit area, they'd always seem to get a little more surge to make it to the finish. They'd start saying, oh, I'm, I'm a little tired. You better get somebody standing by. And, and you come up with somebody and you say, okay, I got so-and-so here in the pits ready for you. Well, I think I can make it. It, it always happens. I, I've never, you know, in some cases, they just have to get out, but it usually it happens that way. Here's a battle for third once again as Sterling Marlin in 44 and Davey Allison in 28 continue to contest that position. That is the number 88 car of Buddy Baker also in this trio. But the faster cars go to the outside and pass. There's the leader, Lake Speed. And he could become a Winston Cup millionaire today. He only needs $12,000 to move above that mark. Who can resist the smoothness of an Oxima shave? It's mm-mm medicated. So close, so clean. Noxzema. She can't resist her mister. Irresistible. If you're looking for the only sports car in the world that gives you the superior traction of front-wheel drive, a competition suspension, and an unbeatable 770 protection plan, then look no further. It's got to be the intercooled, turbocharged Dodge Daytona Shelby Z. Now get up to $1,500 cash back on Daytona models in stock. some it's routine maintenance to others it's an act of love if you truly appreciate fine machinery you protect it with pure later filters there's no place on earth that i'd rather be than out in the open where it's all plain to see if it's gonna get done it's up to you and to me there's no place that I'd rather be. Head for the mountains of Bush. Head for the mountains of Bush. Beer. Lloyd Hunnigan captured the world welterweight crown only to lose it in a controversial decision to Jorge Baca. Now they clash in a championship rematch Tuesday night at 10.30 Eastern on ESPN. The top five, Lake Speed, Alan Kowicki, Sterling Marlin, Davey Allison, and Bill Elliott. Our live coverage of the Trans South 500 brought to you by Dodge Cars and Trucks. When it's got to be right, it's got to be a Dodge. By Quaker State Motor Oil, the big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. By Murray, Murray mowers are tough as they come. And by Kodak Color Watch System for great film development. Leader is Lake Speed, and he is within just a few laps of his first Winston Cup victory ever, and it's coming at a racetrack that is as tough as they come. Boy, he's looking good. 14 laps to go, 15 laps to go. He's uh, got a good lead. Put Bill Elliott a lap down during that break. He's got a smooth sailing if everything goes good. His car has worked well all day. You can see on the left side of it. He's been a little close to a few people out there, but uh, no major damage to it. Certainly not anything that's hindered the handling qualities of the car or the running qualities. Well, I can remember here in 1978, I was working with Darrell Walter, and we had a two-lap lead near the end of the race. We'd already made our last pit stop, 
and Darrell had an accident all by himself. He said he just lost his concentration. That's what happens at this track. It'll it'll make you feel com comfortable, and then all of a sudden it'll get you. All the drivers talk about it. And certainly anything can happen here. We're only 15 laps from the finish, but Lake Speed has not taken the checkered flag by any means yet. This is his 164th career start for Lake Speed, and it could be win number one. And this battle here for third place continues, but Davey Allison has not been able to pass Sterling Marlin. Now, although Dale Earnhardt is three laps down to the leaders, or make that four laps down to the leaders, and in 11th position, if the race were to end now, he would still go to the Winston Cup points lead. Davey Allison again trying to make a bid, but cannot. Earnhardt would be in the points lead for the first time this season because Neil Bonnet is 26 laps down and out of the top 20. Well, we were clocking the distance between Lake Speed and Alan Kowicki, who's running second a little while ago. It was about 10 and a half seconds then. It's over 14 seconds now, so Lake Speed continues to move away, even though he's running very cautiously at this moment, but the car feels comfortable to him, so he's running her just the way that it feels good to him. You can see where Davey Allison has lost his sun visor. Yeah. The tape they put on is blowing up. I'm sure he's let Robert Yates and the rest of the crew know. Ooh. Boy, yeah, that might have been a product of that visibility there. Well, he got way up high and may have put a darling stripe on the car down there. Sterling Marlin here in car number 44 in third position, by the way, would move to second in the Winston Cup points. 18 behind Dale Earnhardt for the race to end right now. That is a tough race there for position, right? Uh, third and fourth spot. Davey's doing all he can. Boy, he is. Look at this. Down to the inside once again to the start finish line. He may have him. They're going to go two abreast through there. No, Davey backs off. His car is not sticking that well down the inside. Oh. Big touch. Woof. Momentarily, but Sterling gets his.